Sugar Beach Sunsets, Romantic Women's Fiction, Cliffside Point, Book Three, written by Ellen Joy, narrated by Jennifer March. Chapter One When Samantha crossed Regent Street in London, the road was clear of all vehicles. Not even a bicyclist could be seen. As she stepped off the sidewalk, about to dash across, she saw Hamish McPherson, great-grandson of the Laird of McPherson Castle, standing across the way. He held hands with his new bride. Or was she now considered Mrs. Hamish McPherson? That's what Samantha was thinking about when she stopped in the middle of the street. Was Mrs. Hamish Archibald McPherson still considered a new bride? Or had the eight months made her just a wife? And if you had a year to give them a present, would an ex-lover be expected to follow those rules? And that's how Samantha got hit by a car. She'd heard the horn first, then she'd seen the car a second too late, and her messaging from her head to her feet hadn't seemed to be working as the large vehicle came plowing straight at her. She'd managed at the last second to move, a half jump, half sprint, and just when she thought she might make it out of harm's way, the corner of the car's bumper had knocked her into the air. She remembered screaming, but she hadn't heard a thing as the world went into slow motion. The car slammed to a stop, her body extending into the air. She felt nothing until she hit the pavement. Then, like a movie returning back to regular speed, she heard the people crowding around her, the urgency of their voices. She even remembered trying to get up and walk away before Hamish saw her. But nothing seemed to be working properly, in her head or body. Are you all right? A woman cried out, her face horrified as she looked at Samantha. Samantha looked down. A pool of blood gathered next to her hand, and she could feel the ground spinning underneath her. That's when she heard his familiar voice. But somehow it was deeper and strange. Sam, are you okay? Samantha. Samantha tried to open her eyes, but they were heavy, too heavy. And then everything went black. Chapter Two Samantha sat all alone in the emergency room in her bloodied clothes, her head bandaged up. You're lucky you survived such an accident, the nurse said to her in her thick London accent. Do you have someone to bring you home? Samantha checked her phone and nodded, but she didn't. The one person she wished she could call in London had left her on Regent Street. Right, well, let us know if you'd like us to call service for you, the nurse said, looking on at Samantha with a bit of pity in her eyes. She must have seen through her lie. She felt like a complete and utter loser. She had no one, in one of the world's largest cities no less, to come and take her home after being hit by a car. She went through her contacts in London and texted a few. Sorry, love, I'm out of town for the week, Iona texted back. Samantha had completely forgotten about her leaving, which meant Spencer was there as well. I'm in Spain with Fiona, Spencer sent. Come down here and recuperate. Samantha couldn't help but feel a stab of jealousy that no one had invited her. Maybe then she wouldn't have been hit by a car. But Samantha had never wanted to die more than when Nigel came walking through the hospital door. Nigel? Hey, you're okay. He came in with his phone in hand, typing as he walked into the room. She moved to sit up, but her head pounded like a jackhammer, and she immediately grabbed her temples. Ouch. Can I get you anything? Nigel asked, his forehead creased in concern. What are you doing here? Samantha almost didn't need to ask. Hamish hey, called me. Nigel looked back down at his phone. He said you just needed someone to drive you home, and they'll discharge you. Oh. Hamish called her publicist. She looked at her feet. She was missing one of her shoes, which had been knocked off by the impact of the car. She had always wondered about that. How could someone lose one's shoe? 
by getting hit by a 4,000-pound car while seeing the love of your life with his wife. That was how. You look good for getting hit by a car, he said in his swanky voice. Samantha tried to talk, but her throat felt scratchy and dry, and she squinted to get a better look around. She groaned as an image flashed in her head of Hamish holding his Penelope Matthews McPherson's hand. What were you doing standing in the middle of Regent Street? Nigel asked. Bloody stupid, if you ask me. Hamish called you? She felt sick. Apparently someone told him you were hit, Nigel said, not understanding the situation. Could you get me water, please? She could barely get the words out. He handed her the cup of ice. Oh, I think it's time you took a holiday, Nigel said. <sighs> Says the guy sending me to make videos on every corner of the earth. If she hadn't taken that godforsaken job, she would have never met Hamish, and she would have never fallen in love with him, and she would have never had her heart broken on Regent Street. Look, I know you're going through something, but you should look at this as an awakening. Nigel's 21-day self-improvement program oozed out of his words. Not everyone survives getting hit by a car. Did you call my mom? She panicked. Evelyn Rose would flip out if she found out her baby got hit by a car. He shook his head. No, but should I? No. Samantha moved her feet slowly off the hospital bed. She'll make me go back to the States and live with her. Samantha could see her convincing Samantha it was the best thing for everyone. Sounds lovely, Nigel said. Yes, and a bit smothering. I'd kill for a mum like yours, Nigel said. Well, apparently she's not good enough for the McPherson clan, she grunted as she shifted more off the bed. Look. Taking some time off doesn't sound like a bad idea. Go back to the States and do what you Americans do on holidays. Nigel had never left the European continent. He had no idea that Americans didn't know how to holiday. Americans worked and worked some more. And then they worked even more. Then they died of heart attacks, like her dad, who barely ever took a holiday. Or they had breakdowns like her mother, who had bought her happy solitude. Since Samantha didn't have much more than a few dollars in her bank account, the latter seemed to be out of reach. Your mother's place looked amazing, Nigel said, but his focus was still on his phone. Then you can come get right back to it. She had just left the island after helping her sister with the bakery a few months ago. She hadn't planned on returning until Renee's wedding. It's just that my sister's planning the wedding of the year, and my mother is in love with her boyfriend, with a house full of retirees and a baby. You made it seem wonderful, Nigel said, referring to her vlog posts and videos of her mother's place on Martha's Vineyard, a Victorian seaside home that sat on the edge of the Atlantic Ocean, named Seaview. It had been wonderful. The seagrass valleys up against the tall clay cliffs of Greyhead, whose sedimentary layers glowed gold against the sunrise. It is. Samantha felt like a complete fraud. Here she was, this adventurous travel blogger with all these exotic and fabulous friends. But she had no emergency contacts. Not even her ex-lover. I just don't belong there. And then, like the car hitting her on Regent Street, Samantha realized she didn't belong anywhere. Stop it! Nigel flung his hand at her, but his attention was back on his phone. <gasps> Did you see who's dating Kitty Grant? Samantha could not care less about who Kitty Grant was dating, or anyone in London for that matter. And why should she? What mattered anyway? All those parties, all those important events and weekends and extravagant vacations she'd vlogged about, and had posted on social media, all to have no one show up when she needed help. Did you try to get a hold of Matilda? Samantha asked Nigel. Her roommate would come and get her, right? 
Maybe her phone was dead, and that was why she hadn't returned Samantha's calls. She's working at Demi's tonight. Nigel's attention went to his phone before he stood up. Well, look who's here. Nigel slapped a handshake with Hamish, who appeared in the doorway. Are you taking her home, mate? Nigel asked. But Hamish didn't answer. He stood motionless in the door's threshold. Are you okay? Hamish asked her. She didn't answer. She didn't know she wanted to hit him for leaving her or hug him for showing up. I'm sorry I didn't go with you to the hospital, he said, but she could barely hear him. I think you should leave, she said forcefully. She looked down at her one shoe. What were you doing on Regent Street? He asked. Her heart stopped. Nigel looked back and forth between the two. What do you mean? Where are you following Penelope and me? He asked. She couldn't believe the accusation. Was he mad? Are you kidding? She couldn't believe she had once loved this man. Who have you become, Hamish? Do you really think I'd go around following you? I try to avoid you at all costs. Ever since he broke her heart, she had done everything to get over him. Then why were you sneaking around Regent Street, crossing where there wasn't a crossing? He asked. Because I was shopping. She looked to Nigel, who had been the one who sent her to Regent Street. A mutual friend had opened a new boutique. Leave this room now. I'm sorry about everything, Samantha. I really am. The look in his eyes said he spoke the truth. But she had never hated him more. How could she hate someone she loved so much? Her head screamed, but she tried as hard as she could to not look weak. So she stood up quickly out of bed, sending a searing pain down her whole body. He'd thought she'd been following them? Why would she have followed them? Get out! She picked up her arms, shrieking in silent pain, and pointed to the door. He turned and left without another word, didn't even acknowledge Nigel's head nod as he left. His fancy leather wooden-heeled shoes pounded down the hospital's corridor. Thanks for standing up for me, Samantha said to Nigel, as she immediately took a seat back on the bed. Nigel looked out the door. Hamish frightens me. She tried standing up again, which sent another shooting pain down her back. Ah! Oh, jeez. Ah. Go back to the States. To your mom's house, Nigel said. Put some space between whatever happened between the two of you and come back refreshed. She had heard this speech plenty of times before. Nigel had always thought Samantha worked too hard and too many hours. He always tried to get her to live a little by going out more and working less. Yes, exactly. His phone rang and he lifted it in the air, taking the call out in the hallway. Londoners were worse than Americans. They didn't ever take a break. They didn't sweat an 80-hour work week. Or at least Hamish never did. She sat there in the emergency room, the beeping of machines from other patients all around her. She was sad and pathetic. And Nigel couldn't sell sad and pathetic. She picked up her phone, hovering her thumb over the home button. She didn't want to go back home to the States broken, literally and figuratively. She didn't want to disappoint her mother and have Renee tell her so. She didn't want to admit she got hit by a car. Don't tell anyone about this, Samantha said to Nigel. No one can know about the accident, she paused. Or Hamish. He nodded. Okay. He looked down at his phone, and his forehead creased as his eyebrows lifted, and his eyes immediately widened in a look of sheer panic. What is it? she asked, her heart speeding up. It's already all over. Nigel cringed as he showed her his phone screen. There on Twitter read, Travel vlogger hit by local cab. Underneath the headline was a picture of one of London's famous black cabs. 
But it wasn't even a taxi. Samantha looked away from the headline. She looked out the window of London, which still felt completely foreign to her. I think you're right. I need a break. Away from the scene and stuff. Like a detox. Yes. You need to get off social media. Nigel patted her shoulder. In a few weeks, people will forget all about this. Samantha squeezed her phone so hard around its frame, holding back her tears, that she thought she'd break the glass. All right, then. Should we get you out of here? Nigel looked like he wanted to be anywhere but there. Yeah, sure. The rest of the time, she tried to pretend she was completely fine. That what had just happened to her was a normal occurrence, not a life-altering circumstance. The whole drive home, she sat in silent pain as Nigel ranted on about his new assistant. Her maturity level is at a twelve, but that's why she's good. Because she can reach the audience, he went on. When he dropped her off, Nigel double-parked outside her apartment and turned on the hazards. Do you, like, need me to take you up? She noticed he hadn't unfastened his seatbelt. No, it's okay. I'm fine. She slowly got out as a car beeped behind him. Nigel gestured something obscene and waved the car to go around them. Thanks for coming to get me, Samantha said. I better get out of here. He shifted into drive. Call me if you need anything. Just as her door closed, Nigel took off. As she slowly climbed up the steps to her posh apartment in Chelsea, which she could hardly afford, her phone buzzed. Are you okay? Matilda wrote. Yes, she wrote back, upset that her own roommate took this long to text her back after what Samantha had gone through. She didn't mean to sound short, but what could she say? She decided to add, Just scary. Yes, I suppose getting hit by a car is scary, Matilda wrote back. Do you have someone there, or do you need me to come home? Less than a year ago, she'd have made a joke with Matilda about seeing the light, or how she should have been less American by not looking right first. I'm good. Good, because I'm hoping to stay at Spencer's tonight. Wish me luck, XOXO, Matilda texted. Samantha opened her flight app, punched in the first three letters, and Logan International Airport popped up on the screen. She booked the first flight. Chapter 3 Samantha thought about her father's obituary on the flight to Boston. Her mother and sister and her had written it together. They'd had so much to say about him. They practically bought a whole page of the newspaper. Dr. George Rose had been a devoted husband, dedicated to his two daughters, and had committed his whole adult life to medicine and the work of helping others. So many people had shown up to his funeral that they had people standing outside the church, unable to get inside. Who would come to Samantha's funeral? Of course, her mother and sister, and their friends, and maybe even Nigel, if he wasn't busy. But who else? Her face burned in shame, thinking how Penelope might even feel relief if she was no longer in the picture. How could he have thought she'd been following him? Did she appear that pathetic? Had flying out to tell him she loved him all those months ago been the turning point for him to fall out of love with her? She closed the notebook. She wasn't dead, but she didn't feel all that lucky, like the nurse had said. Like the last time she had traveled back to the States, she told no one she was coming. She'd call her mom as she took the ferry over from Falmouth. She didn't want anyone to fuss over her, and her mother loved to fuss. The image of Hamish standing there, looking at her, flashed in her head, and she jolted in a cringe. The man sitting next to her pretended not to notice, but he leaned away from her. She wanted to smack her forehead. Why had she stopped in the middle of the street? 
She could have easily walked the other direction. Why did she stop and look at them? Because she had to see if they were happy. She had to see if leaving her had been worth it. She had to see if her broken heart was one-sided. Nigel was right. Leaving London and going to an isolated island was the best thing for her right now. That's why she had hired Nigel in the first place. He knew what was best for her career. Ladies and gentlemen, we are approaching our destination, the pilot said over the speaker. Please return to your seats, as the seatbelt light has been turned on. Please put your seats in the upright position. Flight attendants, prepare for landing. Samantha looked out the window at the streets of Boston buzzing in the early morning traffic rush. Like London, the city sat in a heavy gray fog next to the gray Atlantic Ocean. Even from above, she could feel the damp and cool air sneaking into the plane. Wasn't Boston nice during the summer? She noticed landmarks like the Charles River and the harbor ports near the airport. As the plane lowered, she grabbed hold of the armrests, watching as the waters of the Atlantic Ocean came closer and closer to the plane's belly. She held her breath as the plane suspended just a few feet off the ground, and then with a slight bump, the pilot landed the plane. It took two and a half hours to reach Falmouth Harbor and board the ferry. She decided not to text her mom after all, and wait until she reached Martha's Vineyard. She'd pop into the bakery first, check the pulse with Renee, and then surprise Evelyn. This way, there would be absolutely no fuss. She went to take a selfie on the ferry by habit, but caught herself in the camera, the screen not filtering the greenish tint of her bruised face, and stopped. She thought about making a humorous video, jokingly degrading herself. Look, everyone, I got hit by a car. Time for a refresh in Martha's Vineyard, she could say, while she showed the cold gray sea that stretched to what looked like the end of the earth. But even as a joke, she sounded pathetic. How could he have gone to the hospital and say that to her? How could he switch it off so quickly when she was certain he'd never felt like that with Penelope? When the fairy reached Martha's vineyard, she pulled out her leather jacket, which she had luckily packed at the last minute. It docked in the tiny harbor the locals called Eastport. As she stepped off the ferry, she could see her sister's bakery nestled in the middle of the other quaint shops along the main strip. She pulled her two suitcases through the mist that instantly frizzed her hair and fogged her glasses. Her head pounded as she shivered in the cold wetness, but she stopped in front of books and bread and didn't go in. Instead, she looked at the soft, warm glow coming from inside the bakery and bookstore. Each of the tables were full of customers. Some sat eating pastries and having coffee, while others looked like they were holding meetings and groups. Others read alone in comfortable chairs by the gas fireplace. A few browsed the bookshelves lining the store. A line five customers deep stood in front of the counter. And that's when she saw Renee standing behind it, a baby strapped to her chest, bouncing up and down with a huge smile on her face. Samantha had never seen her sister happier, not even with her ex-husband Harry, not even when their father was alive. She glowed like the fire inside. Her long blonde hair had been braided along one side and hung over her shoulder. She wore dangling earrings and a cute fashionable outfit under her posh apron with books and bread stitched on it. She looked like she was completely in her element, behind the counter, talking to customers, sharing her food with them. Samantha noticed the menu board displayed out front, and a cute new coffee bar on the side. She pulled the door open and stepped in. Like a deer sensing a stranger in their midst, Renee's slender neck stretched over the crowd, and she locked eyes on her. As Renee's mouth dropped in surprise, she raced around the counter, forgetting the customer she was helping, and came at Samantha with her arms stretched out. George bounced in the baby carrier, his own eyes open in surprise. What are you doing here? Renee shrieked, 
not caring that the whole store could hear her. She thrusted her body and baby George at Samantha and embraced her. George blew his lips as Renee squeezed her into a deeper embrace. A mix of confectioner's sugar and baby powder filled the air around her. Samantha noticed everyone looking at them as Renee stared at her bruises. What happened to your face? Renee said as soon as she released her embrace. Apparently, the two days she'd stayed in her apartment hadn't been enough time for the coloring to fade. Oh, it's nothing. Samantha tapped her fingers against the bruises, as if they weren't tender anymore. You left your customers. Samantha pointed to the elderly couple standing at the front of the queue, but then noticed a young man in the same style apron begin to help them. When did you get here? Renee asked, ushering her further into the store. Now. Samantha couldn't stop staring at the baby strapped to her sister's chest. She felt that familiar pull in her stomach that she'd started feeling at Christmas. The feeling that maybe she too would like to settle down and have a family. It didn't help that her nephew looked even more adorable than any of the Instagram photos her sister had posted. Samantha wished she was that aunt that whisked her nephew up in the air and this special relationship would immediately develop, a bond between the two of them. But he looked fragile and seemed unsure of her with a puzzled look he had on his face while staring at her. Plus, she had on a very expensive leather jacket and the drool coming from his mouth made her question whether she should hold him. She'd wait until later. Does mom know you're here? Renee's smile widened with the confidence Samantha hadn't seen on her before. She couldn't help but notice how pretty her older sister looked. Samantha grabbed hold of her sister's hand and examined the engagement ring. The large diamond sat like a massive rock on her petite finger. Do you bake with it? Samantha had never remembered her sister wearing jewelry. Renee shook her head. Can you imagine if I lost a diamond in the dough? Renee began to unstrap the carrier and lifted the baby into Samantha's hesitant arms. What do I do with him? She asked as George looked at her with disinterest, gnawing on a piece of gnarled biscotti. You hold him and make sure he doesn't fall on his head, Renee said. But she stood close as she handed him off to Samantha. Samantha's whole body froze into panic as she held the wiggling child. You can hold him on your hip, Renee said, adjusting his legs around her waist, and his chubby little legs instantly squeezed her belly and back, like a set of pliers. She no longer feared he'd fall. In fact, she worried if she'd be able to breathe with his grip so tight around her torso. Samantha looked down at baby George. His big blue eyes focused on the pendant hanging around her neck. Hot, George said, as Spit hit Samantha's face with his hard T. That means he likes it, Renee clarified. Oh, well, thank you. Samantha wished she had taken it off before arriving. Renee eyed the large blue sapphire teardrop. So what happened to you? Renee asked again. Oh, I fell, Samantha said, waving at Renee as though it was nothing as though a car didn't knock off her shoe and almost run her over. Is Charlie here? Renee looked behind her, but kept examining her suspiciously. He's in the kitchen. Let's go see him. Samantha held on to her nephew, but he suddenly squirmed to get out of her arms. Mama! People began to stare at the stranger holding their favorite pastry chef's child and making him cry. Let's follow, Mommy! Renee! Renee turned around and smiled at George's puckered out bottom lip and outstretched arms. You're fine, little man. That's Auntie Sammy. Samantha, she said, correcting her sister. She wasn't going back a decade. No way. George's whine soon turned into a hysterical screech. His arms flung more aggressively toward Renee. Renee soon relented, taking George into her arms and he immediately stopped crying. I see you, G, Samantha said, raising her eyebrow at her nephew's deception. He buried his head into Renee's neck, 
resting perfectly in her arms. Come on back and see all the final renovations, Renee said. She stopped at the counter and asked the young man helping customers, Sean, you okay on your own for a minute? Yes, boss, the young man said and turned his attention back to the line of customers. Renee, this place is booming. Samantha noticed even more people walking into the store. Well, we're busy right now, but I don't know about booming. Renee placed her hand on a wooden swinging door and pushed it open. They stepped into a modern, yet strangely antiquated French country kitchen. Black and white tiled floors, white marble counters, copper pots and pans hanging from the ceiling. This place looks amazing. Samantha pulled out her phone. She snapped pictures as Renee shared the details. I have the standing oven over there. Renee pointed to a large standing structure with a glass door. George hung on like another limb to her body. They moved completely in sync. The two conventional ovens are over here. My sink? She placed her hands on the huge stainless steel double sink. Then she pointed to the ceiling. And your chandelier is out front. She opened the swinging door to see the chandelier that had hung in Hamish's country house in the Highlands. It had been the first thing Mrs. Hamish McPherson removed from the ancient stone house on the lock. To Penelope, it was just a past relic. But to Emily, Hamish's mother, it had been her family's history. Samantha couldn't believe he no longer wanted it, so she bought it for her sister's bakery and shipped it directly to the island. Samantha had always loved the piece when it hung in his parents' large stairwell. She'd felt like a princess in the 500-year-old castle in the Scottish Highlands. It had been over the top, like only aristocracy did so well, yet sophisticated, just like Emily. Now looking back, Emily had been the first reason she had fallen in love with Hamish. She had adored his mother. She wondered if Penelope McPherson knew the glass chandelier had been made by a famous Scottish artist whose work included churches in Edinburgh and Glasgow. She doubted Penelope cared. But it did look perfect hanging in the store. This place is incredible, Samantha said, stepping back into the kitchen. She looked around the space, and that's when she saw Charlie's head behind a glass wall. She didn't even hesitate, but walked straight to his office and opened the door. Jazz played in the room as he sat, feet up on the desk, typing on his computer. Samantha, he said, kicking off the desk and placing his computer down. What are you doing back? She embraced her mother's boyfriend right as he came to her. He looked rested and well. Does your mother know you're here? he asked. But it was rhetorical at this point. Of course Evelyn didn't know. I'm here to surprise her, she lied. But it was the only thing she could think of that didn't sound as pathetic as the truth. That she had almost died, her career was in shambles, and she had no real connections with anyone besides her ex-boyfriend's dead mother. Yeah, surprising her mother sounded a lot better. Welcome back, he said smiling as he ushered her out to the store with Renee. Did you see all that your sister has done? The place did look incredible. Wide 12-inch honey pine floors, floor-to-ceiling windows, views of the harbor, shelves of books, along with Emily's chandelier. It looked... It's amazing. Renee beamed as she held George in her hands. We hired help for the counter. Charlie manages the books and I bake with Georgie. She shrugged as if running a successful business with an eight-month-old was no big deal. Plus, the Golden Girls are constantly all over him. He sure is the ladies' man. Charlie poked his finger at George's belly, which made the baby squeal in delight, and then flop his body toward Charlie, his arms outstretched. Exactly how he had tried to get away from Samantha. Samantha watched as this family a family she technically belonged to, seemed to have this amazing business, these deep connections, and knew everything about one another. She felt completely out of place.
Evelyn's going to be so thrilled you're here, Charlie said. But he immediately frowned. He squinted at her, examining her bruised face. I fell, she said, answering the questions building in his head. Crazy story. She had learned how to lie from Renee when they would go to parties in high school. The less details, the better. She hadn't thought about it, but with the weather and the quiet island, would she even be able to get to her mother's house without begging for a ride? Let me bring you to the house, Charlie offered, as if he read her thoughts. He took her luggage from her hand and wheeled it out with him. I'll quickly finish up here and meet you guys at the house, Renee said. She pulled out her phone from her back pocket. I can't wait to tell Mateo you're back. For just a little bit, maybe a week or two, Samantha said. She wouldn't tell them it depended on the severity of the negative tweets about her being stupid enough to cross on Regent Street in London. Yes, it was a busy street, but it wasn't implausible to cross. Maybe three. Samantha followed Charlie outside as the mist turned to cold, hard rain. They hurried to his truck. Here we go, Charlie said, and he turned on the engine and pulled out onto the street. She looked out at the harbor's water staring at the east, wondering if on the other side of the ocean he might be thinking of her. Chapter Four Samantha felt small in Charlie's truck. She hadn't really ridden in a truck since she was in Tyler Okerstrom's senior year. Her mom drove a minivan and her dad a sedan. She hadn't even owned a car since college, since she had lived in cities. She also felt strangely American, sitting in the big truck. You saw a lot of fancy SUVs everywhere in London, but vehicles like Land Rovers, Porsches, and Mercedes. Those vehicles felt completely different than a Chevy pickup. How's London? he asked. She could tell Charlie was keeping it light. Her arrival had been a shock to him. She was sure he was wondering how Evelyn would react. It's great. She watched his eyes in the rearview mirror. He had been sneaking glances at her bruises. It's fine. Looks worse than it is. Looks like you got hit by a car, he said. She turned around in the seat. You know? Know what? Then she could see the wheels turning inside his head. You got hit by a car? Charlie, she said in her oldest sounding voice. Please don't tell my mom. He shook his head. I won't have to keep it a secret. You look like you got hit by a car. Samantha was worried about that. When she followed Charlie inside, her mother stood at the kitchen sink washing dishes. Charlie, did you bring the salad? She looked up and saw Samantha. What in the... Samantha, what are you doing here? Surprise. Samantha held out her arms as if she had planned it all along, as if her life hadn't been smashed to pieces in one stupid moment. Evelyn turned off the water and rushed towards Samantha, her hands slapping her chest as she came. I can't believe you're here. Evelyn reached her hands out but stopped just before she reached Samantha. What happened to your face? Biddy came from the living room to the kitchen and hooted out like she had won something on the Price is Right. You didn't tell us you were coming. Then Wanda came in along with Stan, Charlie's dog. Oh, Wanda, your hair looks great, Samantha said. Wanda, who had undergone chemotherapy, had shaved off her hair last summer, but now fuzzy white curls had grown in. What are you doing here? Evelyn looked at her again, now studying her face. What happened? Did someone hurt you? I fell, slipped on my own feet. They'd believe that. She avoided looking at Charlie. I'm always telling you that you need to slow down. Evelyn sounded like she was talking to a five-year-old. Yes, mommy dearest. She noticed Wanda's face stricken, and she immediately regretted the comment. Wanda didn't seem to get her kind of humor. Where you make fun of your mother's well-meanings, and compare her to an abusive Hollywood actress. I mean, yes, 
I'll be more careful. Evelyn rolled her eyes, but smiled at her. I'm glad you're here. That, Samantha was sure of. Evelyn loved it best when her house was full. Do you mind if I stay for a few weeks? Samantha had planned out her situation on the plane ride. I'm taking a job over in New Zealand, and I have this extra time between gigs, so I thought I'd travel this way and take a pit stop here before heading there. That sounds wonderful, Evelyn said, but her eyebrows burrowed in confusion. Thankfully, Charlie swooped in. How about we all go out to dinner, he said. My treat. Charlie, that's really nice, Evelyn said. But that's a lot. We can just make dinner here. Plus, it's going to be packed this time of year. You're probably right, Charlie said. All the restaurants will be crowded because it's too cold to sit outside in this weather. Samantha remembered being able to see the ocean from every window in the house. Today, she could hardly see the seagrass past the yard. You brought London to Martha's Vineyard, Wanda said. Samantha noticed Wanda's hair may have grown back, but she looked smaller, if that was even possible. Her face was sunken, pasty. She didn't have the spark like she'd once had. She had aged as well. Hadn't she finished chemo? Why don't we at least order out, Samantha said. It can be on me. She didn't know why she'd said it, and she hoped to goodness that someone would call her bluff. But Evelyn seemed to smile and actually think about her suggestion. No, no, Evelyn said, and Samantha's heart started beating again. I have enough to make everyone dinner. So went the conversation of Evelyn and the women's routine. Each of the women took turns making dinner one night of the week. Charlie took care of the other nights. Why does Charlie get so many? Samantha asked. Evelyn shook her head. Because he likes to spoil us, old ladies. Who you calling old? Biddy said, winking at Samantha. Now, tell us about your next adventure. She wasn't supposed to give details when she lied, and she had already said New Zealand. Well, she paused, thinking of something believable to say. Why would she head to New Zealand? Why would her travel blog go back again? I'm going to Christchurch this time. I just can't get enough of that place. Maybe she could just go. She did love it there. Maybe the New Zealanders would be more friendly and welcoming than the Londoners. Maybe someone would pick her up at the hospital. She looked at her phone. No more messages after the flood of goodbyes and that they hoped she felt better. No one questioned why she would pack up and leave town. No one even really made sure she was okay. Her obituary would have nothing to say. Let's get you up to the guest room, and you can get unpacked. Evelyn took the swivel luggage across the floors and down the hall toward the staircase. Samantha noticed the smell of Seaview wasn't like the house she'd grown up in. Not that she could describe the smell of her childhood home, but this one didn't smell like her mother. Her mom walked her up to the room, grabbing her towels and a new pillow and sheets on the way. I'm sure these are just fine, Samantha said, opening the windows and taking in the fresh air. Do you mind? Evelyn shook her head but closed the bedroom door. Wanda's been running cold, so I'll just keep the door closed. How's she doing? Samantha asked. Evelyn frowned. It's day by day but she's meeting with her oncologist this week. Samantha wondered how her mother would be able to handle another death, if worse came to worse. She hardly handled losing her husband, if hiding in her house for five years was even considered handling it. She doesn't look that good, Samantha said. Maybe they didn't notice the changes since they saw her daily. No one had mentioned anything in their conversations. Evelyn sighed. I was afraid of that. But your sister's always saying I'm seeing into things. Renee had a habit of wanting to only see the positive side, instead of ever looking at the other side, the dark side. 
the side that made you feel scared and sad and somber. Since the birth of George, Renee had her own rebirth and had turned into a self-improvement guru, always rattling off Oprah or Brené Brown quotes, telling Samantha to dig into her vulnerability. Too bad Renee hadn't dug into her vulnerability before marrying the biggest jerk in the world, Harry Winthrop. Samantha had also seen things about her jerk brother-in-law well before any marriage took place. But Renee said she was seeing things. She does do that, doesn't she? Samantha said. How's everyone else? Evelyn began telling her the comings and goings of Martha's Vineyard. Mateo and his brothers worked on the cottage. Harper was still planning her move to New York City, but hit a snag with a roommate and rental and a bunch of other things. But she was starting her second book. Marty the mailman planned on retiring in a few months. Phil had his grandchildren visiting for the past two weeks. What about Marty and Wanda? The two had been hanging out before she left to go back to London. Yes and no, Evelyn said. He still comes around, but Wanda's not as reciprocal, let's just say. Is she not into him anymore? Samantha asked. I think she's scared, to be honest. Evelyn sat on the bed, her shoulders slumped. When George was first born, she had this new energy and this fight burning inside her, but now it's wearing on her. She's still on chemo and the treatments are hard. She's exhausted more, nauseous all the time, and they're still not completely over. What can I do to help? Samantha suddenly felt silly complaining about her life during Wanda's struggles. She was lucky. She sat next to her mother on the bed. Evelyn smiled, hooking her arm underneath Samantha's and leaning into her. Just being here, giving everyone a change of pace, is perfect. And just like that, she couldn't help but wonder about what the perfect prodigal daughter had been doing. Samantha knew Renee had spent a lot of time taking care of Wanda, making sure she was eating well, taking her to her appointments, spending time with her and George. The list went on and on. She knew because every time she talked to her mom on the phone, she'd relay all of the information about the perfect daughter. The one who had come back home to live by their mother. The one who had helped her mother let go of her pain. The one who made her so proud. Evelyn still didn't understand what Samantha even did. What did Samantha do at this point? What if her influencer career was over, just like that? Why did it look bad to get hit by a car? Because no one cool got hit by a car and had it plastered all over social media. She lifted her phone. Can't live without that thing, can you? Evelyn said with a tone not unfamiliar. Even in Samantha's 20s, it reminded her of when she was 15. I was just checking to see if I got any messages, Samantha said defensively, because her mother was righteously right. Samantha couldn't live without her phone. She was constantly checking it, making sure her hearts and likes and retreats were moving up. She refreshed if the homepage appeared similar, even though nothing new had come up with her last refresh. It's my career, basically. Samantha's ego wouldn't let it go. That's how I earn money. But even I stop writing, Evelyn said. Samantha wondered if Evelyn ever discouraged Renee with her dreams. I'm fine. But if Samantha told the truth, which was that she wasn't at all fine, Evelyn would encourage Samantha to slow down, take a step back from what she was doing and reevaluate. She'd point out her sister's own troubles and how she rose above them. Maybe this is a sign you need a break, Evelyn started. It's a sign I date idiots! A wave of anger rose so quickly as she spoke, she practically spit the words out at the end. Evelyn tilted her head. What do you mean? I mean, nothing. Evelyn's face immediately changed to sympathy, and Samantha regretted spilling any of the tea. 
she had to remember, the less details the better. You should do a detox since you're here, Evelyn said. I'm not taking drugs and I'm not an alcoholic, Samantha said. No, I mean your phone. Something about social media is making you fixated on your phone right now. All I'm seeing you do is scroll. Let me take your phone for a few days. You would be amazed at how much better you'll feel. Samantha shook her head. No way was she giving up her phone. She wasn't 15. She was 27 years old. She wasn't a child in trouble. She was an adult in crisis and needed to figure things out. She couldn't just fall off the face of the earth for a few days. Her audience would be gone by then. Mom, do you understand how I make my living? Samantha wondered if Evelyn even considered her vlog on travel and architecture making a career. She could hear her condescending tone and saw her mother's eyebrow raise. Yes, I do. Evelyn stiffened in her position. I also understand when someone is escaping, and you, my dear, are escaping something. Whatever it is, whether it's that man from Scotland or maybe you've really convinced yourself you wanted to surprise your mother, but the island can't do its job if you're stuck in the world you're escaping from. Evelyn nodded at the phone. Maybe her mom was right. Maybe she was stuck. Maybe she should just forget the fact that she was in love with Hamish, that he was the only man who made her feel that way. Maybe she should forget his confession to her that night. Maybe if his mother hadn't died, they could have been together. I'm not stuck. Boy, was she stuck. I'll leave you alone about it, but just know I'm here if you want to talk, Evelyn said. Samantha could see her mother was trying to work on her need to control the situation, and she appreciated her restraint. Thanks, Samantha said, but she didn't get rid of her phone. I should unpack. Okay, well, let me know if you need anything. Evelyn opened the door and left, shutting it behind her. The first thing Samantha did was turn on her phone screen, the app open on her phone already. Two more comments appeared. I didn't even have to read the article to know she's American. How many a week get hit by a cabbie for not looking to the right? Then it had a smiley face emoji. The next comment had Penelope McPherson tagged. Isn't this the girl? Samantha's heart dropped. She was the girl. The girl who Penelope's husband still loved. The girl who made him happier than any other woman. The girl he wished he could have married if he hadn't had to save his family's house. Her heart raced. What if Penelope wrote something back? Oh, God. She wouldn't write something about what Hamish had said to Samantha in the hospital, would she? She refreshed and kept refreshing for a half hour. And that was when Penelope McPherson's name popped up. Her profile picture was from the wedding. Even in the tiny picture, Samantha could see the gray castle behind them. They would have married in the stone chapel on the property, the one where all the children of the McPherson clan had been christened, married, and buried. Samantha wondered what the wedding had looked like. Penelope's family had more money than God, so she imagined it had been like a fairy tale, with McPherson Castle as the setting and the great Loch Lagan as the backdrop. She could imagine the haunting sounds of the bagpipes echoing across the loch as the procession had reached the chapel. She could even see Hamish in his best kilt with his family's crest. She's completely nutters, Penelope wrote. Samantha shut the screen, her heart beating so hard in her chest that she could see it rising up and down. She took in a deep breath as her hands shook. She so badly wanted to write something, so badly wanted to tell the truth, so badly wanted to stick up for herself. She took a screenshot of it and sent it to Nigel. Help! She looked at the phone, waiting for an instant reply, going back to the app and checking the comments, the likes, the... Oh my God, the shares! 
It was at a dozen. Another comment popped up. That's what happens when you sneak around after another woman's husband. Samantha felt sick. Her career was over. Chapter 5 Usually, Renee didn't ask a lot of questions. Samantha would tell her everything when she was ready to talk. And pushing Samantha to talk was like pushing a turtle to hurry. You got nowhere. As kids, Renee would frequently know exactly what Samantha wanted without her ever uttering a word. For a while, her parents would ask her to translate what Samantha was saying because they couldn't understand. Even up until middle school, Samantha only talked to a select few. But by high school, Samantha had changed overnight. No longer had she stayed quiet, but she could be heard entering a room, chatting away. As if something had clicked, Samantha had no trouble talking to anyone. Peers, the cool kids, older kids, Renee's friends, teachers, their parents' friends, and even strangers. Going from someone who couldn't even order her food at a restaurant to being the student getting in trouble for talking too much, the shift had been a breath of fresh air for their parents, who had worried about Samantha's social development. Whatever had clicked, all the anxiety and worry she'd had about talking to others had completely disappeared. Her shy, insecure little sister had become a strong, confident young woman. Samantha had instantly become popular. Everyone adored her. Renee's friends started calling her to hang out. Annoyed and awed, when Renee took off to Chicago, she had been glad to get out of Samantha's shadow. Even when she had visited this past summer, Renee had figured Mateo would have fallen for Samantha just like every other man. Her sister was gorgeous. Renee suddenly felt fat as she looked into the mirror of her closet which she was also using as baby George's room until the wedding. She still hadn't lost the baby weight. She thought about the move into Mateo's house, or as he kept telling her, their house. She wanted it to be her house. It was a beautiful home. But could she move into a house he had bought, he had renovated, and he had lived in for years? Hadn't she learned from her divorce not to depend on anyone but herself? Ugh. The argument had rolled around in her head each morning since she'd agreed to move into his house after the wedding. Mateo kept saying it would be theirs. He'd even put it in writing if she wanted. But she had promised herself after Harry had left her that she'd never be dependent on another man. And here she was, a year later, marrying someone and moving into his house? Was that smart as a mother? The obvious fact was that Matteo was not Harry Winthrop. Matteo wanted to adopt her son, not run away from him. Matteo wanted to provide and protect the two of them, whereas Harry had just paid them off. No, Matteo wasn't Harry. But she couldn't help but look at history to see she was doing the exact thing she had done with Harry. Move in, bring nothing to the table. Sure, she had books and bread, which had been doing better than she could have ever expected. But what if something were to happen unexpectedly? What if she couldn't pay her way? Could she rely on Matteo? Would he continue to support her, even if she didn't bring anything to the relationship except her baggage? She sighed, looking at her wardrobe. Even after eight months, the baby weight wasn't disappearing like the books said they would with breastfeeding. She had read calories burn away with breastfeeding. But all she did while breastfeeding was eat. She peeked over to George, who sat in his crib, chewing on his fabric book he liked to play with while falling asleep. What should mommy wear today? She asked, although she wasn't sure if she had much of a choice. She'd have to wear her maternity swimsuit and a sundress that was big enough and long enough to cover her tush. Today... The crew was having a beach day. It would be one of the first full days off since opening the store with Charlie. She had the store covered with help. Charlie promised to check in, but otherwise she wasn't going to worry about a thing. The store could manage itself without her. She hoped. Oh, God. Could Lydia handle the counter while opening up the store? 
She grabbed her phone and texted Lydia a reminder to turn the coffee on right when she arrived. Okay, little man, you ready for some breakfast? She asked. She picked George up out of his crib and held him on her hip as she walked downstairs to the kitchen. As she reached the first floor, she could hear the buzzing of the ladies coming home from their morning walk. Good morning, Biddy said as they walked in, her arms outstretched to George. When did this pumpkin pie wake up this morning? He slept all the way to 4.30, Renee said, pulling out the overnight oats from the fridge. How was your walk? Fantastic, Evelyn said, sipping from her water bottle. Last summer, Renee had questioned whether the women would keep up with their daily routine of walking before breakfast. But a year later, they still were walking. They had more gear to go along with their walks, and during the winter months, they decked out in all sorts of winter clothes. Today, Biddy wore leggings and her usual flowered sweatshirt with a pair of sneakers. Renee looked behind Biddy for Wanda, but she didn't come. Where's Wanda? I'm here. Wanda came walking into the room in her pajamas. She hadn't gone on the walk. Renee pulled out the protein shake she had made earlier and handed it to Wanda. This one has berries in it and a little bit of mint. Wanda waved it away. I'm not that hungry this morning. Wanda sat at the table in her pajamas, something Renee hadn't seen her do before. You want a cup of coffee? Wanda placed her hands on the table. That's perfect, thank you. Renee walked to the cupboard and took out a mug. She exchanged glances with both her mother and Biddy. They'd noticed it too. Did you sleep well last night? Biddy asked. Wanda shook her head. No, I'm afraid I tossed and turned. Renee poured the coffee, then made it the way Wanda liked it, and walked it over to her. Biddy placed George in his high chair. Here you go, Biddy said, making silly faces at the baby. George, do you want berries with your oatmeal? Renee asked him. He slammed his tray. Yes. Drool proceeded to dribble down his chin as he hit the tray with his hands. Renee dumped raspberries, blueberries, and cut up strawberries from the local orchards on his tray, and he grabbed a bunch in one hand. One at a time, mister, she said, releasing the fistful of berries and handing him one. One. She handed him one again, and he took it and shoved it into his mouth. Then she handed him another. And soon, George figured out Mom only wanted him to pick up one, and she wouldn't bother him. I have the picnic all set up for lunch, Renee said. She had packed chicken salad with fresh bread, a few chocolate croissants, scones, fruit, and plenty of munchy foods like chips and pretzels. Is Samantha up? Evelyn shook her head. Do you know what's going on with her? Renee also had suspicions something was going on with her sister, but she didn't want to butt in where she didn't belong. She's probably here so she doesn't have to talk about it. Sometimes people want to figure things out on their own. It wasn't supposed to be a dig but Evelyn's face said she took it that way. I'm just concerned. I know you are, Renee said. She did. Look, Samantha always spills. Just give her time. Renee began to pack the basket. She heard a soft rapping on the screen door and saw Mateo standing out on the porch. You know you don't have to knock every time you come here, she said smiling as he walked in. I don't know if I'll be intruding on one of your gossip sessions, he teased. He kissed her on the cheek and went straight to George. Oh, wow, you're eating blueberries. George pounded his tray as Mateo sat down. Yes. A babble came next as George discussed the intricacies of eating berries with Mateo, all in baby talk. That's really interesting, little man. Mateo said to him, making Renee and the rest of the women swoon, even more for the handsome contractor who had stolen Renee's heart. You working on the cottage today? She asked him. Just this, the morning, then headed over to the new place up the road. 
Mateo turned and said to Wanda, Do you want me to bring out the wooden lounger for your back? I don't think I'm going to join everyone today, Wanda said, her hands still placed on the table. She still hadn't touched her coffee. I think I'm going to go back to bed and take a nap. Mateo shot Renee a look. You okay, Wanda? Biddy asked. You want me to call your doctor? We could go to the walk-in, Evelyn suggested. No, no, no. Wanda shook her head a couple times. I'm fine, just tired. Couldn't sleep last night is all. She smiled at everyone. Some days it just catches up with me. Do you want anything while we're at the beach? Renee asked. No, I'm fine, thank you. She didn't move from her seat, her eyes looking out the window and not on them. You sure you don't want to take a nap by the water, under the umbrella? Biddy asked. I'm fine, Wanda said, a bit less patient. I'd like to spend some time alone. They didn't push anymore, but Renee couldn't help but worry. This was unusual, even for Wanda. Well, we'll give you some space and head to the beach soon, Evelyn said. Renee noticed her mom rub Wanda's back. Wanda didn't move, didn't add to the mix, didn't even say goodbye when they left, until George leaned over in Renee's arms and reached out toward her. Hot! George said it with a hard T sound at the end. He reached out his hand, his index finger pointing at Wanda. Hot! She's going to take a nap, Renee said to George. He was seriously a genius and a psychologist. He always knew when to act extremely adorable at just the right times. Wanda smiled at him. Don't worry. I'll come to the beach later. Hot. Yes, the sand will be hot, but I'll wear shoes, Wanda said. This seemed to satisfy George, and he nodded at Wanda. Night-night. Night-night, Wanda said back. But a frown formed as George turned away, ready to go to the beach. Wanda looked defeated, and Renee had never seen Wanda defeated. Renee and George kissed Mateo goodbye as they followed the rest of the crew out to the beach. Julia waved as soon she saw Renee and everyone coming. Julia who was married to Jose, Mateo's brother, had become one of Renee's closest friends over the past few months. She and her kids were already set up and ready to play. Sand shovels, pails, trucks, buckets, more heavy-duty shovels for digging bigger holes. Her children had it all. George loved his soon-to-be cousins. He loved watching everybody play. He even let Julia hold him and often tried to share some of his toys with the boys. When any of Julia's three children gave George attention, he was in heaven. He wanted to be a big kid, too. As soon as he saw everyone on the blanket, his feet started kicking, wanting to get down. It's hot, Renee said, hence his newest choice of words. Hot! He punctuated the T even louder. Yup, and you'll burn your little feet, Renee said. She waved at Julia and the kids as they got closer. Julia waved back. She looked at ease handling three children at the beach all by herself, whereas Renee needed two women to help watch just one baby. I heard Samantha's back in town, Julia said, as the women adjusted their umbrellas into the sand. She is, Renee said. She put George on the blanket and unloaded a bag of his toys. Hot, he pointed to a shovel. Do you want Jojo's shovel? Julia asked leaning over her blanket to the toys. Yes. George clapped as Julia handed it over. How long is she in town? Julia asked the women. We don't know, Evelyn said. Anyone who wasn't her daughter, or who hadn't heard that tone being used on them, would think Evelyn had just made a comment. But that was more than a comment. Evelyn was annoyed and Renee was glad she wasn't the one who had caused her annoyance. Well, I'm glad to hear she's back, Julia said. All the kids started playing in the sand next to George, 
digging holes and placing wet sand towers around George, who smashed each one in a fit of giggles. On the side, Biddy and her mom discussed Wanda as Julia and Renee listened. Is everything all right with Wanda? Julia whispered to Renee as they walked to the water's edge with the kids to fill up buckets. Renee shrugged, holding George by his hands and dipping his toes into the foamy waves. She's just been more tired than usual and kind of sad. I remember when my dad got cancer, Julia said. He fell into a bad depression. Renee nodded. That's exactly what she was worried about. She's been so positive all this time. I just don't want her to lose that. It's hard day in and day out, Julia said. Feeling lousy all the time. Renee nodded, looking back at Biddy and her mom, kibitzing now. She was glad they had each other, and Wanda had all of them. And she was lucky she had Julia, who had turned out to be a wonderful friend. Even luckier that Julia would become Renee's sister-in-law when she married Matteo. You want to invite Samantha to dinner tonight? Julia asked. Sure, Renee said, thinking about how nice Julia was to even offer. Their weekly dinner at Jose and Julia's house had been something she looked forward to. I'm not sure she'll want to come, with traveling and stuff. She's probably still pretty jet-lagged. Renee snuck a glance back at her mother. She was just about out of earshot. I think she came here because something happened in London, Renee said in a low voice. But she hasn't said what it is yet. Julia whispered. Is she in some kind of trouble? According to Samantha's vlog, her life was fabulous. Samantha traveled the world on someone else's dime, spent time in fabulous locations, and met amazing people. Nothing would indicate something was wrong. But something didn't sit well with Renee. Maybe it was her sister's intuition, but something was up with Samantha. Maybe she's just here for vacation. I can never tell with Samantha. Renee looked out at the water. There weren't too many others on the beach, even though it was a beautiful day. Sugar Beach sat privately along the Atlantic Ocean, a soft, pale, sandy beach with plenty of space for families to play and spread out on. The water could be rough at times, but mostly had gentle waves coming onto the shore. On one end sat gray head cliffs, and at the other end of the beach was the Wharf Hotel. Evelyn's Beach sat at the further end, near Gray Cliffs, among the grassy hills beyond the beach. When Renee first arrived in Martha's Vineyard, alone and pregnant, she never thought she'd heal from what her ex-husband had done to her. But the island did mysterious things. And just like everyone said, she was able to move on and let go. Everything came together when she chose the island. She got back into baking, she started a business, she prepared to become a mother, she fell in love. The island had not only healed her, but allowed her to grow and expand her circle to a wide community. A year later, Renee felt full. This place did that to people. One need only look at her mom to see that. How the island could heal what Wanda was going through was her biggest concern. No matter what was going on with Samantha, she knew her sister well enough to know she'd be okay. Samantha always worked things out on her own, like when she was too shy to talk. When Renee had gone to school and Samantha had to find friends on her own, guess who had decided to talk? When Samantha wanted to travel the world and everyone said she was crazy, she'd shown them how to do it, not only in style, but total class as well. Is Matteo working at the Mitchell house today? Julia asked. Renee nodded, excited about Matteo's newest and biggest job yet. An actor from Hollywood had bought one of the few farms on Martha's Vineyard and wanted to renovate it all. The house, the barns, the farmland, everything would be updated and modernized. This had been a recommendation from someone on the island that Matteo had worked with during the winter. People noticed Matteo and his brother's work. He had quickly gained notoriety when he'd renovated Charlie's bookstore into books and bread. The work had been done impeccably. 
upholding the true character of the Victorian architecture of the buildings, but updated inside to rival any modern bakery. Jose said he's renting a place on the beach while the house is being worked on, Julia said, pointing down the beach. Not far from here. Have you seen the show he acted in? Renee asked. She almost didn't want to admit that she and Samantha had had a huge crush on the teenage actor. Miami High? Yes! Julia's eyes bulged as she said, I love that show in high school. I know, Renee said. Have you seen him now? Does he look as handsome? Julia shook her head. Jose thinks I'm ridiculous, but Chase Mitchell was so hot when he was on that show. As Jess... And when he kissed Maria in the second season finale? Julia put her hand on her heart as if the fictionalized teenage soap opera had really happened. I know. Renee shook her head as though this were real life. And when she died in that car accident. And it was his brother's fault. I felt so bad for him, Julia said. Should I invite him to dinner? Is that what wives do with contractors? Ask Hollywood movie stars to dinner? Renee asked. It was what Evelyn would do. Julia shrugged. I'd ask the guys first, but I think it's a great idea to welcome him to town and introduce him to some people. Have him sign the poster that used to hang in my sister's bedroom, Renee said, only half joking. Samantha did still have the poster. They returned with water for the castle's moat. Biddy got on her knees and helped the bigger kids dig a trench to the incoming tide. Julia took one of the shovels and started moving the sand into George's bucket, packing the wet sand down with her hand. George copied her, smashing his shovel in the sand, then instantly put it in his mouth. Oh no, Renee pulled out the shovel, George's face twisted by the grit. Ew, sand is yucky, Renee said, reaching over to the towel Evelyn had already extended to her. She wiped George's tongue. Hut! He pointed his finger to his tongue. Yucky, she said back, but his serious face and concern of the sand made her giggle. She couldn't help herself. She took George in her arms and started kissing all over his face, sending him into a fit of giggles as she continued to wipe out the sand from his mouth. God, did she love her baby. She looked out at the women sitting with her on the beach. God, she loved her life. She thought of everything that had happened over the past year. Mateo, the bakery, working with Charlie, living with the women, being close again with her mom, finding a friendship with Julia, the wedding planning, becoming a mother, and now Samantha's arrival. Everything was coming together. Chapter 6 Samantha lay in the darkness of her room, all the curtains closed. The windows were open to hear the waves. Hardly any air flowed through, but when it did, light would flicker across the walls. She didn't want to get up, even though she had technically slept all night. She listened as everyone got ready to go to the beach. Then it was silent after they left. She looked down at her phone again, staring at the screen. She had the comments practically memorized at that point. There hadn't been any new comments in the past two hours, but knowing her luck, it would go viral. Lunatic American stalking an honorable man who just wanted to save his family's legacy. Hamish had told her that he'd never loved Penelope. He'd told her so many times. If only Emily had lived. Then he would have married Samantha they would have saved McPherson Castle together, and they would have all ridden off into the Scottish Highland sunset. If only Emily had lived. It was in college that Samantha had created her vlog, when she had studied abroad in Spain. Every chance she could, she had escaped on a train or bus or begged for a ride and traveled throughout Europe on barely any money at all. She'd made videos to show her friends, but other people started following her, and then more people. She did everything for her vlog. She was her own web designer and brand designer and script writer and assistant and travel agent and manager. But she paid Nigel for PR. 
He was a friend of a friend who had convinced her he could make her even bigger, help her reach wider audiences. And with the promise she'd reach millions, she had decided to hire him. And luckily, he'd been right. He'd also promised that if negative publicity were to come her way, he would be able to spin it so it came back rosy. But he wasn't spinning her story now. He hadn't even returned her phone calls or texts she had sent throughout the night, as comments kept coming about her nutty behavior and how creepy and stalkerish it was for a vlogger to fall in love with her client who was married. She wished she could hate Hamish, call him and tell him how hurt she was. Tell him off for going along with this ridiculous story. He knew she wasn't nutty or a stalker, right? Traveling had always been so much fun. Going to people's homes and seeing how others lived had been interesting, especially after her vlog had taken off on Instagram. People everywhere had started following her to magnificent houses all over the world. That was the theme. She traveled to these exotic and fabulous homes and spent a holiday talking about their place with them. After she became even more popular, high-end hotels, bed and breakfasts, and the best Airbnbs all started asking her to travel to them, paying her way and stay. She started making enough to find a place to rent in London. She'd put out an ad for a female roommate, and Matilda had worn an outfit she'd wanted to borrow, and brought homemade biscuits. She had decided that London would be her home base city, while she traveled the world, living vicariously through the wealthy 1%. But now, London felt too small. Hamish only lived a few blocks away, in the house he'd bought after Emily had died, where Penelope wanted to live, because she loved to walk in the private park. The same park where he had broken up with Samantha. If I marry Penelope, I'll be able to save the house he told Samantha as they sat on a bench. Her heart had stopped dead in her chest. It just can't work. He had said it as if that was as good of an explanation as any. My mother left me with nothing. I can't keep the house if I don't marry her. Hamish, it's a house, she'd said, but she'd known it was more than that. It was everything to him, and he'd been right. He'd have lost it all if he stayed with Samantha. She had nothing, absolutely nothing to offer. But she had still felt betrayed. How could he have just gone back to Penelope without talking to Samantha? Their year together over just like that? Shouldn't she have had a say in the matter that would change her life forever? Then a sick realization had flashed in her mind. What are getting married? His voice had cracked then. That's when she had gotten up and walked away. She had thought the day he broke up with her on that park bench had been the worst day of her life. But now, as she lay in bed in her mother's beach house, staring at the comments of how she had deserved being hit by a car for stalking someone's husband, she realized how very wrong she'd been. Because this day, this was the worst day of her life. As the hours blurred together, she couldn't stop the blue screen from dulling her eyes even more. She couldn't stop. She had to keep looking at the comments, waiting for someone, anyone, to stand up for her. Did her friends think she was stalking Hamish too? Is that why Nigel wasn't calling her back? Oh, God. Did the public truly think she was a creepy American stalker? Maybe Evelyn had been right. Maybe she needed to distance herself from social media. Take a break. Take a holiday, like Nigel had suggested. Let the island heal her. She opened her phone's photos and went directly to her favorite, the one of Hamish staring out at the lock during the last weekend they had spent together. It had been the happiest she'd ever seen him, right before Emily had gotten into the accident, before everything had changed. Knock, knock. Evelyn said from the other side of her bedroom door. Come in. She tried to sound peppy. It's eleven, Evelyn said, walking into the dark room. Just like when Samantha had been a teenager sleeping in, she started opening the shades. I like them closed. Samantha sat up in bed, 
rubbing her eyes with her hands. Evelyn's face twisted. It's a beautiful beach day, and you're missing it. Her mom pulled open another curtain, and the sun hit Samantha's face, stinging her eyes. She grabbed her pillow and covered her head. I want to stay here, she mumbled from under her pillow. You need to get some sunshine on that face, and for some of that salty air to penetrate your lungs. Evelyn patted her leg. I'm enjoying this bed very much, thank you. I bet they don't have beautiful days like this in London, Evelyn said. Well, at least not frequently. Samantha looked at the perfectly clear blue sky. Her mother wasn't going to let up until she got out to the beach. I'm going to shower my jet lag off first and have some breakfast. Evelyn looked over at Samantha's phone, sitting on her bed next to her pillow. The photo still displayed on the screen. Is that him? Evelyn pointed at the photo. Samantha gave a solitary nod, not moving. Evelyn didn't move either, as if waiting for Samantha's permission, but Samantha had no intentions of handing it over. The screen went black before anyone moved. Well, we're down at the beach with George, Evelyn said, as if the exchange hadn't happened. Join us. A baby always helps someone get out of their funk. George doesn't even like me, Samantha said. She suddenly felt ridiculous that she was upset that her eight-month-old nephew wasn't interested in his auntie. But nonetheless, she was going to argue this if it distracted Evelyn from Hamish's photograph. He doesn't know you, Evelyn said. Besides, there's Biddy and Julia. Julia, Samantha groaned to herself. If she had to hear one more fabulous thing about Renee's amazing new life, that's when she would go nutty. What about Wanda? Didn't they do everything together? She's taking a rest, Evelyn said, but her tone had changed, and her eyes slanted down. Is she okay? Samantha asked, suddenly concerned. She didn't know Wanda that well, but she did know how hard it had been for her. Yes, she's fine. Just tired. Evelyn focused on a piece of fuzz on the comforter. Look at that. It's goose feather. She held it out to Samantha in her palm. Remember how Daddy used to make you blow on it to make a wish? Samantha didn't remember. He made me wish on a lot of things. Pennies, dice, feathers. No, he would do it at night before bed. Don't you remember? Evelyn said, her smile growing as the memory came back to her. You'd both hold it in his hand and count to three. Samantha didn't remember any of that. She remembered other stuff. Her father loved to tell her to make a wish, and he'd call out big money when they played family board games together. He also always made them throw pennies in any kind of wishing well, fountain, or water under a bridge. He'd have her kiss his golf ball before the spring tournament against other pediatricians. He'd say a prayer every time he got in the car with them. And he had always tucked her in at night. Then she realized why she didn't remember this. You're thinking of Renee and Daddy. Am I? Evelyn looked bewildered at the mix-up. Are you sure? Samantha flung off the covers and got out of bed. Is that why you think he's talking through birds? Because of the feather thing? No, Evelyn said. Doubt all you want, but your father talks to me every morning. She wanted to say something back, but it only come out as being snide. And she didn't want to hurt her mother's feelings on the second day she had arrived. She had no one else after all. So she didn't mention the idea that maybe Evelyn saw into things, and that her father wasn't a flying seagull telling her to date Charlie. You know he loved birds, Evelyn said, not leaving her room. Samantha pulled out a drawer and grabbed a suit. So I'll just get cleaned up. But you will come down? Yes, I'll be there. Samantha groaned all the way to the bathroom, clutching her phone in her hand. As soon as she closed the bathroom door, she turned on the shower but sat on the toilet seat, staring at the phone, panicking about whether there were any new comments. The device was killing her softly. 
She pushed the sobs down, and they scraped and tore through her chest as she waited for her mother to leave her room. When she heard her mother close the door and the footsteps down the hall, Samantha let go. She sobbed the whole shower. That was when she heard a knock. I'm coming, she shouted through the bathroom door. Samantha, she heard a soft woman's voice say. Wanda? She had forgotten that Wanda had stayed to rest. Are you all right? Oh, God. She'd heard Samantha sobbing in the shower. How would she keep this under wraps? Her mother was going to find out now, no question about it. Yes, I'm fine, she said with as much gusto as she could muster. But she hiccuped the last of the word fine. Then she heard silence. Nothing. She listened, frozen in the shower. Still nothing. She grabbed her towel, dried off, and got in her swimsuit. When she opened the door to leave the bathroom, there on her bed sat Wanda. Oh, you're here. She practically jumped back, not expecting Wanda to be waiting for her. She suddenly felt strange and awkward. Are you all right? Wanda asked again. I thought I heard someone crying. Samantha stood frozen, unsure of what to do. She stood in the middle of the doorway, scared of this 90-pound retiree from Palm Springs, and unable to lie. Please don't tell my mother, were the first words that came out of her mouth. Why not? Wanda asked, but not in a condescending tone. It was a real question, as if she really wanted to understand Samantha's reasoning. Because she already doesn't understand my job, Samantha said, hoping this might clear things up. This has something to do with your job? Wanda asked. She looked suspicious. Um, Samantha bit her bottom lip. No, sort of. Sounds like a broken heart, Wanda said. Tears sprung to her eyes, and Wanda's figure blurred but she could see her pat the spot next to her on the bed. What happened? I married someone else. She could barely get the words out as she cried hard. Wanda didn't stop her, didn't do more than grab her hand. The two of them must have sat for at least 30 minutes, holding hands, letting Samantha cry. When Samantha's sobs calmed and she regained her breath, Wanda squeezed her hand and said, Let's go to the beach. You're coming too? Samantha heaved in a deep breath. Yes, I should get some fresh air, Wanda said. Thank you. Then Samantha made a face. You won't tell my mom, will you? It's not my story to tell, Wanda said. But it instantly made Samantha feel guilty for not being open with Evelyn. If she watched her vlog or paid a little bit more attention to her other daughter, Evelyn would know about Hamish, about Emily and the castle. She would understand why her heart was breaking into a million pieces. The love of her life was not only gone, but an accomplice to her demise. Did he know what Penelope wrote online? Did he know how that would instantly ruin her career? He told her that he'd never loved Penelope. Well, he must have never loved Samantha either. Chapter 7 The next day, Evelyn pushed George in the stroller as he pointed ahead to the various stalls at the farmer's market. She and Charlie walked the perimeter while also buying all the ingredients for the bakery. It's so hot already, she said, looking at her watch. It was only 8.30, and the temperature had to already be in the 80s. George waved to a passerby and had a huge drop of sweat rolling down his temples. Do you want me to finish up and you and George can sit in the car and turn on the air? Charlie asked. George hung onto the tray of the stroller, waving and babbling to himself, happy as a clam. He seems perfectly fine, but thanks. They continued to walk down the aisles of stalls, selling produce, homemade crafts, jams, and jellies. But Evelyn's mind wasn't on the market. It was back home at dinner last night. 
Samantha had said she was jet-lagged and had skipped dinner. It's just weird, she said. We always have dinner. It's been that way forever. Evelyn wished her children would just let her know what was going on, instead of her having to pussyfoot around everything. Something's up. Charlie nodded, knowing Evelyn well enough to wait and listen before giving his two cents. And she's constantly checking her phone. It was constant. Almost to the point it had driven Evelyn crazy at the beach. Samantha had sat on one of the most beautiful islands in the world, and she was checking social media. Job or not, Evelyn wasn't dragging her computer down to the shore. Everyone needed a mental break. I know the guy she was interested in broke it off and is now married, but it feels as though something else is going on, and she's not telling us. Charlie nodded. Look, she didn't want me to tell you. Evelyn stopped dead in the middle of the crowd of people. A couple almost bumped into George. Tell me what? The bruises weren't from a fall. Charlie's face dropped. She was hit by a car. A car? Evelyn said it so loudly that people turned around to see what was happening. She was hit by a car? Charlie nodded. She said she was just banged up and was fine. She got hit by a car and didn't want me to know? Evelyn couldn't believe how far their relationship had drifted. She didn't want you to worry, Charlie said. She told you, though. She didn't want to sound angry at Charlie, but he decided to tell her now? How long have you known? Samantha had been on the island a few days now. She accidentally said something on the drive to the house, and she made me promise not to tell you. Charlie looked like he felt horrible. I'm sorry. As mad as she was about Samantha hiding the truth, she could tell Charlie didn't want to hold a secret like that, and Samantha had put him in a difficult situation. Evelyn wondered how scary that must have been for Samantha. She must have been so frightened. She did choose to come back home after the whole thing, Charlie pointed out. Maybe you should focus on that. She came back for a reason. Harper would tell you if she got hit by a car, Evelyn said, not letting it go. Harper's not Samantha, Charlie said, making another point. Besides, it's like apples to oranges. Samantha can't stay in one place and Harper can't leave. Harper's first book had released, and she had big dreams to move to New York City. But every time things got close to maybe happening, it always fell apart. At first, Evelyn thought it was just bad luck. But the more she got to know the young woman, the more she realized Harper didn't really want to leave. What if there's something really bad going on and she needs help? Evelyn said. Then she'll ask for help, Charlie said, as though he had no doubt Samantha would. You raised a very independent woman who, in her own time, will ask for support if she needs it. The accident must have been a big scare. And what do our characters always do when they have a big scare? How true, Evelyn thought. Life always came back to story. They reevaluate their lives, he nodded. She's here, in a safe place with her family. She's already doing the right thing. Have faith that you did your job, and she'll come when she needs you. Evelyn pushed the stroller again, watching as George discovered a few snack puffs stuck to his shirt and ate them. You're right, she said, leaning into Charlie's side. He wrapped his arm around her as they walked down to the next stall, where they bought produce. Charlie did the order while Evelyn kept George entertained with wooden toys from another stall. When they finished their list, Charlie put everything in the back of the car while Evelyn put George in the car seat, and they took off back to the store. Charlie dropped Evelyn and George off at the door of books and bread first, then parked in the back. Already the place was packed full of customers. Tourists and locals alike stood in line, waiting for Renee's delectable pastries. Mama! George said, pointing at Renee beaming behind the counter, 
waving as they came in. Yep, that's your mama, Evelyn said, bouncing him up and down as he tried to wiggle his way out of her arms. Hold on, George. We have to wait until mama's ready to see you. Renee's focus turned to the customer in the front of the line as Evelyn scanned the room to see who George might be interested in. That's when she saw Samantha sitting in the corner by herself with a cup of coffee. Hey, look, it's Auntie Sammy, Evelyn said as she walked up to Samantha at her table. Samantha, Auntie Samantha, she said, her tone like a schoolteacher correcting a student. Did you get something to eat? Evelyn asked, changing the subject. No, I just want coffee. Samantha looked out the window. Evelyn noticed her phone sat on the table. How'd you sleep? Horribly, Samantha said. George continued to wiggle, and Evelyn pulled the other chair at Samantha's table out to sit. Do you want a special treat? George pointed to the counter. Mama, hats. Yes, you can't go back there with Mommy, but I can get you something if you want to be a big boy and sit with your Auntie Samantha. George immediately shook his head, not liking the idea. Hats! You're right. I can't go behind the counter, but I can wait in line. Do you want to wait in line with Nana, or do you want to stay with Auntie Samantha? Evelyn looked down at the little boy, who didn't seem to ever be apprehensive to strangers, until Samantha's arrival. Hats! He pointed at Evelyn, squeezing his arms suddenly around her neck. Okay, George, let's get a treat, Evelyn said, trying not to notice Samantha's scowl. But it was too late. Samantha shifted in her chair and said, See, I told you he doesn't like me. He's a baby, Samantha, Evelyn said. She almost said something about the car, but Charlie walked into the store from the kitchen. She wouldn't say something now. She'd wait until a good time. So whatever was up with Samantha wouldn't come out at Charlie. I didn't know you were coming to the store this morning, Evelyn said, changing the subject. Samantha shrugged, pressing the button to open the home screen on her phone. I walked here. Evelyn wanted to ask about the bruise and now swollen red eyes. What was going on with her daughter that she had to keep such a traumatic experience from her? What if she wasn't sleeping because she had PTSD? Evelyn had written a character who suffered from it, and through her research, she couldn't believe what people went through on a regular basis without help. Maybe she couldn't afford to get help. She wasn't even sure if Samantha had insurance with this independent gig. She doubted it. But didn't she get free health insurance in England? Samantha could hardly remember to pay her car insurance a few years ago. God, she hoped she had insurance through the government. What? Samantha said, a tone in her voice that would have sent old Evelyn in a fit. What, what? Evelyn asked. You're staring at me, Samantha said. I was thinking how beautiful you look, even with a black eye. Evelyn said honestly. Her daughter was a gorgeous young lady. Both her daughters had turned out stunning. George would often tease about fighting off suitors, but the girls never really paid too much attention to men until later in high school, but mostly for proms and double dates. Thanks. Evelyn gritted her jaw. So, hum. Her yoga app had told her to say that when stressed. So. Take a deep breath in through your nostrils. Hum. Exhale through your mouth. Repeat until calm. Where did you fall again? Evelyn said it before she could stop herself. And just like that, Charlie decided to come to the table. The flicker of recognition in Samantha's eyes told Evelyn her daughter knew he'd told her. Coming from the back, Charlie, unsuspecting that she had blown his secret, came jaunting over to the table. Samantha! Charlie greeted her with a big bear hug. I'm so glad you're here. Evelyn hoped, no, she prayed. Samantha wouldn't push this. It didn't have to be a big deal. Oh, why had she said anything? 
Samantha sighed. Do you want to ask me a question, Mom? Charlie's face dropped in realization of what had transpired. I told your mother about the car accident this morning. There it was, the truth. Evelyn marveled at how easily it had come out of Charlie. He didn't even hesitate to tell the truth, but she was walking on eggshells with her own daughter, and it made her so mad because she was to blame. At some point in her child-rearing, she had not given her children the comfort they needed to be open and honest with her. Please don't be mad at Charlie. He was only concerned, Evelyn said. I'm not mad. I just didn't want you to worry, Samantha said. And it wasn't the reason I came here, if that's what you're worried about. I'm not worried, she said. But Charlie gave her his look. She wasn't being honest. I am worried. I can't help it. You come back out of the blue, bruised and battered. I wasn't sure if a man hurt you. Samantha shook her head. God, no. I'm hiding out because I got hit by a car in the middle of London. My story is all over social media. All the headlines make fun of me. Travel vlogger nickered by a cab. I can only imagine what else they'll come up with. You were hit by a taxi? No, it's just how they spun the story. Samantha picked at the edge of the table. Everyone has a comment to make. Then put your phone away, Evelyn said. It really could be that simple. She didn't need to worry about what people in London thought about her. She had a whole world to travel. Stop checking it every five minutes. My career is falling apart every second I sit here. Samantha's eyes filled with moisture, and Evelyn regretted being so hard. Right now? My publicist won't call me back. The man I love thinks I'm stalking him. His wife thinks I'm the other woman, when I never knew they were together. My viewership has plummeted. None of the houses I was supposed to visit in New Zealand are currently calling me back. And I honestly didn't want you to worry. Dad's heart attack and his accident and all that. I didn't want you to have to go through all that again. Evelyn couldn't believe it. She couldn't believe she had thought Samantha was being selfish and secretive. But really, she just cared about Evelyn and her feelings. I'm so sorry you had to go through all that alone. Evelyn said, honestly. She tipped her head at her daughter. I just want to help if I can. Samantha reached for her napkin, dabbing her eyes, not saying anything. Charlie got up from his seat. Would you ladies like something to eat? Coffee? They both nodded, and Evelyn reached for a napkin, feeling her own emotions. I'm so glad you came. Samantha gave a half-smile. Me too. Chapter 8 Samantha sat on the deck of the wharf with a drink in her hand. She stared out at the harbor. Martha's vineyard had a one-of-a-kind beauty one would only find in New England. It was as if she stepped back in time, with mom-and-pop shops lining the main strip, lobster boats floating in the water with names like My Lady Maria. The island's rustic buildings and its clapboard shingles added to the appeal. Samantha shot a few pics, but no selfies, besides her feet. She looked at her phone, checking the time. The good news was there was no news. No more comments on Penelope's comments. But the bad news was there was no more communication at all. No one texted her or called or posted anything or tagged her. Nothing. It was as if she had died that day after the accident. She was in some sort of purgatory. It just happened to be on one of the most gorgeous islands in the country. Renee had promised to meet her there after she closed the store, but after 45 minutes past her closing time, Samantha was still waiting. She thought about the day. If Evelyn hadn't said something at the store, Samantha probably would have confessed at dinner. The day she cried to Wanda... She had convinced Samantha to come clean. So she ran through her dress rehearsal speech with Renee. Renee had been easy. 
She was so high in the clouds with Cupid and Mateo that she didn't even seem to notice Samantha's lack of details as to why her face looked like the color of the Atlantic Ocean. You got hit by a car, she had asked in between customers. Why didn't you call us? Looking back, it had been so many things. Her mom had gone through enough emergencies. Losing their father so suddenly, Samantha hadn't wanted to scare her mother like that. Since she had luckily walked away from the accident, she hadn't wanted her mother to worry unnecessarily. Besides, what would a call have done? You must have been so scared, Renee said, giving her a big sister look, like when Samantha had told Renee about Joey Picardi pulling her bra strap in fifth period. She'd wanted to hurt whoever had hurt her baby sister. Did it just hit you? Did you talk to the police? The whole thing had happened in such a blur. Yes, there'd been authorities, but mostly she remembered the EMTs, and of course, Hamish's face staring at her. He would looked so scared and worried for her. She hadn't meant to call his name. She hadn't even remembered doing it until she tried falling asleep the first night she'd arrived. The space between almost falling asleep and her brain just about to shut off, and boom. It was a memory so vicious and horrible that she'd been jolted awake. Hamish, she had said, her voice cracking as she cried, as they lifted her onto a stretcher. Come. Penelope's face had gone from concerned citizen to furious wife in two seconds flat. She remembered hearing Penelope say to Hamish, You know her? I do. Hamish's face had gone in and out, and the words she'd been trying to say just wouldn't leave her mouth. Of course he knew her. He had been in love with her for over a year. They'd spent every weekend at the castle and every weeknight in London. She stopped going anywhere but the castle for gigs. He knew what kind of dessert she liked at midnight and what she wanted to buy her mother for Christmas. But then he had gone, and she'd been in an ambulance, and people had rushed around her, asking her questions, but answering none of hers. Hey, Samantha, Mateo said from behind. She turned to see her sister's fiancé walking up to her table. She looked behind him to see if Renee had come along, but didn't see her. Not that she minded hanging out with Mateo, but was Renee just blowing her off at this point? Did she send you to babysit me? Samantha asked, feeling like an even bigger loser. Now her own family didn't have time to hang out. Oh, you know, Renee, Mateo said, waving at the server. She'll come at some point. She's just got to close everything up, and she has George. The waitress walked up to him. Hey, Mateo, what can I get you tonight? I'll take whatever's on draft, he said, pulling out his credit card and handing it to her. I'll take care of the table. The gesture was thoughtful, but... That's not necessary. We're just glad you're here, he said. As the waitress came back to the table, she started talking about the bakery and how great it looked, and what a wonderful job he had done renovating it. You all really brought that place to life. It's Renee, he said, and just like a gentleman, he added, she really is amazing at what she does. Something inside Samantha wanted to gag at the cheesy exchange because she was sure the waitress was hitting on her sister's fiancé. But instead, she couldn't help but feel jealous. Mateo loved her sister so openly. Had Penelope known who she was all this time? Or had Hamish kept Samantha from her, too? I'm Samantha, she said, extending her hand out to the waitress. I'm Renee's sister. She was certain the haughty waitress got her drift, when one eyebrow perked up. Nice to meet you. You bake as well? Samantha didn't know what she did at this point. No, I don't even cook. The waitress nodded. Nice meeting you. See you, Mateo. See you around, Kelly, he said, and took a sip of his beer. Do you know everyone? Samantha asked. Mateo shrugged. It's a pretty small island. Touché. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw a man. 
Oh my God, look at that table over there. Mateo turned to see who she was talking about. Across the deck sat Chase Mitchell. Just as she was about to tell Mateo who her teenage crush had been, Mateo waved at him. Did you just wave at him? She looked over, immediately wishing she hadn't said anything, but to her surprise, Chase waved back. Then he picked up his drink and a book and began walking toward their table. Do you know him? She asked Mateo, who smiled. I'm renovating his farmhouse. Mateo stood up as Chase reached out his hand, and they shook and bro-hugged. She sat starstruck and dumbfounded as Chase Mitchell was standing next to her and talking to her sister's fiancé. Meet Renee's sister, Samantha, Mateo said, holding out his arm to her. Chase reached out his hand, and at first she wasn't sure if she should take his, but like a doofus, she wiped her sweaty palm on her shorts and shook his. Sorry, it's just so hot outside. She pulled back, dying of embarrassment. I loved you in Miami High. He snorted. Thanks. Even though every signal coming from him, his body cues radiating that he didn't want to speak about his major television years, she couldn't help but want him to know she wasn't a weirdo. She wasn't a stalker or some nut job. I mean, I was like five, so... His forehead wrinkled as he looked at her. Great, thanks. He looked at Mateo and said, Good seeing you, Mateo. Mateo, who didn't seem to notice that she was making a total dork out of herself, shook Chase's hand and said his goodbyes. I'm so sorry, she said as he left. Mateo made a face. For what? For being an idiot. Had he not seen that? Or was he just that nice? She was sure it was the latter, as Chase Mitchell looked back at her. Did he just smile? Or was he laughing at her? Mateo smiled, not noticing her awkwardness or the fact she hadn't shut her mouth. She'd met Chase Mitchell, the biggest teenage heartthrob of her time, whose poster still hung up in her bedroom back home in Minnesota. Or was this home now? London was no longer her home, that was for sure. She hadn't been back to Minnesota in so long. Not in at least two years. Had it been longer than that? Where was home for her? God, she thought, as she looked over at the attractive man who lounged at the wharf on a Wednesday night. Is he alone? She asked Mateo. Mateo looked over to his table and shrugged. Looks like it. There was no doubt. He was reading a book with only one table setting. Should we invite him over to join us? Mateo asked, about to pop out of his seat. Samantha made a face, then looked back at Chase. I don't know. Do you think he wants to be by himself? I think I might have scared him. Come on. He's a really nice guy, he said, jumping off his high stool. Mateo didn't even wait for her to answer, but walked over to him. She watched as a conversation started. Did you see Chase Mitchell? Hissed Renee, leaning over her shoulder trying to catch a glimpse. Samantha jumped, almost falling out of her seat. Where did you come from? Samantha hadn't even seen Renee walk into the hotel. I came through the back. George was in a baby carrier on Renee's chest again. His limbs hung limply as she stretched for a better look. I sell some of my pastries and bread for their service here. Samantha noticed her nephew's tiny head bob up and down with every movement. Is he sleeping? He loves sleeping in this thing. Renee took Mateo's chair, but only half sat, half leaned on it. She waved to Kelly, the waitress. I'll take a glass of red. Look at that, Samantha said, as Mateo and Chase started walking over to the table. Have you met him yet? Samantha asked Renee. No. But Mateo and his brothers say he's wicked cool, Renee said. Samantha let out a laugh. Did you just say wicked? Yes. Renee shot her a look as the men came closer. Now shut up before I tell him about the poster still hanging in your room. You wouldn't, 
Samantha's mouth dropped. But sometimes you must fight fire with fire. She leaned back in her stool as the men approached the table. Mateo, have I ever told you the story of when Renee got locked out of our parents' cabin? Hi, Chase, Renee said, holding out her hand. It's so nice to finally meet you. Nice to meet you, too, Chase said. He held his book under his arm and his beer in his hand. Samantha ignored him as he sat in the chair next to her. Her heart started beating fast as he sat there, and she wondered if he could feel her vibes going crazy. She wished more than anything to pull out her phone and snap a selfie. So I heard you bought a farmhouse on the island, Samantha said. He nodded. Yep. Mateo's really doing a great job gutting the place and rebuilding it. I heard it's a timber-framed house, Samantha added. Mateo had explained the renovation last night at dinner. In college, she had taken classes for architecture, but for some reason she didn't think she could do it. That she wasn't smart enough. Her high school math teachers had complained about how chatty she was and how she hadn't taken math seriously enough. But she loved math. She loved calculus and trigonometry and statistics. But her teachers never took her seriously and advised against architecture. So she took graphic design, kept talking in class, breezing through, and hadn't thought about math again until she read about Leonardo da Vinci in her art history class in London, where she'd mostly gone to drink at pubs and meet a British lord. But she also fell in love with architecture. That's why she did the traveling. That's why she had started her vlog. She loved the buildings, the structure, the reasons certain houses were built certain ways. Everything about the landscape, the space, fascinated her. It's fantastic you're keeping the original structure. Samantha could feel her chattiness rising. Now, as an adult, she understood the chattiness came from nerves and anxiety. Maybe you'll find a shoe in the walls. Chase stared at her. Oh, God. Now her nerd was coming out. She immediately thought of Hamish. He'd get it. Chase's eyebrows rose. Shoe? Back in the day, people would ward off evil witches and spirits by putting an old shoe, the older the better, inside the walls. Samantha couldn't stop at this point, even though his eyes were almost certainly going to glaze over, like every other guy, besides Hamish. One shoe? Chase asked. He took a sip of beer, looking up as if thinking this over in his head. Yes, usually in adults. Samantha took a sip of her own margarita. They wanted a smelly shoe to make the spirit stay away. Huh. Chase looked at George hanging over the baby carrier. He's a good sleeper. Yes, well, he worked all day, and it poops him out. Renee bounced him up and down as she sat there. Kelly came with the drinks, and Renee swooped up the glass of red. Thank you so much. Just when she'd said it, George stretched out his chunky baby legs and let one rip through his diaper. Renee's eyes widened as a smell permeated out from the sleeping baby. Oh, no. Renee looked down, and a green wetness spread from the middle of her shirt and down her pants. He just had a complete blowout and didn't even wake up. Chase looked impressed. Both Mateo and Renee went into hyper-parent mode, calling for napkins and making sure to not startle the pooping, sleeping baby. Samantha plugged her nostrils as she watched George continue to sleep through the chaos his little body was causing. You need to take him out of here with that green sludge before they lose their license, Samantha said. I just want one more sip. Renee gulped the glass in one fell swoop. Okay, I'm ready to go. Samantha didn't want her to go. Wait, I thought we were going to have dinner. Renee pointed at her green-stained shirt. Really? I have to take a shower. Samantha looked at George, whose head slowly rose. He looked up and saw Samantha. Hey, little guy. You feeling better now? 
Samantha said in her sweetest, most motherly voice ever. George's face crumbled into sobs. Screams, actually. Screams of terror. And Mateo threw down his credit card and said, Stay for dinner, you guys. On us. And they dashed out of the wharf before Samantha knew what was happening. Samantha froze. She was sitting with Chase Mitchell by herself in a restaurant. She looked at her phone. She wanted to open it, start taking selfies, beg to see his place and film it. I've never seen a baby so scared of a person before, he said. Scratch that. Now she didn't. He must have been disoriented from waking up. He was like, ah! Chase held his hands dramatically. His acting clearly hadn't gotten any better through the years. He laughed at his own joke. That's cute, she said, taking another sip. I should probably go then. She opened a purse and pulled out her wallet before throwing down two twenties, as though that wasn't the last of her cash. Chase picked up Mateo's card. I can't have your brother-in-law pay for my dinner if you don't eat too. Samantha looked around the restaurant. She really didn't have anywhere to go. Sure, she could go back to Seaview, hang with everyone there. Each night, there were always extra visitors at dinner. People from Writers Club, the library trustees group, plumbers, electricians, other families on the island. They had game nights, they had movie nights, they had fire pits and treasure hunts. There was rarely a night without an event. No one would miss her. Plus, she'd get a good free meal without the guilt. Chase Mitchell told her to. What's good here? She asked, putting her purse on her chair's back and picking up the menu. Definitely they're oysters, but they have this seafood lasagna in a white sauce. He picked up a menu as well. They also have a delicious beef wellington. How long have you lived on the island? Samantha asked, curious about his story. He shrugged. Just this past year. I've been renting a place near your mother's. She wondered if he had met Evelyn. What made you move here? It was her go-to question in interviews. She'd asked the couple their reasonings. There was always a good story her guests enjoyed telling. My daughter attends Harvard, he said. I wanted to be close. Suddenly, all the pop culture magazines she had bought at the grocery store flashed in her mind. Party boy Chase Mitchell had gotten his co-star Grace Garcia pregnant. She didn't know what happened to him after that. Samantha had started high school, forgot about her childhood crush, and found real boys to crush on. That's amazing. Well done to her, she said. Her dad would have killed for her to get into Harvard. My dad attended medical school there. He jerked his head back. Wow. I hope Dahlia goes to medical school. Does she want to be a doctor? Samantha asked. He shook his head. No, she wants to do something like teach or join the Peace Corps or, God forbid, go into politics. That's amazing. Yep. He took a sip of beer as though this did not impress him. She's pretty driven to save the world, but to be broke while doing it. She looked at the man who, on paper, appeared amazing. Hollywood superstar, daughter at Harvard, a farm on Martha's Vineyard that was most likely gorgeous. But something felt very normal, too. I think that's admirable, Samantha said. I don't care what she does for a career, he said, setting down the menu. I just know how hard it will be with little reward. She's helping people who are less advantaged, Samantha said. That's admirable. Well, maybe as a doctor she could help and earn money doing it, he said. She thought about how she was probably closer in age to his daughter than she was to him. How old had he been when he and Grace had a baby? It had made every news outlet in America. She remembered that. It had even reached the morning news shows. She had to assume it probably made world news at some point. Two wholesome child stars who had pretended to be much younger than their actual age. The show was canceled after that. She couldn't remember if he had been in anything afterward but she remembered seeing Grace Garcia in a lot of things. Then he asked the inevitable question. 
What do you do for work? She exhaled. I have a documentary travel vlog about architecture. He sat back in his chair. Really? She nodded. Well, I did. You did? He asked, shifting in his seat and leaning closer to her. No, I'm taking a well-deserved vacation. She spun her phone on the table. A well-deserved, forced vacation. She looked at the book he had been reading while sitting by himself. You read Thoreau for fun? Samantha hadn't read any of it, preferring modern authors like Kristen Hanna or Jojo Moyes. Dahlia sends me her reading material when she finishes and makes me read it. Chase shrugged. Next is Josephine Brown. Samantha wasn't into the classical literature philosophy of Thoreau, but knew enough people who loved his work, like her father, for instance. I've never read anything from either. I went to school for graphic design. Graphic designers didn't sit around discussing the philosophy of small government and transcendentalism. They were both abolitionists, he said, patting the book with his hand. Both wrote and lectured against slavery. Josephine's father had been a runaway slave from Kentucky. Dahlia loved this class where she'd study these books and then travel all over to where these writers lived in Massachusetts. They're all connected to Harvard somehow. A flicker of pride lifted his shoulders. No one in my family has ever gone to college, so I'm living vicariously through her. Even after you left the show? she asked. He had been still young at that point. I was too embarrassed, he shrugged. Why? She didn't understand why a guy like him would be embarrassed about going to college. I loved watching Miami High. You and every other little kid in America. She could hear a slight resentment in his tone. I never even went to school, or at least not a real school, he said. Samantha had no idea what it must have been like to live through what Chase Mitchell had lived through. It was probably every kid's dream getting acting jobs for one of the biggest studios in Hollywood. Instant stardom and fame. She wondered how much he had made as a child. Couldn't he afford to help his daughter save the world? You didn't really miss much, she said. It smells most of the time, especially in high school. Then there's the food. My school resembled a prison from afar. We weren't allowed to go outside, like ever. Did you go to football games? He asked, holding his beer. She smiled, thinking about being on the cheerleading squad. I went to them all, he nodded. I always wanted to go to one. I'll bet they have them here, she said. There had to be a high school team on the island. He shrugged. Harvard seems to have a good team this year. She had forgotten Ivy Leagues had games like that. She spun her phone and realized she hadn't seen his phone once. Do you visit your daughter a lot? She lets me come whenever I can. But she only comes home for holidays, he said. She loves school. Total nerd. Samantha could tell he thought his daughter was amazing. And it made Chase Mitchell even hotter in real life than his bad boy character. So you bought a farm, Samantha said. Are you going to actually farm? He sat back in his stool, pushed his empty beer across the table, and sighed. My hope is to have some chickens, maybe. He shook his hand like a tambourine. We'll see. She gulped a drink from her margarita. What year? Excuse me? He burrowed his brows, which made his blue eyes more mysterious. What year was the house built? Like an itch needing to be scratched, she had to know the details. Late 17, he said, but waited for another. Oh, she could hear the questions rolling around through her head. Roofline? He smiled. Cape. Her eyes widened at the possibilities. Attached barn? Multiple extensions. She tapped her thumb against the table. She wanted to see this house. What's the chimney situation? Chase's lips curled up on the right. In the oldest part, there's still the original center fireplace. She opened her mouth to say something, 
but forgot what she was going to say as Chase stared back at her, his eyes smoldering with heat. Was it hot in there? Want to get an Uber? He asked. Her heart suddenly plummeted to her stomach. What? We could go pack up the food, and I can show you my farm. He jammed his thumb behind him. Did you drive? Was this a pickup line? Was Chase Mitchell asking her back to his house to do more than look at a house? This is the kind of stuff she'd seen only on television. He nodded his head at his drink. I don't drink and drive. It'll be on every headline in the morning. She couldn't believe this was happening. Chase Mitchell was really inviting her back to his place? All right, she said, and drank the last of her margarita. I'd love to see your place. They hung out talking until their food was ready. Mr. Miami High turned out to be even better than his character. Everything about Chase Mitchell oozed graciousness and grandeur. The way he talked about his daughter, the ease of the conversation, even a few quips about the locals. She couldn't wait to see where this adventure would lead her. But she also second-guessed herself the whole time waiting for the Uber. Here she was, about to go alone to a secluded farmhouse on a very quiet island. Most people here wore hearing aids, so they wouldn't hear her screams. Sure, she was with a Hollywood kid star, but maybe he had a secret sex room that she was going to be handcuffed in. Ted Bundy was charming. But then she saw the picture of his daughter, who looked to be around five or so, in his wallet as he pulled out his credit card. I thought it was on Mateo, she said, as he pushed Mateo's card back to her. I'm not having my contractor pay for my meal, Chase said. Kelly swung through with a full tray in her hands and swiped the card. Put the usual. Sure thing, handsome, Kelly said back to him. Samanda wondered what the usual meant in Chase Mitchell's world. You know, I could put you in my vlog, she said. Maybe the exposure would be good for his career. That's not happening, he said a little too smugly. He leaned back in his chair, folding his arms against his chest, looking down his nose at her. Is that why you wanted me to sit with you? Did you want me to be on your show? Samantha suddenly felt her cheeks flush. He no longer looked like the bad boy high schooler in Miami High, but a man whose ego was bigger than his nowhere career. No. She couldn't believe how condescending he sounded. Sorry. I have a lot of viewers who'd love to see work like what Mateo's doing. Samantha hoped this got him to stop looking at her suspiciously. His eyes held hers with distrust. They just love seeing his work, but I won't film. I would hope not. He spoke as though he were a teacher disciplining a student. Then, in the most patronizing tone, he said, I don't really understand the whole reality television thing. The idea that just anyone can put a video up, and that's what people watch. A grin formed at the zinger, but his face's creases deepened with smugness. That's when she saw the Chase Mitchell smile she had stared at each night when she had gone to bed as a teenager. He was a good actor. What do you do now for work? She didn't need to state the obvious as she watched his face twist at the comment. Maybe my reality show could help refresh your career. He let out a chuckle. The Uber can take you home. He grabbed Thoreau, raising his hand in the air. Kelly, I'll take a coffee. Was Chase Mitchell sending her home? Well, wow. She couldn't believe the nerve of this guy. Samantha stared at the man who still had a bit of the boy in his face. He must have been a pretty decent actor to be America's sweetheart. Samantha threw her last $40 onto the table and stormed out of the restaurant. Chapter 9 
Chase Mitchell wasn't his real name. But he rarely told people that, besides those who needed to know. His attorney, Harvard University's tuition office, and the state of Massachusetts. Other than that, Chase didn't tell people his real last name was Monicelli. Mitchell was his middle name, after his maternal grandfather, who he cherished dearly. In fact, his full name was Charles Mitchell Monicelli. His story wasn't much different than his own daughter's. His parents were both starving artists. His mother had gotten pregnant and his dad had taken off. She had sacrificed everything, including her own career, to raise him. But he'd wanted to act, even against her better wishes. He said he loved it, but deep down, it was a way to prove his worth to his father. His poor mother had taken him to audition after audition. He'd first gotten commercials, then a spot on a soap opera. He had landed a sitcom as a child of the main character. Then, at 16, he'd gotten his first lead male spot in a new television drama for teens called Miami High. It ran for four seasons. An instant success, his agent booked him on everything. Magazines, interviews, late-night guest spots. He'd even hosted Saturday Night Live. Then the movies. His publicist loved his and Grace's relationship the secret love between the lead actress and actor, America's favorite sweethearts. Just as his career had taken off, she got pregnant. As the big movie studios started calling him, wanting him to work for them, and writing scripts with roles for him, he told his agent and publicist about the baby. His agent had cried about what the baby might do for publicity. He and Grace had tried to make their relationship work, but with being hunted down by cameras and having lies tossed in headlines, on major syndications, no less, there'd been nothing he could do. They'd had no chance. Plus, Grace had the career. She'd taken job after job, staying for months at film locations. He had stayed back with no prospects and a baby. Then Dahlia had turned one, and that was when the affair hit the papers. The morning of Dahlia's first birthday, he'd woken up and felt that something was off right away. He could hear this weird clicking noise. He turned in bed, pulling down the blinds, and standing in front of his house were paparazzi, with their heavy black equipment, cameras strapped on their bodies, smoking and talking outside his house. Grace had already gotten up and was in the kitchen with Dahlia, tears streaming down her face. I could tell you it was a mistake. Grace was now sobbing. Her beautiful face had already been done up in makeup, just like the artist did at the studio, if not better. She had gotten herself ready for the cameras. He wished back then he'd had a phone, something to check the gossip columns, because he knew the blow she was about to deliver would be life-changing with the way she cried. Grace didn't feel guilty about much. His body had tensed as if bracing for impact, like someone would do before their car was about to hit something. She had confessed everything right there in their kitchen, feeding Dahlia as she cried. I love him. His first thought was he wished his mother was there. She would help. She would know what to do. The second, he wished he had never fallen in love with Grace because even as she told him about how she tried to stay faithful, but how the pressures of Hollywood, becoming a young mother and feeling trapped, had gotten to her, he still loved her. He'd stayed in Hollywood, but he never worked in film again. Instead, he'd taken Dahlia to parks and mommy groups and traveled. He lived off his royalties, started investing, and tried to be the best co-parent he could. Grace's career had continued to take off, and Oprah had even invited him to join her Super Soul Sunday talk about being young divorced parents but making it together. Seriously, if it wasn't the love and support I got from Chase, I wouldn't be where I am today, Grace had said, and kissed him on the cheek. When Dahlia had decided on Harvard, he'd sold his house, but with serious consideration. He had held out hope that Grace would come back around. 
There had been times she would stay for a week or two, giving him hope she still did love him. But she encouraged him to go. You deserve to be happy, she'd said. He hoped she'd beg him to stay, tell him she needed him. But she'd just kissed him goodbye. He'd found the perfect farmhouse on Martha's Vineyard, where the paparazzi wouldn't be able to photograph them. The farm offered acres of privacy he hadn't had in Hollywood. Maybe he had overreacted with Mateo's sister-in-law last night, he thought, as he took a run along the beach that morning, passing her mom's place. Most people don't understand the magnitude of what someone would do to get a good shot. There was nothing off limits for some of the people trying to earn money on one's reaction. Moving to Martha's Vineyard, away from the life of Hollywood, the fakeness was gone. His privacy back. He could sit by himself at a restaurant, and no one gave two hoots. So when she talked about filming, the bristles on his neck rose. He opened his phone and typed her name in the search bar. He'd check out this architectural vlog. She had sounded a bit pompous, talking about a blog with videos. He knew she had a mother who did very well for herself. He had tried out for a role in her series on Netflix. That's when the article popped up. Travel vlogger run over by car. He scrolled down, letting the screen flow up, past other weird headlines. Then he saw the words like stalker, the other woman, and page six. He opened each link and read the stories. All the articles made her look a bit crazy, but he knew how page six could spin a story. He'd had people making death threats toward him because poor Grace Garcia had a mean boyfriend. He almost felt like he should apologize to Samantha, explain how he had years of photographers following him around, invading his privacy, going through his trash, using long lenses to see inside his house. They stopped at nothing, even pretended to be his friend. He of all people understood what she was going through. He thought about Grace back in Los Angeles and how it was the first full year without living close to each other. She had mentioned visiting Martha's Vineyard, but that had been months ago. Dahlia then mentioned that Grace had a new boyfriend. And, well, he knew the routine of what that entailed. He sighed and continued his run when he realized he'd be running by Samantha's mom's house. He should apologize, especially because he liked Mateo. He was a cool guy who lived on the island, was in the same age bracket, liked baseball, and apparently was a football legend. This was when he needed a dog, a companion while he made the walk of shame. From the beach, he started heading up the wooden plank leading to the back of the house named Seaview. He was about to just go up to the house, but he realized there were many wooden paths and many houses that all looked different from the back end than they did from the street. He backed up and turned around, running down the planks to the beach and back home. He'd apologize another time. When he got home and inside his house, he heard a knock come from the front door. Mateo! Chase cringed. He hoped Samantha hadn't said anything about his bad behavior. God, he hoped this hadn't ruined anything. It had been hard to find a contractor who understood what he wanted as much as Mateo gets him. He grabbed a protein shake from his fridge. Come on in. Heard you had a nice time last night, Mateo said, placing a wicker basket on his kitchen counter. What's that? Renee baked these for you, Mateo said pushing the basket toward Chase. The sweet smell of confectioner's sugar flowed from whatever lay underneath the linen cloth. He pulled one of the corners back and peeked at the blueberry muffins. Those smell delicious. Renee picked the berries this morning. Pride washed over Mateo's face as Chase took a muffin and took a bite. Delicious, right? Wow, that is delicious. He took another bite, thinking that maybe Samantha hadn't said anything. Maybe Mateo wasn't being sarcastic. Or maybe, which he hoped wasn't the case, 
Chase made her feel bad and embarrassed. Especially after what he had learned after searching her name. After Mateo and his brothers headed out to the farmhouse, he sat down on the couch and held his phone, opening the app to watch her vlog. When he searched her name, hundreds of videos popped up. From newest to oldest, he could see she had posted a video almost weekly. That was hours of editing, even the shortest videos. He started with the last video, which had been posted over a month ago, he noticed. Also, noting the longest time frame between videos. Videos were shot all over the world. New Zealand, France, Ibiza. But she visited one over and over again, a castle in Scotland. He could see why she wanted to video it. It was filmed more like This Old House versus the reality show Fixer Upper. She spent time explaining what made the house unique with its different architectural designs. For instance, showcasing the dungeon in the stone cellar underneath the castle, as well as showing off the beautiful Rembrandt. When he finished the first, he went straight to the second. Then he stopped watching on his phone and used the television. First thing he noticed was that she was a natural on camera. She moved and talked comfortably with the people and the camera itself, like a friend bringing you along on an adventure. She traveled everywhere, houses on cliffs, apartments in Paris, cottages along the coast, and villas in Saint-Tropez. The second thing he noticed was that she sounded extremely knowledgeable about every house she visited. She didn't just know stuff. She knew it all. With a little more digging, he learned she hadn't just attended any old school. She had attended Rhode Island School of Design, the top design school in the country. She'd also studied abroad in London. She lived there part-time while she traveled and created her vlogs, which were a hit in the UK. Then, after a dozen or so videos, he started noticing the same man appearing in them. For one season, she stayed at the castle in the Highlands, going through their renovations. It looked like a go-big-or-go-broke story. Samantha had stayed at the castle with the owner, an attractive middle-aged woman and her 30-year-old son, who lived in London most of the time. They were renovating it into a wedding venue. At first, he thought it would be an underdog story, but then it evolved into a story of saving an old town. Everyone in town was included. Samantha filmed the staff at the house, the gilly, the maids, the cook, and the farm manager. She interviewed residents, people who used the land for recreation. The son Hamish had been friends with them all. Samantha showed everyone, including the village coming together to make this castle work and bring in the tourists they all needed to make the town survive. Then a new video showed with Samantha in the thumbnail picture. When he started to play the video, he could tell by her eyes and her voice that she had been crying. Today is a devastating day for McPherson Castle. Her chest shuddered a breath. My dearest friend, Emily McPherson, passed away this morning. Looks like we all have a new angel looking over us. The shot went to a video of Emily standing by the huge lock behind the castle, painting a landscape. I want to experience everything, Emily said as she painted. Feel the wind through me hair, the rush of cold water on my skin. I want to hear the songs of birds as my alarm clock, and the hoots of owls at night as my lullaby. He was determined to apologize. But by the following Tuesday, after the encounter with Samantha at the wharf, he was resolved to the fact that he might never see her again. No harm, no foul. Mateo still worked on the house. Things seemed to be running smoothly. He decided there was no need to apologize. But he noticed no new videos, no new updates of her location, no new anything. When he walked into Books and Bread later that morning to grab breakfast, he should have apologized right when he saw her, just walked up to her table and said something. But when she rolled her eyes like Dahlia did when he was apparently acting like an idiot, he decided to keep walking to the counter and take it to go. As he stood in line, he could tell she was ignoring him, 
even felt her distaste for him, like a sourness from a distance. Usually his charming personality did the trick. He knew his good looks would work if his charisma didn't, but Samantha wanted nothing to do with him. Which meant he had either been a jerk, or he'd put salt into a wound that was already deep. What they'd written about her was terrible. Were the muffins no good? Renee asked as he reached the counter. They were too good. I'll take something that goes well with a caramel mochaccino. A sweet tooth, Renee smiled. I'd suggest a sticky bun. I'll give you extra wet wipes for your fingers. She winked and went to work, calling out his caramel mochaccino and grabbing his pastry. For here to go. He looked behind him at Samantha. I'll stay. With his drink and sticky bun, he walked over to Samantha's table and took the seat at the table right next to hers. I heard those Hollywood types' egos are so sensitive, he said. Self-deprecation had helped him out in many situations. She gave a half smile. Well, I heard when you mock someone's career when your own career is in the garbage, it doesn't help matters. I'm sorry if I was a jerk. If. She looked out the window, rolling her eyes again. He grinded his teeth. He reminded himself that he had been a jerk. I'm sorry. He turned away, picking up a fork and knife, and tried to figure out the best way to attack the sticky bun as its caramel glistened in the morning sun glare from outside. You pick it up and eat it. Samantha said, her attention suddenly on him. He held up his hands. I have a thing about getting my finger sticky. That's a shame, because you really can't experience it without just digging in. Samantha had an empty plate sitting on her table, with a clean fork and knife next to it. Once the fork and knife pop those air bubbles, you lose out on the true taste. Just when he thought about carrying on a conversation, she added, Plus, I doubt anyone's itching to take your photograph while you're licking your fingers. Maybe only when you get hit by a car. He had meant to sound funny, but hearing the words come out of his mouth, he immediately regretted them. He dropped his fork and knife and turned around to face her, his hands in surrender. Her mouth dropped wide open. I am so sorry. You looked me up. Her eyes darted around. Did you Google me? Well, you told me about your high audience vlog, he said, defending himself. I was curious. I can't believe you looked me up. Samantha did not look happy. That's weird. Is it? He assumed she'd probably done the same thing and had looked him up. Who didn't look people up these days? Her crossed leg bobbed up and down as she looked him over. You would enjoy the car incident. I didn't enjoy the car incident. He couldn't believe she'd gone there. He felt bad for her. It's the exact reason I freaked out on you that night. She sat back in her chair, her eyes narrowing at him as if she didn't believe a word that came out of his mouth. People write to get clicks and likes and follows. They'll take a serious situation like getting hit by a car and make it into something totally different. He looked back at the sticky bun and decided to listen to her, to show he could be cool and not always a jerk. Her face softened a bit, and he noticed a moisture in her eyes. But her jaw tightened again. I wasn't stalking him. I just happened to be shopping. It's a very famous street to shop. And I didn't even get hit by a taxi. I don't even know where that came from. He nodded. That must have been an awful experience. She looked up, her eyes showing a vulnerability. And suddenly, all he wanted to do was reach out and touch her soft face and tell her it would be all right. She quickly looked away, playing with her fork. It's still awful. She exhaled out a long, hard breath. When I was in Hollywood, they'd write terrible things about me and my marriage, Chase said. 
So much was written about him. Stuff that was completely untrue. His bad boy persona had ended up biting him in the butt, as his mother would have said. She had been right all along. Reputation was everything to people. No one had believed Grace, America's sweetheart, would have cheated on her husband of less than a year. No one had believed she'd fallen into the arms of another man when her husband was home alone taking care of their baby. Samantha shifted in her seat and looked at something behind him. Look, I'm supposed to be nice and not bother you. He turned around to see what she was looking at and saw Renee coming to the table. You're not bothering me, he said. Was he bothering her? My sister is afraid that I'll blow Mateo's gig with you. Samantha put on a big smile suddenly. Hey, sis. Hey, how's the sticky bun? Renee asked. He looked down at the uneaten bun. I was told I should eat it with my hands. You eat it any way you like, Renee said, smiling at the both of them. But he noticed her give a look to Samantha, and Samantha reciprocating with another eye roll. Hands it is. He picked it up and saw her go for her phone with a smirk on her face. Are you seriously going to take my picture? She laughed and shook her head. You're way too easy. Renee shot another look to Samantha, and he decided to bite into the sticky bun. Heaven exploded in his mouth. A sweet and sugary goodness blended with an airy, doughy pastry. It was quite literally one of the best things he had ever tasted. That's delicious, he mumbled. You should see your face, Samantha said, pointing at his mouth. You're a mess. He grabbed a napkin, wiping off the bits of pastry. No one would recognize the Miami star now, Samantha said. She still has your poster on her wall, Renee blurted out, pointing at her sister. Chase's smile grew as Samantha's mouth dropped at the comment. Samantha shot a look at her sister, a look that could kill. Oh, really? He smirked. His eyes sparkled a bit more than before. Renee thought your character was annoying, Samantha said, crossing her arms against her chest. Check. Renee's mouth dropped open. What did I know? I was a kid. He looked at the two sisters, women who he'd find extremely attractive, fighting like little girls. And he loved it. He picked up his mug, lifting his eyebrow. Don't even tell me you were Team Maddox. Samantha rolled at the comment, a laugh so bright and cheerful that his stomach did a tiny flip. Beauty was luck. Good humor was a whole other thing. He couldn't help but smile. Worse, she liked the dad. Samantha laughed out loud when Renee's face dropped and she stormed away. Samantha was funny, and he liked that. Chapter 10 Turned out, superstar Chase Mitchell wasn't so bad. He was funny, for one, and could rag on himself like the best of them. He told her stories about being on Saturday Night Live, his time filming Miami High, and everything weird about being a child star. I always wanted to see what it was like going inside a high school cafeteria, he said. Loud, crowded, smelly, she said without hesitating. But I did love it. Dahlia just got into fights with her friends all the time, he said. But I would have loved to play a sport and be on a team. She played field hockey and loved it. I played soccer, Samantha said. I loved it too. She looked at the time. They had been sitting there for two hours. His sticky bun was long gone. Well, I should probably get back, he said. He said he had some things he needed to settle with his financial advisor. Thanks for hanging out, she said. She hadn't laughed that much in a long time. He slanted his head, looking at her from the side. You want to come over? Check out the house? You could even film it if you'd like. She gave him a suspicious look. Are you serious? Sure, come. He shrugged, but she could tell this was big, 
real big. I promise I will not invade your privacy. You don't even need to be shown, she said, her words rattling out as her whole body ignited with excitement. Whatever's best for the shoot, Chase said. She couldn't read him. Was he feeling sorry for the girl who had gotten hit by the bus? Or was he actually interested in being a part of her work? I take my videos very seriously, she explained. The reality show comment had rubbed her the wrong way. It's art to me. He nodded and leaned his elbows against the table. Your videos are good. You're really talented. You act surprised, Samantha said. He shook his head. No, it's just that you have a lot of knowledge about it all. That surprised me, to be honest. So you thought I was stupid, is that it? Young, he said. Irritation ripped through her at the comment. She wanted to point out that he was the one wearing a hoodie and shorts, like all the kids wore these days, but she stopped herself. You realize you're only like nine years older than me. It's not like you're my dad or something. Though you'd be lucky, because he had a full gray head of hair. He bit his lower lip in what she declared as one of the sexiest things she had ever witnessed. Then he got out his wallet from his back pocket and pulled out a business card before handing it over between his index and middle finger. Let's talk to Matteo about things, and we can go over production, Chase said. Samantha looked at him. What? I know a few things. He shrugged, putting his wallet back into his pocket. What were you thinking? She never really thought much. She'd usually just go and discover. Her excitement would be genuine and unrehearsed. But would that not fly with Mr. Do Not Show My Life to the World guy? Let's do a lighting day, she said. She'd film throughout the time and use the footage. I like to use lighting as my lead. Lead? Actress, the lighting. You Roger Deakins? Samantha had no idea who Roger was, but she did know lighting was her specialty. It's one of my stars, for sure. She was completely serious. Her confidence may be a bit bruised by the car incident, but she still knew her worth. But usually I let the story of the house be the spotlight. And she could tell he found that very sexy. And her heart skipped a beat. I like early or late light. You decide, she said. I heard it's got a view. She said it like a question. He nodded and said, It's a few miles up on Cliffside Point. She tilted her head and studied him for a moment. Who was this guy? One minute he was Deepak Chopra, and the next a little George Clooney with a touch of Charlie Sheen. Why don't we meet for dinner at the wharf, he asked. Her face twisted at the thought of her last $40 sitting on the table. He probably left it as a tip for Kelly. How about your place, and I'll bring pastries? That way I can see what we can film right away. He nodded. How long do you usually film projects? She shrugged, holding her knee with her interlocked fingers. She tried to come off as completely comfortable in her own skin, but felt phony in front of Mr. Hollywood. I love a beginning-to-end kind of project. What's been your favorite location, he asked. I love Scotland, she said with a sigh. Her gaze left the room for a quick second, and she suddenly returned with a shake. It's extreme with everything, landscape, weather, people. He must be a complete idiot. Excuse me, she asked, though she had a fair idea who he referred to. He leaned back in his chair, and there was a shift in the air. Only a moment ago he was ready to leave. But Chase Mitchell, she was almost certain, enjoyed her company. And she was enjoying his. She hadn't checked her phone the two hours they had sat and talked. Not once. It had literally been the first time in weeks that it happened, even at night. And laughing. It felt good. He didn't seem to care at all about what the headlines wrote or the story of Penelope. 
he seemed to genuinely understand her plight. Then a message buzzed her phone alive, and her eyes immediately read the name. Hamish. Oh my God, she thought to herself. He was finally reaching out. Dread pulled her down like a weight. She was about to reach across to it when she saw Chase looking at her. Do you want to answer that? he asked. He's married, she said, making him speechless with the blunt truth. The phone made a noise to let her know she had a voicemail. What time would you like to meet tomorrow? Samantha put on her work face. She could get through the next few minutes, say her goodbyes, and head back to the house to cry alone in her shower. Come for the sunrise, he said, getting up. He pulled out his wallet again. Oh, here. He threw two twenties down on the table. I'm not taking that, she said. Her pride wasn't completely destroyed. I'm not a broke actor, Chase said. Miami High is still huge on streaming. She pulled back the 20s, feeling slightly better about the situation. I'll bring pastries. I'll have coffee. He gave her a wave and picked up his things, leaving her at the table alone. She didn't look at her phone. Instead, she picked it up and dropped it into her purse. She'd say goodbye to Renee and walk the beach. Maybe take a detour if need be. When she reached the counter, baby George was strapped onto Renee's chest, wearing his angry face. Did you just wake from a nap? Samantha asked him. Creases formed as he made a deep throaty grunt at her. He wants to give the pastries to the customers and mommy is saying no, Renee explained. Samantha wondered if all new mothers referred to themselves in the third person for the baby's sake, or to distance themselves from the annoyance that sometimes grew inside. I could take him, Samantha said, not sure why. The kid hated her. Before she could take back her offer, Renee was unstrapping the harness and throwing it around Samantha's shoulders. Wait, Samantha said as Renee clipped the front on. He hates me. He doesn't know you. Renee rested his backside against Samantha's belly and strapped the final harness around his chest, sealing them together. He looked at Renee and instantly started to cry. Oh, you better go before he gets upset, Renee said. Renee, he's crying already. What do you mean before he gets upset? A high-pitched scream ejected from his lungs, something she had never quite heard before. Holy holiday balls, where did he get lungs like that? Nice expression, Renee shook her head. Go to the beach, he loves watching the seagulls. Do you know bird watching is considered a boring activity? Samantha said to her sister. Go, have fun. Renee hugged them, squeezing George against her breasts. What if he gets hungry, she asked. Come back, or get milk out of the freezer at home. Renee acted like Samantha had watched George every day. Renee, I don't know anything about babies, Samantha pleaded. All I need is a little time to work, please. Renee gestured to the long line of customers. George had already stopped crying and was sucking on his thumb. Renee grabbed Samantha's arms quickly, pulled her to her face, kissed her on the cheek, and headed back to the counter without hearing the rest of Samantha's argument. She left with George strapped to her chest, her back already aching from the extra weight. Seems like you've been eating too much avocado. And pastries. She walked down Harbor Lane, trying to read Hamish's text as she went. But every time she slowed down, George would whine, and she feared the monster might come out again. The tiny village of Eastport reminded her of a Norman Rockwell. American flags hung on every store and porch. She walked by the park along the harbor, where it had tended pots of flowers and manicured lawns. She walked down to the memorial of those lost at sea. George's legs kicked as they moved. He seemed to be fine if she moved, but the second she slowed to read the text, he'd fuss. She walked past the tiny porch's historical society. Something delectable wafted from the kitchen of the wharf. She almost stopped in the candy shop, 
and realized Renee might not want her to give baby George candy. So she skipped it, instead choosing to go inside the hardware store. How can I help you? A middle-aged man said. He knelt on the floor, unloading a box onto the shelves. Just love a hardware store, she said. Mind if I walk around? He smiled. Not too many tourists come to visit my store, so sure. She smiled, not sure if she should correct him, but she didn't really know what she was considered on the island. Was she a tourist? Or did she hold a strange claim since her mother had a house here? Or was she just a transient outcast sent to another island? She was voted off the British island. She walked George up and down the aisles, just like her father would have done those Saturday mornings, up and down the hardware aisle, looking for the perfect tool for his next project. He had started all kinds of projects, a dollhouse for her and Renee, new shelving in the den, a back deck off the kitchen. Then he had ended up hiring a carpenter. Her mother always said it was a man's way of socializing, since their father hardly ever followed through on the dozens of projects throughout the years, but always went back to the hardware store. Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, she began singing, just like her father would, holding her hand as they walked down the aisle. Even though the sound of it... George looked up and started jerking his legs up and down. Hot! Do you want a hammer? She said, pointing to the row of hammers of all different sizes and purposes. I think you'll have to wait. Hot! He'd yelled so hard that a baby blood vessel popped out of his little neck. Jeez, okay. She looked around the store. There was only an old man and the front clerk. Oh, supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. By the time she and George hit the last aisle, she had moved on to Chim Chim Cheree, and the old man in the store had invited her and George back to the aisles another time. We gotta get them while they're young. When she stepped outside, George started babbling happily, even when she touched his pudgy little hand with hers. In fact, his legs jerked around, and he used his word a lot. Hot! She pointed to a seagull. Look, George, a seagull! His little legs moved up and down, and his arms suddenly got involved. Hot, hot, hot! She followed the seagull, who sat on a railing that overlooked the harbor. George appeared to be perfectly content being still and watching the seagull. She pulled out her phone. The voicemail was long. She read the transcript and skimmed the words. He missed her. He still loved her. Things couldn't work no matter how bad he wanted them to. Then she saw the words she had dreaded the moment he told her he was marrying Penelope. She was pregnant, due in February. They were hoping for an heir. Emily would be so pleased knowing the name and legacy lived on. Then she listened to it. Oh, my dearest Samantha, if I could change things, I would. I would have taken you in my arms that day, but we had just found out of the baby. How could I leave my pregnant wife for another woman? Surely you must understand. I love you, Samantha. I miss your touch. I miss your smell. I miss everything about you. Baby George started moving, a jerking motion. He whined. Where's your seagull? Samantha said, looking for the darn bird. Did he fly away? He shoved his hands forward, where the bird must have flown off to. He didn't even invite you to come along, she said in a serious tone. Creases wrinkled his baby forehead, making him look either like an old bald man or an adorable bald cat. Suddenly, in a fit, his little arms and legs started kicking and throwing around. He started to wiggle in his harness and swatted at her head. Ouch, Samantha said. That hurt. She marched over to the bakery as baby George continued to wiggle and strain his body to remove himself from the restraints. You know, little man... I thought we had a nice thing going, Samantha said, opening the door to the store. Renee's face lit up, and George's arms extended toward his mom 
as if he'd been tortured by his aunt the whole time. He's fine, Samantha said, starting to unleash the beast as he kicked her in the stomach. Did you miss Mama? Renee didn't seem to care about the damage he was doing to her ovaries with his heels. She held out her arms and pulled him expertly out of the baby carrier. Samantha's front was drenched in baby sweat. Ew! Oh, you're fine, Renee said to her, dismissing her need for new clothes. At least it's not poo. When are you going to be free to hang out? Samantha asked. She really wanted to talk to her sister. Renee would know what to do about Hamish. Should she tell him off? Or not reply? The truth was, he was about to become a father, and that changed everything. She may not have been the other woman before, but from this point on, she would be. Why, what's up? Renee said, trying to pay attention to George, who was sticking his fingers in her nose. Never mind, you're busy, Samantha said, handing back the carrier and scooting toward the front door. I should go back and change. I'll see you at dinner, Renee said. Samantha waved, watching as Renee carried George on her hip. Renee made motherhood and owning a business and having it all look super easy. And Samantha knew that wasn't the case. Renee woke up at 3.30 to bake. She was running around everywhere. But as Samantha watched her sister bounce the baby on her waist, the sheer joy they had staring back at each other, she knew Renee wouldn't have it any other way. She was living her full life the way she wanted to. Samantha had dreams of living at the castle, not because it fulfilled the fairy tale dream for her inner girl, but because of the traditions, the legacies, and the rituals. She liked being part of something so much greater than her, a history that would continue long past her. No one even knew her dad here. The only George they knew was a baby who hated his aunt. Chapter 11 you didn't see it, Renee said to Matteo as she wiped George's bottom with the baby wipe. You're right, Matteo said back, drying George's tush with a clean diaper. He opened it up, including the tabs, and stretched it out in front of George. She lifted him up, and like a well-oiled machine, the diaper went underneath without a problem and was fastened perfectly. George reached out to Matteo, and he swooped him up. She's into him. Renee said. Did you hear her at dinner? Matteo put George's pajamas on as Renee picked a book from the basket of his favorites. How about Good Night Moon? That's such a weird one, Matteo said. She picked up another book, a Spanish lullaby that made her heart swoon when Matteo read it in his heavy accent. She couldn't understand much of it, but she loved hearing him speak Spanish. Matteo took the book and started right away, thickening his accent the way she liked. She placed George in her lap, squeezing him in delight as he clapped at Matteo. As she sat there on the floor, listening to Matteo act out the sounds of the Spanish animals, she realized how very blessed her life was. For George, Matteo was the father figure he would always know. Matteo not only turned out to be a great father, but also a great man to her. He treated her like a queen. I love you, she said to him, looking around the empty room that once housed all her and George's things. I can't wait to start this new chapter of our lives together. He leaned over and kissed her as George grunted in between them. You want in on some love? she asked George. They both kissed him on the cheek. I love you both so much, Matteo said. I just want my sister to be happy, Renee said. Renee? Matteo went back to the book and held up the picture, starting to read again. You shouldn't get involved. They talked for hours, she said over the story. Hours! Yes, and they probably loved that you watched them talking for hours, he added a dramatic sigh. Hours! But they looked like, I don't know, like we did when we first started talking. Renee had seen a spark flickering between the two of them. What about the laird? 
who's married and called her a stalker? Renee asked. Samantha hadn't even confessed that part. Renee had found that out on her own. Besides, what's wrong with the summer fling? What if they both break each other's hearts, and it's all because you stuck your nose where it doesn't belong, he said. Look at Wanda, she said. Marty and her are going out tonight. It's never too late for true love. Mateo sighed. He's my client. Renee slumped down. Yes, there's that. But seriously, they had a connection today. Can you just let this connection happen naturally? She pouted out her bottom lip. Fine. I'll let my sister become a lonely spinster. She's going to be fine, you know, Mateo said. Samantha hadn't shared a ton about her arrival, but Renee could detect the signs of someone running away from a broken heart. I just feel like she doesn't know what's right in front of her because she's so stuck on what she left behind. She'll never see what's in front of her until she deals with what she left behind, Mateo said. She huffed out a heavy breath. Why do you have to be so rational and right all the time? Because I'm always right. He smiled, turning the page of the book and reading it to George. She playfully hit him in the arm, and then George did the same. Uh-oh, Mommy's teaching bad manners, she said. Kisses. We give kisses. Mateo reached out and kissed her. George puckered up and tried kissing them. She had a stretching feeling in her heart, as though she couldn't possibly hold any more love. Life was so good. Why shouldn't she want her sister to have this? If she hadn't opened up to the idea of Mateo, she would be miserable and alone, wondering what she had done wrong that made her husband not love her and her child. She would be exactly where she was a year ago, devastated and destroyed. What if we just had him over for dinner here, she said. Renee, Mateo had a warning in his voice. Don't get involved. You of all people should know better. He was right, of course. She did know better. The women in the Rose family did not fare well with meddling. She could attest to that. But they were also opinionated, determined, and stubborn. A perfect recipe for matchmaking. They're perfect together, she said to George. And Mateo sighed. I just know it. He kissed George's head and then leaned over and kissed her when the story was finished. I'll see you two in the morning, Mateo said. Biddy and my mom are taking Wanda to treatment, so Julia offered to watch George. Renee had thought about asking Samantha, but she'd made such a fuss about watching him the other day that she'd save the ask for when it was really needed. But in the morning, Samantha woke up early, as Renee was getting ready to go to the bakery. You're already leaving? Samantha said. I have to drop off George at Julia, so I have to leave earlier, Renee said, packing George's bags. She'd left him asleep upstairs for as long as she could. Why isn't Mom watching him? Samantha asked, acting a bit annoyed about this. Because she's taking Wanda to her treatment with Biddy. Renee wanted to point to the calendar that hung on the wall. The whiteboard had a wooden frame she had Mateo make to fit the decor of the room, but it was the women's lifeline. Everyone's schedule, even George's, was written down in dry erase and discussed at dinner. You didn't want to ask me? Samantha seemed offended. Renee almost began the argument, feeling a bit annoyed, but Biddy gave her the eyebrow from across the kitchen, the look Biddy gave when warning to stop. You should call Harper today and hang out, Renee suggested. She knew Samantha adored Harper. Plus, Harper had been in a funk. She had big plans to move to the city, but her royalties were not as high as she had expected, and her debut novel hadn't been the hit they had all hoped. The carefree Harper seemed bogged down with the pressure to write the second book. I'm actually going to be filming today, Samantha said. But I was hoping maybe we could do that lunch, just us. Renee thought about her day. She had so much to do. Lunch really wasn't an option. But Samantha kept pushing and pushing for it to be just them. 
Maybe it had something to do with this Hamish guy. Sure. You want to have it at the bakery? That's fine, Samantha said, biting her lower lip. That's great you're filming, Renee said, wondering if she should ask Samantha if she was okay. Renee looked at the clock. She'd be late if she did. Then, with a sigh, she asked, You okay? Yeah, it's just... Hamish texted me last night. Samantha's eyes immediately watered. Oh, Samantha. Renee set all the bags that were perfectly organized on her shoulders down on the counter. She rushed over to her sister as the tears fell. What did he say? He's having a baby. Samantha cried deep, heavy sobs into Renee's arms. He says he can't stand her one minute, and then she's having his baby the next. Drop him, Samantha, he's bad for you, Renee said, and she felt Samantha's muscles jerk stiff. But he has no choice, Samantha said. Well, everyone has a choice. Renee loved her sister, but she didn't like that this man chose a family legacy over love. Do I need to remind you that he left you when you got hit by a car? She was pregnant. Samantha, look at this as a gift, because you don't want to end up with a man who chooses a house over you. Renee didn't understand how Samantha didn't get that. A castle that's been in his family for 500 years? Samantha's red eyes narrowed at Renee. You act like that's easy to give up. No. Renee took in a deep breath. She was about to release a truth bomb. He acted like it was easy to give you up. Biddy stood up from her chair and walked over to them before placing her arm around Samantha's shoulder. She winked at Renee and said, You should get to the bakery before they open without you. Gratitude filled Renee. She pulled out her foot from her mouth to apologize to Samantha. The truth was hard to hear. I'm sorry, Samantha. I love you, and I just don't want you to be treated this way. It's not fair that he texted you. Is it better if I read about the pregnancy on the internet? Samantha shot back. Renee tilted her head. I'm sorry. I really am. Sure you are. Samantha got up and marched into the front room. I'll talk to her, Biddy said. She'll be fine. I feel bad, but from where I'm standing, he sounds like a jerk. Renee wanted her sister happy. Nothing about this married man made Samantha happy. Even if he was doing it out of loyalty and honor, what a jerk, texting her while his wife is pregnant. Biddy shushed her. Now, let's remember there's a broken heart here. Renee heaved her bag onto her shoulder. She had too much to worry about at this point. I'll talk to her at lunch. But when lunchtime came and went without Samantha showing, she figured her sister was still mad. The bakery was slammed all day. Even the bookstore shelves seemed bare after the crowd started to slow down. She had never seen more people in the space. Great day, Charlie said from behind the register. He whistled as he wrapped another set of 20s. We're already tripling our sales from last month. Renee smiled with a nod, but the argument between her and Samantha continued to play out in her head. Renee knew she was right. The guy was a creep, texting his ex-girlfriend while married with a child on the way. Who did that? And what was worse, Samantha didn't seem to see the problem, beyond the fact that he'd left her on Regent Street. But he'd left her, period. Maybe now that this man's wife was pregnant, he would leave her sister alone for good. Is it wrong to be honest, even if it hurts someone's feelings? Renee asked Charlie. His eyebrows wrinkled. Depends on the person, I suppose. I was supposed to meet Samantha for lunch today, but we got into this argument this morning, and I said some honest things, and she didn't show up. Somehow she had a feeling Charlie would understand. Ah, I see. Charlie shut the register drawer and leaned against the counter. 
Being honest is all about the delivery. I probably didn't deliver her truth at the best time. But Samantha would have sat around all day, sad and depressed, for a guy who sounds like a scumbag. Renee made a face. And now she's mad at me. Who's mad at you? Mateo asked, walking in from the back. Hey! Renee's sour mood instantly lifted the second she saw Mateo. Samantha, I told her to forget the Highlander, and she got upset. Well, she's not upset anymore, Mateo said, his lip curled in a smirk. Renee watched as Mateo held in a secret, which she knew he wouldn't be able to do for long. Mateo, do you know something we don't? She asked him as his smirk turned into a full-blown smile. She's been at the farmhouse with Chase Mitchell all day, he blurted out. All day. You're only telling me this now? She looked at her phone. It's four. I was working, Mateo said to her. Sorry, but like, all day? Renee moved the conversation back on track. What was she doing there? She told me she was filming. She is. They've been walking around the whole house, talking about the sunlight, windows, exposure, shutters, I don't know. Anyway, she's going to do another series like she did with your mom's house and the bakery. Renee smiled, but guilt flooded her, and her feet felt stuck, like they were in sand after a wave pulled away from shore. That's great. Now she felt bad. Here Samantha was, helping Mateo's business with her videos, and Renee was throwing horrible truths in her face. I'm the biggest jerk ever, Renee said. What did you say? Mateo asked. Renee started twisting the tea towel hanging over her shoulder. Then she pulled it off and turned it in her hands. I may have given her a hard time about Hamish. She couldn't hold back. She flung her hands out, whipping the towel in the air, then hung her head, holding her temples. I just can't let it go. I'm sorry. It's a little personal for you, I think, Charlie said, standing off to the side. Renee froze and thought about it. Did she hate this man because of her own situation? No. Charlie didn't know the whole story, because Samantha did what she always did best. She only allowed the shine to show. She had a knack at keeping the rust and dirty side of her personality away from others. Her parents had thought she was a good girl, a straight-A student, when in reality, the National Junior Honor Society member could take a beer bong better than any frat guy at Kappa Delta Pi. She'd go to the library to study, but go make out with Jordan Capsalis, the captain of the football team, instead. Samantha hadn't originally told Evelyn about Hamish or the car or her career's bust, because that didn't fit the narrative. Instead, she pretended everything was fine, met in secret to tell her story, and got mad when people told her the truth. Did she seem upset? Renee asked. Mateo shook his head, then winked at her. I think you're right. They seem to get along great. Maybe Renee should invite him to dinner. What if you invite him to your place and I can cook? Mateo tugged at the belt loop of her pants and pulled her into his arms, pressing her against him. You mean our house? You just have to wait three more months, she said. That's forever, he groaned. She may have wanted the dream wedding, but Mateo wanted the wedding night. Soon, Mr. Perez, he kissed her. Not soon enough. I'm standing right here, Charlie reminded them as they started kissing again. They didn't stop kissing until Renee playfully pushed Mateo away. So I'll see you at dinner. Dinner, he kissed her forehead. I'll ask Chase what's a good night to join us. She pointed to him. Perfect. She pulled out her phone and dialed Samantha's number, but it went directly to voicemail. Look, I'm a jerk, but I love you, and I just want to beat up anyone who breaks my baby sister's heart. She sighed into the receiver. 
but I should have kept my opinion to myself. I'm a big mouth, you know that. She paused, wishing she had kept her mouth shut earlier that morning. Now call me back. I heard you're hanging out with your lover boy from Miami High. But Samantha didn't call her back or show up for dinner. Chapter 12 Samantha wished she could have borrowed her mother's station wagon to drive over to Chase Mitchell's farmhouse, but the women needed it to go to the hospital for Wanda's treatment. There was no way she'd ask Renee for a ride after their argument that morning, so she texted Mateo. Could I get a ride to your job site with Chase Mitchell? She crossed her fingers, hoping he wouldn't be weird like Renee would be. Sure, I'll swing by in 15. Of all the things Renee accomplished in her life perfecting, her baking, her business, now she had the perfect boyfriend. Mateo not only had the looks and the brains, but he quite literally was the nicest guy. About 15 minutes later, Samantha saw headlights sweep across the floor, and she ran to the front door, when all of a sudden Harper came bounding up the front steps, and they almost bumped into each other. Hey, Harper said. Oh, Samantha looked at her watch. It was still dark out. I thought you were Mateo. Harper made a face. I hope I don't look like a six-foot-tall man. Sorry, no. Samantha shut the door behind Harper as she came inside the house, noting the early morning arrival. Did Harper always come this early? He's picking me up to go to the new job site. Harper walked toward the kitchen. Is my dad here? No, Samantha shook her head. Everyone's gone, but there should be coffee still. Oh, I drink green tea, Harper said, walking into the kitchen. What are you doing at the site? I'm going to film some of the things he's working on. Samantha watched as Harper dropped her bag on the counter, grabbed the kettle off the stove, and filled it up with water. Then Harper opened a drawer and pulled out a tea bag. Would you like some? Samantha shook her head watching Harper move around the kitchen in comfort, and Samantha felt like the stranger. Samantha knew things changed, that life never stays the same. Losing her father had been the biggest change of all. But for some reason, she hadn't expected her mother's life to change. But now, as she watched Harper use her mother's things as though they were her own, Samantha realized everything had changed with her mother. The house, her boyfriend, and now her whole family. And she wasn't part of that change. Outside, Samantha could hear tires along the driveway. I should go. Good luck, Harper said, peeking out the window to see Mateo pull up to the house. Thanks. Samantha waved as she left, smiling at Harper on the way out the door. Thanks for picking me up, Samantha said as soon as she got into the truck. Any time. Mateo said. Suddenly, Samantha felt like she did when Renee went into high school. She felt like the annoying little sister who didn't have a car, who mooched off of everyone, and was a burden to deal with. Luckily, Chase Mitchell's farm was only a few miles away from her mother's house. Mateo turned off the road onto a long, winding drive that rolled up and down with the Valley of Seagrass. Pastoral fields flanked with stone walls ran alongside the drive, up ahead at the end, right before the endless blue sea, sat a gray Cape Colonial with a barn extending off the back. It was spectacular. Oh, my God, she said, leaning into the dashboard to get a better look at the views. It's insane. The Cape portion of the gray clapboard house appeared to be the original house, and it seemed as though multiple additions had been made. It just kept going and going, like an English village house or a farmhouse in Provence, that this house extended into the sea. This place is amazing, she said as Matteo parked his truck. Wait until you see what he wants to do with it. Matteo raised his eyebrows. It's going to be insane. Chase met them outside and opened the passenger door for her. The men shook hands and made some small talk, as Samantha strolled off by herself, walking the drive in the morning dusk. You ready? Chase asked. 
she turned to see him in his usual hoodie and pants, which fit a bit too perfectly. He may be ten years older, but he was still very fit. She looked down to see he wore a pair of New Balance shoes, which she remembered were her father's favorite brand of running shoes. Is that an old Canon A1? Chase asked, reaching for the camera that hung around Samantha's neck and swept it off. Here, check out my camera, Samantha said sarcastically. But something felt good about having Chase Mitchell, haughty of Hollywood, comfortable enough to jokingly take her camera from her neck and start taking pictures. I thought you said no filming, he asked her, hitting the buttons. I use it for lighting. She liked opening the filters, using the exposure. She really didn't know much about photography, but she could read a room with photographs, like still life in painting. Do you always use this for your videos? He asked. She shook her head. I like to use my photographs for my Canon in my videos as well. The grain gives off a dreamlike appearance. I noticed you had still shots, but I thought you just used a filter on your phone he said. He looked through the camera's viewfinder and pointed it on Samantha, who pretended to be unamused by his behavior. How old is this original structure? she asked. This part of the house was built in 1795. Chase handed back the camera and stuffed his hands into his pockets, walking her over to the part of the house she'd thought was the original, the cape portion. She could see the familiar bronze plaque of National Register of Historic Places. She noted it was older than McPherson Castle. This is going to be a nightmare, Samantha said. You're never going to get approval on anything. I'm not really changing all that much to the original structure, Chase said, opening the front door. Just the new additions. She stepped up a granite step and into the small doorway. A wall greeted them as they walked in, and that was when she saw the first room, with its post and beam, timber ceilings, and 12-inch pine floors. Smack dab in the center stood a brick fireplace with a black wood stove coming out from it. The walls, the ceilings, the beams, the frames, and the doors were all a dark stained wood, which darkened the space, but the small room was still bright with a view of the water. She adored it. What are your plans? I'm going to keep this original part of the house as is. He held out his arms, turning in a circular motion. But the rest, well, that's not historical, and I'm modernizing. He walked her through what looked like a dining room, but it had no furniture other than a hutch, to an opening covered by a sheet of plastic. He pulled it back and gestured his arm toward the new space. After you. Samantha walked into what looked like a construction zone, not a 300-year-old farmhouse. It felt like a completely new space, open and bright, windows everywhere, with lots of cabinetry. Are you making this the kitchen? He nodded. I'll be able to cook breakfast and see the sunrise. He stepped back and pointed down the length of the house. The whole back end of the house follows the sun. She looked through the kitchen where they stood on the eastern side of the house. The dining room came next, then another entrance to another room, and then to another. What's the last room? She started walking down the separate spaces. A study that walks out to a screened-in porch. The house seemed huge for one man and his daughter. Do you at least have a girlfriend? I thought you Googled me, Chase said, but she noticed he didn't answer the question. She hadn't noticed a girlfriend. She continued walking through the space, stopped every few feet, taking photos through the windows and around the rooms. Each room had its own theme, with French doors that led out to its own unique garden. In one garden, it had nothing but rose bushes and gray stone. The next garden had huge blue hydrangeas as a natural border. Tell me you're going to make this a library she said, in the second-to-last room. The garden outside its French door had a small pond and water feature. He nodded. Let me show you my plans. They returned to the kitchen, and Matteo met them there. 
The two of them went over the next stages of construction as a team. She studied the design. I think it's smart to put in pocket doors. Then you can cut off spaces that aren't being used, especially in the winter, said Matteo. Chase held up his hand, pointing to the window behind her. Sorry to interrupt. It's just that you should go outside and see it. She looked out, and there on the edge of the earth, the sun rose above the horizon as rays of light beamed across the water. She stepped through the open French door. A fish pond's water feature sputtered out sporadically, but her attention was on the colors changing above the water. The purples and pinks and oranges glistened on the ripples of the waves as they rolled into shore. As the sun slowly crept over the water, off in the distance, she saw seagulls floating in the breeze. For a second, all her emotions from the past few weeks peaked, lodging in her throat. Keep it together. She kept repeating as she witnessed a miracle happening right before her eyes. He's going to think you're insane. Let's check the rest of this place out, Samantha said, clearing her throat. After a tour of the whole house and outbuildings, she could see the structure was old and would probably turn out to be a money pit. But she totally understood why Chase bought it. It was perfect. One hundred acres. Samantha couldn't believe the amount of land he had purchased on Martha's Vineyard. Seventy is conservation, Chase said. Did Miami High really generate that much money to buy a compound on America's presidential island? The project was big. One of Mateo's biggest from what she knew of his work. Way bigger than her mom's beach cottage. He was rebuilding a museum. Why don't you stay for lunch, Chase said. I brought some sandwiches and some drinks. He brought her to a table set up under an arbor in the middle of a field. This is pretty much perfect, she said, looking around her surroundings. Something pulsed inside her chest as she sat there under what she imagined must be. Is this wisteria? He nodded, tipping his hat back so he could get a good look at it. He had removed the sweatshirt and now wore a surf t-shirt. Maybe it was the rhythmic beating of the waves against the cliffs off in the distance that were lulling her into a feeling of tranquility. Or the six-pack of a very good local pale ale he brought along their little picnic. Or the perfectly chilled lobster roll with just the right ratio of mayo to meat. Did you make this? He shook his head. I ordered it from the wharf. This farm is unbelievable. Samantha turned around on her knees to look back at the house. The structure looked dainty and petite, but it easily had to be over 10,000 square feet. What are your plans with the outbuildings? She could see an art studio or a writing space. She wondered what her mother would do. Evelyn was the reason she loved art and design and architecture. I haven't decided but probably a spot for my daughter. He shrugged, as if building a house for his daughter on an island in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean was no big deal. Where did this money come from? But one thing she knew all too well about the wealthy, you didn't ask them about money. Ever. It was also the very reason so many of the ultra-rich didn't understand that money wasn't an endless fruit tree. Money did run out. Where are you planning to farm it? I've got a few acres ready to be used over there. He pointed beyond the house. I'd like some chickens, maybe sheep or goats. Nothing crazy. But that's a mess in City Hall, so we'll see. She was surprised farming on a farm would get pushback. Is it because of the water being so close? She knew animals created toxic environments if over-farmed, or if the waste wasn't properly drained. Who knows? They don't like newcomers trying to do what they want to their land because they couldn't. I don't know. She nodded and took another picture. You don't mind the camera? She asked. She had taken dozens of photographs, and he hadn't flinched once. You get used to them. My mother never gets used to me taking her photo. 
She needs full approval before I can save it on my phone. She suddenly realized why that might be. Samantha had completely forgotten about her father's obituary photograph. The memory of her mother's face made her burst out laughing. What's that about? he asked, a smile growing with intrigue. Since I always took the pictures, my mom suggested I pick the picture for my dad's obituary. She started laughing in an uncontrollable manner, and a silent shudder went through her as she tried to calm herself down. It's really not that funny. What is it? She pulled out her phone and scrolled through photo after photo until she finally landed on the one she was looking for. She opened it up and showed him. That's the photo I picked. Her dad stood on a canoe, holding up the tiniest sunfish he had ever caught. She had made him take a photo, and he'd immediately lost his balance and fell into the lake. She had never seen her dad that happy. But when her mom had seen the photo of him in his tight 80s shorts, with a tiny fish and a six-pack of light beer in the background, she was not pleased. You made your father look ridiculous. She hadn't understood. He looked so happy. Fishing with his family on the lake had been great. Why choose a picture he'd been forced to smile in when you could feel his happiness radiating out of his body through that one? He looks really happy, Chase said. I know, right? She laughed looking at it. He practically died because of that bloody sunfish. Where is that accent from? Chase asked Samantha. Samantha wondered if she'd slipped into a London posh with the long O sound. I'm from Minnesota. I thought that, or Canada. Chase shook his head. I filmed the whole series up in Vancouver. A show about Miami was filmed in Canada? Suddenly, all the flashy stuff she had thought about the teenage show seemed silly now that she was an adult. I can't believe that. He took another beer from the ice bucket and twisted off its cap. I like Vancouver. Really radical landscaping. You've got this incredible sea up against these even more extraordinary mountains. Want another? She'd had her first at noon, and she noted that another would only be two. Sure, why not, she said. She wasn't a mother or a business owner or someone's fiancé. She didn't need to be anywhere, ever. No one was even texting her anymore, not even Matilda, after she'd said she'd be out for three or more weeks. My favorite place like that is Rio. She reached into the bucket for a beer and a loose piece of ice. She ran the ice around her neck. The day had gotten hot over the past few hours, sitting outside. Do you want to head back to the house? It's got air. Do I look like I'm 70 and having hot flashes? He laughed. A bit. She bit her lip. She twisted off the cap, realizing a few things as she sat there. One, the farmhouse would be one of the most impressive projects she would film from start to finish. It could be up there in magnitude with McPherson Castle. Two, the camera loved Chase Mitchell, and her audience would love him. He knew the property and its history in an adorably cute way. He apparently had enough money to spend to rebuild a farmhouse that would rival any other house on the island. And that was sexy to the viewers. Three, Chase, the guy who sat across from her drinking a local pale ale, was flirting with her. And she enjoyed every minute of it. Chapter 13 Tension hung in the waiting room as Evelyn sat next to Wanda and studied her. She looked tired and worn out. There had been a distance slowly building between them, and it suddenly became obvious, and Evelyn could no longer ignore it. You want to talk about what's going on with you and Marty? She asked Wanda. We broke up. Wanda's confession came out in a huff, as if Evelyn had annoyed her with the question. Biddy reached out for Wanda's hand from her chair. You okay? I'm fine. But Wanda's focus was on her nails. 
Her hand then went to her new fuzzy curls that had come in whiter than her signature red. We just want to make sure you're okay, Evelyn said, squeezing Wanda's folded hands. But Wanda was reserved, her hands cold. I'm fine, Wanda said for the fourth time that day. Wanda was fine when she slept in. She was fine when she didn't want to shower. She was fine when she skipped breakfast. Wanda being fine had been the reason Evelyn couldn't stop studying her, to make sure she was okay. The day had already been long. The ferry ride had made Wanda sick. They got stuck in rush hour traffic, along with construction. They almost missed Wanda's infusion. And now this? Wanda, I thought you enjoyed Marty, Evelyn said. She didn't understand. They broke up? I don't need a relationship right now, Wanda said, as if she had canceled a subscription and not an intimate friendship. She and Marty had become close, more than just friends. And the apathetic look on Wanda's face made Evelyn even more concerned. But why? As soon as Evelyn said the words, she saw Wanda's jaw tense. You know, Evelyn, sometimes I don't have to explain myself. Wanda had said it quickly, sharp, as though she'd had this rehearsed for a while now. Evelyn froze. She hadn't heard Wanda upset. Well, not really upset, especially directed toward her. I'm sorry, you're right. She held up her hands. I'm just concerned. This made Wanda huff. I appreciate you ladies, I do. But even an old woman can feel smothered. Biddy and Evelyn exchanged looks. Oh, sugar, we didn't mean to smother you. We just love you, you know that, Biddy said in her southern drawl. Sometimes I feel as though you treat me just like you all treat George, she said from her chair. Wanda adjusted in her seat. I can date who I want and break up when I want. Okay, Evelyn said. Evelyn looked around at the other patients, now involved in their conversation. She pulled out her book from her purse. She'd ignore the scene that had just happened and let Wanda come to them when she was ready. Something was going on with her friend, and Evelyn certainly wouldn't be wise to think she understood. Wanda, you can come back, the nurse said from the office door. Wanda took her purse and followed the nurse down the corridor, not saying another word to the women. Evelyn turned to Biddy. What the heck did I say? She'll be okay, Biddy said, looking back down the corridor where Wanda had gone. I've seen this a lot with patients. I'm just surprised we haven't seen this yet. Evelyn bit her lip. I just hope she's not upset with me. She's not upset with you, Biddy said. It's like teenagers and their mothers. They know we'll always love them. This felt different, Evelyn said, worried. This felt like she was really mad at me. Biddy patted her knee. She's going through a lot. I wish she would meet with the therapist, Evelyn said. She had set up appointments for Wanda, but she had only attended a few sessions. There were different support groups they'd tried getting her to attend, but she didn't want to, and she seemed fine. But that's weird, right? Evelyn wanted to make sure she wasn't wrong on that. I thought things were fine between her and Marty. Biddy nodded. I sure did, too. At times, these women felt like her closest and dearest friends. They were like soul sisters, brought together by serendipity to go through a new journey together. But then, like now, she realized they hadn't really known each other that long. What was a year in the scheme of life? I'll apologize when she comes back, Evelyn said. That might be best, Biddy said, making Evelyn feel worse instead of comforted. Am I smothering her? Evelyn asked. You mean well, Biddy began. Evelyn's heart sank. She couldn't help but feel bad. 
Oh. Oh, that's not a bad thing, Biddy said, turning her seat to face her. The familiar squeeze in Evelyn's throat made her look away from Biddy, because she was sure she was about to cry. I just wanted to help, she said, trying to not make it about her. But she didn't think she was Wanda's problem. I know you do, Biddy said. But she wasn't telling her it wasn't true, that she wasn't smothering, and she wasn't annoying. I'm worried about her, Evelyn said, holding on to the arm of the chair. We all are, Biddy said, patting her hand. Evelyn now studied Biddy. Do you think I smother her? Well, not intentionally, Biddy said. Oh, Evelyn's eyes immediately moistened, and she rummaged in her purse for a tissue. Oh, honey, it's fine. Well, obviously it isn't, seeing how mad everybody is, Evelyn said. Wanda's not mad at you. She's mad at the universe for giving her a raw deal, Biddy said. And if you smother people with love, so be it. Lord knows there's worse things to be accused of. Evelyn dotted her eyes, trying to keep her emotions at bay, but holding it together for Wanda and the girls wasn't easy. And now Wanda was mad at her? That didn't seem fair. Biddy tisked once she saw the emotions. Oh, shoot, I didn't mean to make you cry. I know, she waved at Biddy. And I know this isn't about me, but I seem to upset everyone, and I don't know the right thing to say. First, she had made Samantha upset, now Wanda. Who was next? Because things always happened in threes. I think you've been the person who's glued us all together for so long that you're afraid to let go, Biddy said. She's not doing well. They've talked around it so many times, but no one has said what's really on their minds. Wanda wasn't getting better. She's dealing with it in her own way, Biddy patted Evelyn's knee. And we are meant to be here when she needs us. Should I stop bothering her? Evelyn didn't even know what she'd been doing that got Wanda so upset. I wouldn't change a thing. Just maybe don't tell her to use the restroom so much, Biddy winked. I'm just worried. Evelyn was definitely worried. The signs kept piling on. Biddy nodded. The women grabbed each other's hands and held them, silent until Wanda's treatment was over. You want to hit any special spot before the ferry? Evelyn asked Wanda when she returned to the waiting room. Wanda shook her head. Evelyn had almost expected her to come out and apologize, because Wanda didn't like people upset, didn't like confrontation. But she hardly made eye contact with either of them. No. I think I'd like to go straight home. Chapter 14 Samantha woke up before the sunrise the day after she'd had lunch at the farmhouse with Chase, which in June on Martha's Vineyard meant before 5 a.m. It also meant she had to be showered, blown out, dressed, done with makeup, her cue cards prepped and edited, all the while trying to help Renee with a cranky baby George. I think he's sick. Renee said. She packed up for the bakery, which she had reminded Samantha she was already late to. Samantha looked at the snot-crusted baby and said, Do you need me to watch him? Please don't need me to watch him. She crossed her toes, hoping Renee wouldn't agree. Not that she didn't want to help or be with her nephew. They'd had a solid moment for a second, and they had the common love of a hardware store. But she had so much to do not to mention a job. No, I'll be okay. Nana's probably better for sick babies, Renee said, not seeming to notice the insult she shot at Samantha. I watched him the other day, Samantha reminded her. Yes, but for like a half hour, Renee sighed. Besides, you look like you have a photo shoot. I do, actually. Samantha hadn't wanted to jinx it, so she hadn't mentioned the video to anyone, 
but now that it was morning and he still hadn't canceled, she felt more comfortable. I'm headed over to Chase Mitchell's. Do you need a ride? You have a sick kid. I'm headed over to Mateo's anyway. She packed another bag. He's going to watch George this morning. Then I'll come back after I prepped everything. Then Mom will come and relieve me. But we don't want the sick baby getting Wanda sick. When did this all take place? When you were ignoring me yesterday. Renee's eyebrow rose. You want to apologize for blowing me off for lunch? Renee was right. Samantha had blown her sister off. Oh, right. I was at Chase's getting my new gig. I know, and you didn't even bother to tell anyone. Renee sounded mad. Are you seriously upset? Samantha was the one mad, not Renee. Yes, you made me feel guilty for being this awful sister. No, I didn't, Samantha said. You've been insinuating, Renee started. Are y'all fighting for a second morning in a row? Biddy asked with her slow southern accent. Yes, they said in unison. What's going on? Biddy shook her head. Now, I never had teenage daughters, but this is exactly what I imagined it would be like. Samantha and Renee both stopped fighting. We're sorry we bothered you, Samantha said to Biddy. You didn't bother me. Biddy walked over to them. Do you realize you have a relationship that is like no other? No man, no friendship, not even between you and your mother is this special. You two are the only people that know exactly what it's like for each other. I just hate to see something so silly like a slight remark or bruised feelings ruin that. I'd kill to have a sister to go through everything with. Childhood, marriages, babies, death of your parents. Death of her parents? Evelyn stood in the doorway of the kitchen. Oh, good morning, Biddy said. Where are you headed off to? Evelyn asked Samantha as she walked into the kitchen. Renee smiled and gave a wink. Samantha has a boyfriend. Samantha's mouth dropped. Oh my God, I do not. She began to argue with Renee, but her sister ran off to change George upstairs while Samantha explained her newest project. That's fantastic. Evelyn seemed to put on an overly excited take. No concerns, no nagging questions. Evelyn was acting unconditionally supportive. What's wrong? Samantha asked. Why would anything be wrong? Evelyn said in the upbeat fake tone again. Samantha checked the time. She had just a few more minutes before the sun would start to rise. Never mind, I'll be back later. Samantha picked up some of Renee's large pastry bins, along with her own stuff, and headed out the door, following George as he swung in his car seat. Thanks for the ride, Samantha said. You know I want you to be happy, right? Renee said. Of course, Samantha knew that. But you thought I just forgot about him, and it's not that easy, okay? I think about him all the time. My mind goes to memories of us together. The way I felt with him, the way he smelled. And I'm afraid I'm going to forget all that. Renee set George on the ground. She glanced at her nephew playing with a stuffed green monster. Shouldn't you put the baby in your car? I'm not going to leave him there. He'll start to cry if I put him in and do other stuff first. Renee sighed and turned to Samantha. Look. I just love you, and I want to protect you always. You're my little sister, and when a guy breaks your heart, I don't like him, period. Samantha heaved out a long breath. I'm sorry, too. I've been a super brat not celebrating all that you've accomplished. I'm still a stupid, jealous little sister. Renee gave her a half smile, then picked George up in his car seat. You're going to throw your back out with him. Samantha got into the car, feeling like a child getting into her sister's minivan. 
Just don't forget me. Renee got in and started the engine. She sat there for a second, turning on the windshield wipers, clearing off the moisture built up from the night's humidity. Then don't always set off to go the furthest place from our life. An argument hung on the tip of Samantha's tongue, but she was too tired. She rolled down the window, watching the sky begin to lighten. Everything was hazy and gray. She could still see the stars twinkling in the sky. She wondered what her dad would say if he were here. What's this time called? 516, Renee said, pulling out of the driveway. No, I mean, what's the time before sunrise called? Samantha hadn't thought about it before. Twilight, Renee said. I always thought there should be a better word for that time in the morning. It was her best light for still shots, especially of people. She wanted to get as many still shots of Chase Mitchell as possible. Captured candids was what her professor had called them. Pictures where the subject had no idea they were being documented, and the photographer showed a story through images. She wanted Chase Mitchell's house's story to be about love. At lunch, she could tell he had fallen in love with the house. She had seen it time and time again, because she felt it too. When she tried to explain her love for houses to friends, they thought she was strange. At Halloween, when she'd rather peek into the house than get the candy, others thought she was just nosy. In high school and college, when she'd drive past her favorite houses instead of going to parties, she thought something was wrong with her. But now, as Renee dropped her off in front of Chase Mitchell's farmhouse by the sea, as the twilight sky hummed around her, she fell in love as well. Then she felt her stomach do a loop-de-loop -loop when Chase stepped out his front door with two cups of coffee, his azure eyes glowing against the painted pink sky. Good morning, he said, walking down the front porch to meet her. She immediately pulled out her phone and began filming. Renee jumped out of the front seat and handed over a plastic container. There are a few scones in here for you. I thought you guys could have a break. Would you like a cup of coffee for the road? Chase asked Renee, looking into the back seat. Aw, oh, man. Is your little guy sick? Renee made a frowny face which seemed childish to do in front of this A-lister, but Chase pouted out his lip as well, looking through the window. That's a bummer, man. Hope you feel better, Chase said, waving at George. George gave a sad wave to Chase, then gave Samantha an evil stare as she waved next. As Renee drove off, Samantha mumbled, He hates me. He's probably just a dude's dude. Chase said. My sister's kid is like that. He only likes guys and his mom. Dahlia gets so mad. He does like tools, Samantha said, remembering his little legs moving all around in the hammer section. Where in the garden do you want to begin? Chase asked. She had emailed her itinerary. Let's begin by the pergola. She had six shots she'd like to get before the sun rose above the horizon, and she had exactly two minutes to get them. He grabbed one of her two duffel bags, and they walked to the backyard under the green shade of the wisteria. She could only imagine what it looked like in bloom, purple flowers hanging down from above, its scent mixed with the tangy, salty air. She missed a few minutes of perfect light while setting things up, but other than that, the whole day ran smoothly. Chase had dressed the part better than a costume designer would have. He wore a light blue long sleeve shirt that fit just perfectly over his very toned chest and arms. He paired the shirt with a pair of khakis that fit him snugly in the right places. She found herself taking pictures of him just to look at him. He really had this way of being natural in front of a camera. But Chase almost seemed more comfortable in front of a camera than a live person. Or was he just comfortable talking with her? Because instead of looking at the phone, he looked at her while answering her questions. The farm had been purchased in 1790, Chase said, 
as they walked into the original part of the house. Samantha had decided that it would be her favorite during the winter. Small and cozy, with all the soft, worn wood throughout and the wood stove fireplace in the middle. I love to imagine what it must have been like to survive with that as a stove, Chase said. Women must have never left the house. Chase's forehead wrinkled. They did. They were in the fields, helping pull out all those rocks in the soil. Did you always live in the Los Angeles area? She asked, still filming. He shook his head. When I was little, I lived outside of Boston. He said it in a thick Boston accent. She laughed, amused at the idea of that heavy accent on surfer Jess from Miami High. You'd never know. Crazy. You really do play a part, you know. You mean act? His eyebrows rose. He was clearly teasing, but did she detect a bit of flirting? Or was she that desperate? Or did she really like the man or his house? She wasn't quite sure at that point. Can you tell me more about the history of this extraordinary multi-generational home? Samantha pointed the camera back on him, purposely catching the excitement that glimmered in his eyes when talking about the house. They had talked about their on-air conversation at lunch, and she had sent him the notes via email last night. He had not only looked everything over, but she also noticed he looked up information he wasn't sure about. John Ripley first built the cape in 1795. Chase slowly walked around the original structure. He slapped the wall that sat in the middle of the room. Underneath this wall is a stone fireplace with a built-in oven. He pulled back a plastic sheet, and Matteo and his brothers stood inside, removing the drywall and plaster from the original structure. They continued working, completely ignoring the two tramping through the construction. Her hand immediately went to the cool stone. I can't believe someone would cover this up. She had seen so many updates to old houses that had completely ruined the character, especially a house built by the owner's own hands. The idea that someone would come in with drywall and cover up all the hard labor the original owner had endured to bring in stones from the sea. They're so smooth. Like sea glass, the stone had been smoothed by the ocean's constant brushing of its waters. What do you envision for this room? She tried to imagine the initial kitchen and what it must have been like back in the day. I'd love to make this a gathering space. As Chase continued telling his plans of the room, she faded out from his words because she didn't even have to hear them. It had been her envision for the space when she first saw it as well. I want people to feel welcomed. Cozy and warm, she added after he finished. Yeah, you know, like, on a snowy day, she interrupted him, an exhilaration flooding through her. No one besides Emily, Hamish's mother, had ever been on the same level as Samantha. But Chase was right there with her. Yeah, when you're stuck inside. He pointed at her, shaking his finger as if it was funny, a ha-ha, that she knew what he was going to say. He still hemmed it up with the camera as she almost dropped her phone and most definitely botched the shot. She couldn't concentrate. Chase Mitchell was even hotter and sexier in real life. She wanted to send a photo to her friend Spencer. They'd once shared a drunken evening crying about men, and talking about their huge crushes on Jess from Miami High. She could ask Chase, of course, but she worried if it would change the dynamics. Maybe she should send a photo to Nigel, and maybe then he'd call her back. She wished she could send one to Hamish. Spending my time stalking someone else, XOXO. A baby. Hamish was going to have a baby. He certainly wasn't thinking about her. So why did she give every second, every moment to him? Here she was with Chase Mitchell, and she was thinking about a guy who had let the world think she was a stalker rather than upset his wife with the truth. 
Or was she that stupid? Had Hamish played her like a fiddle all along? Just like Penelope? And was Penelope the real victim in all this? No, she didn't deserve that title. The real victim would be the child birthed by Cruella de Vil. They continued to walk through the space, and Matteo answered a few questions about the first phase of the project, explaining what had happened first and what would come next. A nice surprise had been Elias, who went into detail about the masonry work and how the builders must have dragged the stones from the beach by horse. The manual labor it must have taken to build a fireplace to this magnitude with perfectly placed stones is just incomprehensible to me, Elias said as he chiseled away more of the plaster. By lunch, she had enough footage for at least the first episode. She wanted to get some film of the beach, a better sunrise and sunset if she could, birds of some kind, the village, and some surrounding landmarks, like the lighthouse or Greyhead Cliffs, for the intro. She hadn't made a new reoccurring introduction to her videos in years. She had tied together bits and pieces of videos, a montage of best shots. She had basically imagined herself as Rick Steves, but without a backpack, and a little more stylish. Although most of her outfits for shoots were hand-me-downs from Toph and Iona. She had about three decent outfits she used for shoots, but she'd have to do some shopping. Maybe she could take the ferry to the mainland. Maybe head to Boston. She'd have to do something soon, because Chase Mitchell was giving her a ton of footage, and she couldn't wear the same outfit every time. At lunch, she asked if he wanted to stop. You don't have to keep recording. I can come back another time with just Mateo. He looped his thumbs in his front belt buckles. I'm enjoying myself. You miss the spotlight, don't you? He shrugged. Nah, I think it's all phony. She made a face. Oh, really? So Mr. Academy Award enjoys a little bit of reality television? Well, you're not like Teresa Giudice or anything. Oh my God, you watch The Real Housewives? She pointed one hand at him and covered her mouth with her other. She immediately rolled in laughter. Her mother and the ladies loved New Jersey. You won't go throwing any tables, will you? Andy and I met a few times, so... You, the godfather of his son? She rose her eyebrows playfully. This had been her move in college at the bars. No, but I am Elton John's son's godfather, Lady Gaga's his godmother, he said. He appeared so serious that she stopped him mid-joke. Really? He laughed, shaking his head, and walked through what would be the new elaborate kitchen but was only an empty shell of framing. You must be getting pretty hungry, Chase said. He put his hands on his waist and surveyed the empty room. Wish I had a kitchen. Do you want to grab a sandwich at my sister's place? Samantha asked. She makes all her own bread. Yes, he said immediately, stuffing his phone into his back pocket. I'll drive. We can also call it a day, she said, looking at the time. They had been at it for over six hours. I have plenty to work with. His face dropped. What, you already sick of me? Her mouth dropped. Uh, um, no. He pulled his keys out of his pocket and said, Well, good, because we still need to plan out our next scene. Samantha didn't say anything as she followed him through the house and out to his fancy high-end SUV. But a relief washed over her when he wanted to hang out some more. And Samantha, for once, didn't think of Hamish. Chapter 15 Does your daughter like attending Harvard? Samantha asked Chase as they sat in the Adirondack chairs outside books and bread. He nodded. She loves it. Chase smiled to himself as he thought of Dahlia and how she was always rattling off all the new things that happened throughout her days. She has a really great roommate, which makes all the difference, Chase said. It had been so easy for Dahlia to settle into life at Harvard. 
She's always been anxious about school and work. So I thought we were shooting ourselves in the foot with her attending such an intensive learning environment. I mean, everyone in that school is the top 1%. It's crazy. The last time he'd visited campus, he just stood in front of one of the many beautiful buildings and thought about all the great minds that had gone through those doors and sat in those classrooms and started their lives, just like his daughter was doing. Never in a million years did I think I'd raise a kid who would attend Harvard. He shook his head. She's definitely had advantages, don't get me wrong. But she earned her place as well. You should be really proud, Samantha said. I never even considered applying. Samantha pulled her hair behind her ear before taking a bite of her sandwich, a habit he lost his cool to every time she did it. She'd brush back her silky blonde hair, exposing her long, slender neck, and it took everything in his being not to lean over and inhale her scent. She wore something that was a mixture of honey and vanilla and lavender. He didn't want to be that moron actor who could only explain his feelings through roles he'd played, but he hadn't felt this way about a woman besides Grace, and it reminded him of a part he'd played years ago for a romantic comedy. The character hadn't realized he'd been missing something in his life until the heroine had shown up in his town. And here he was, sitting with this woman, who had blown into Martha's vineyard like a nor'easter off the Atlantic, and he couldn't stop thinking about her. Never in a million years would he have thought he'd meet another person he'd develop feelings for. Sure, he had been with other women, but usually more as companions. He didn't have time to think about someone other than Dahlia. He didn't want to get mixed up in complicated relationships that just ended anyway. But here was this gorgeous, interesting, and exhilarating woman who had captured his complete attention. He was in trouble. Did you want to figure out tomorrow? He said, snapping out of his thoughts and focusing his eyes on something other than her smooth skin. I talked to Mateo about his timeline. Samantha pulled out a leather notebook and opened to a tab. He could see pages scribbled on and found it interesting that she wrote on paper. A techie vlogger who penned her itinerary. How old school. God, she was fascinating. She looked at him and made a face, which made him freeze. Could she tell he was thinking about what he would do if she agreed to stay the night? He shook the thought out of his head. Do you think that's a bad idea? Samantha asked. He quickly refocused, but realized he now had no idea what she was talking about. No, that's great. I was just thinking about my landscape designer. She's amazing. And local and has this bee farm just a couple miles in Edgartown. We should head over there sometime and talk to her about the plans. He watched her eyebrows wrinkle in thought, and he wondered if she could tell he was full of it. But a smile grew on her face. That's an amazing idea. She started to furiously write, even flipping to the next page. She pulled out her phone, opened her calendar, and bit her bottom lip. Her eyebrows furrowed. What is it? he asked. I don't know how long I'm staying on the island. She flipped back a tab in her notebook. And landscaping is usually the last project. How long do you plan on staying? he asked, not really thinking about her blowing out of his life just as fast as she blew in. She looked at the harbor. I was only planning a few weeks at most. He nodded. He knew she hadn't been back that long, remembering Mateo mentioning how his sister-in-law had come unannounced for a visit. He still had a few weeks before she left. He'd be smart to cool things off. He could finish the videos, but lunches like this, hanging out, talking about everything and nothing, and feeling comfortable, he'd have to pull back on those things. She shifted in her chair as she looked at her phone. Hear me out, she began. Would you mind changing outfits and doing a night shoot tonight? She held out a weather forecast to him. 
The pollen count is really high today, so the sunset will hopefully show some stunning colors. You could have gone to Harvard, he said, stunned by her knowledge of everything. I barely made it out of math by the end of high school, she said. It's the reason why I didn't pursue architecture. You'd be a great architect. He could see it. She had the passion for building, that was for sure. Although, you really have a knack with a camera. So do you, she said. And he swore she was giving him a look. Or was his ego still too inflated from his years in Tinseltown, where women always saw an opportunity when they figured out who he was, even as washed up as he was? What's with the guy from the castle? He asked, suddenly curious. He couldn't get what she hung on for. He didn't know the guy, obviously, but from what he knew of Samantha, he was a fool to leave her. Her face became serious. Hamish? Yeah, the one in the videos, he said. I mean, it's none of my business, but it is on your videos. I know, she said quickly. She looked away as if to think about discussing the topic with him, then turned back. She inhaled and let it out. He's married now and is expecting a baby sometime soon with his wife. He thought about the videos and how happy they had looked together. How the videos from Scotland ended so abruptly after his mother died. That hadn't been that long ago, had it? And the guy was already married with a kid? What happened? He asked, slightly wincing at his direct question. Samantha looked in the window of the store, as if to see if anyone else could see through and pick up on what they were talking about. She rested her elbow on the chair's arm, her chin in her palm. I don't honestly know. He could tell this had been an admission that bothered her, and he didn't push the subject anymore. They went back to business, talking about the next few weeks she planned on staying. They went through their schedules and set times for shoots. Come after lunch, and we can set up a night shot for tonight, he said. He smiled at himself. He was enjoying this more than he thought. I'm going to have to run home to change when we get back, she said. I can walk back to my mom's house from here. That's silly. He picked up her plate with his. I'm going to have to run back to my place to grab stuff as well. I'll just drive you. Why are you doing all this? She asked. The lines between her eyes creased. Doing what? He asked, cringing at how he behaved when he first met her. You've been out of the public eye for years. You didn't even consider it for a second when I first offered. So why are you working all day and night for me? Do you want, like, a restart to your career? Oh, God, no. Chase couldn't believe she'd think that. Not that I don't think your videos won't do well. It's just... No, I really don't want to go back to that life. Then why? Samantha seems suspicious. I mean, if you want to hide from the public eye? He sat there, gazing at her porcelain skin in those mesmerizing pale blue eyes that matched the sky outside, smelling her sweet scent, and said, Because you're the most fascinating woman I've ever met. Her mouth dropped. Oh, um, well. Shoot, he just ruined a dang good thing. Sorry, I'm forward. No, she shook her head. It's fine. He set the plates down, wishing he could go back. I should have said the other part, which is that I think you're extremely talented. And I liked being part of this whole production. I like being behind the camera. Plus, I really love film and being part of a project. And filming something real. Something that isn't so commercial. Do you say that to a lot of women? She asked. If I made you uncomfortable, he said, thinking about the way he'd said it. Had he sounded creepy? 
Her face dropped like she had seen a ghost. Did the age difference matter? You can totally bail on this if you want, or you can film on your own and I won't go to the house. I understand. Samantha didn't say anything at first, which made him feel like a complete tool sitting there confessing his feelings. Then she said, No one's ever said I'm fascinating before. Seriously? He honestly couldn't believe that. Not even that prince? He was a laird, and no. She tilted her head, her hair falling just a bit in front of her face. I find you fascinating as well. He hadn't felt like a giddy teenager since he was a giddy teenager. He almost wanted to jump across the table and take her in his arms right then and there. But he cemented his body in the chair. He would be cool. Way to steal my word. Her mouth opened and she smiled, but with a bit of shock. And then, as if she couldn't get any sexier, she leaned across the table and rested her head in her hand and studied him. He could feel his chest pumping a hundred miles an hour. If it had been 18 years ago, he'd already be kissing her. He leaned closer. God, he could smell the vanilla. His heart continued to pound inside his chest as she leaned further. Hey, Renee said from behind them. Samantha practically fell out of her seat. She jumped so high. Oh, my goodness, you scared the living daylights out of me. Samantha's face blushed pink, which made him want to kiss her even more. How was lunch? Renee asked. Great. Samantha stood up and grabbed her purse. She looked at her phone, then quickly kissed her sister on the cheeks, then turned to face Chase. So I'll meet you at the farm in a couple of hours, dressed in a new outfit. She turned back to Renee. Thank you for lunch. Then before he could stop her, Samantha walked down the sidewalk, leaving him standing with Renee. How's George? He asked, watching Samantha cross the street. She didn't use the crosswalk. Renee shook her head, who also watched Samantha, then said, He's okay. He still has something going on, but he's acting fine. He nodded. Do you think he's teething? Probably, she said. I feel like that's like the catch-all. Diarrhea? Teething. Cranky? Teething. Strange behavior? Teething. Isn't sleeping? He nodded. I wish I could say it ends, but I still have sleepless nights with an 18-year-old. You have an 18-year-old? Renee looked as shocked as most people when they see a mid-30s man with an adult child. Most people think she's my girlfriend. His view was still on Samantha, who had now turned around on the street and started walking back toward the store again. Does she live on the island with you? Renee asked. Genuinely polite and being friendly, he knew. But he needed to cut the questions off. He needed to go after Samantha. No, she attends school. He picked up the plates and napkins, preparing to leave the table in a dash. I better go. He placed the dishes under the sign by the counter and took off down the street where Samantha had turned to go back to her mother's house. He ran after her. Samantha! He jogged up to her and she swung around to face him. If this were like every Hallmark movie he'd starred in, he'd sweep his arms around her waist, hold her against his chest, and stare into her eyes. Then, as the wind swept her hair away from her face, he'd take her lips to his and kiss her. But instead, he said, You want to head to my house now? Chapter 16 Chase pulled up to Seaview and turned off the ignition. They sat in his fancy convertible with its top down, and she was keenly aware that even in the dark, all eyes from inside her mother's house could see them in the moon's glow. I had an amazing day, Chase said, turning in his seat. She knew he wanted to kiss her. He had stolen glances like that all day. She thought he was going to kiss her on the street when he ran after her, or at some point as they spend the rest of the day filming and writing scripts. Me too. She bit her bottom lip, holding her smile back. 
She could feel her mother and her friends. She so badly wanted him to kiss her. She slid her hand across the console and intertwined her fingers with his. The look he gave her through his eyelashes made her want to grab his face with both hands and kiss him right there under the stars, serenaded by waves and crickets. But instead, she said, Tomorrow, then? The right side of his mouth lifted in that sexy smirk of his, and her heart skipped a beat. Can't wait, he replied. With a quick wave, she quietly climbed the front porch steps. You must have had a good time, Biddy said from the porch's swing. Oh, Samantha shouted out, dropping her phone onto the porch's floor. Her hand went to her chest. She hadn't seen Biddy sitting there in the shadows. You scared me. I'm sorry. I should have said something when you got out of his car. Biddy patted the seat next to her. Now, dish. There's nothing, Samantha sat down. That look isn't nothing, Biddy said. It may be dark, but I saw you two. Samantha groaned. Why was she so terrible figuring out men? Am I stupid? What? Biddy made a face, not understanding her point. I mean, do you think I'm missing something? She swore Chase was going to kiss her. They had such a good time together all day. Why didn't he kiss her? But why would a guy like Chase Mitchell bother with someone like her? Especially when that someone was literally living out of her suitcase. Samantha hadn't ever had girlfriends her mother's age, and she hesitated to share, afraid she'd get spoken to like a child. But she needed womanly advice. Missing what? Biddy raised her eyebrows, waiting for Samantha to continue. You saw us? Samantha couldn't help but wonder what she had to offer. I thought he was going to kiss me. Seems to me like you two enjoy each other's company, Biddy said. She had a glass of wine in her hands as she pushed the swing back and forth. Don't overthink it. Just go for it. Samantha looked out at the stars. What if you're still in love with someone else, but you know it'll never work? Do you continue going for this new person? Was she using Chase to not feel the pain anymore? Or was this feeling, the buzz that ran through every cell of her body, real? Biddy nodded as she pushed the swing back and forth. Well, that's a tough one, Samantha said. And I know I shouldn't love this person. That's the worst part about it all. I know he's a jerk, and I know he doesn't even want to be with me. But I just can't stop my heart from hurting. It sounds like you're grieving a love you had with a man, not the man himself. Samantha gasped in a breath. That's exactly how she felt. The Hamish she loved no longer existed. The Hamish she loved would have ran to her after she got hit by a bus. The Hamish she loved would have held her hand in the ambulance, not called her publicist. The Hamish she loved would have shouted on the rooftops that she was not the other woman, but indeed the woman he loved. But he was no longer that Hamish. That Hamish died along with Emily. Thanks, Biddy, Samantha said. That actually made a lot of sense. Biddy patted Samantha's knee. Now, you have to tell the ladies all about Chase, because they're all dying to know. As it turned out, even Wanda was waiting for Samantha to spill the tea. So, how was your evening? Evelyn asked. Samantha nodded, wondering if she had pushed that friendship too far. Do you think Renee's going to be mad? Evelyn shook her head, pouring a glass of white wine and handing it over. We want to hear all about it. Samantha took the wine feeling strange to have the women crowd around, including her mother, to hear about her hanging out with Chase Mitchell. But yet, she was strangely excited to have girlfriends to share her story with. He's really great, 
She hugged herself as she sat at the table across from where Wanda sat. All of a sudden, Charlie popped into the kitchen, and she saw the chessboard set up in front of Wanda. Did you spend the day at Chase Mitchell's farm? He looked at the board. Did you move? Wanda nodded and pointed to the black piece. I moved my knight to here. Charlie studied the board. Seems like a nice guy. Samantha waited for Charlie to make a move. Yeah, he is. You two seem good together, Evelyn said, sitting at the counter with one of her cooking magazines and flipping through the pages. How did filming go? Good. All eyes were on Samantha as she stood in the middle of the kitchen. Is Renee at Mateo still? Yes, George still has a cold, Evelyn said. Are you going to tell us anything? There's really nothing to tell, Samantha said. Besides you wishing he kissed you, Biddy said, her Oklahoma coming out in her delivery. Samantha could feel her cheeks reddening, and she took a drink of the chilled wine to cool down and ignore the room of staring faces. Well, I'm bushed. She set her wine in the sink and began walking toward the staircase. See you all tomorrow. She thought of how long the relationship had taken with Hamish. It was a slow burn that had become more intense as it went on. But there was always something that had made things feel uncertain in their relationship. Would he keep the family house? Would he save his family's legacy? Would they gain financial security? All those big uncertainties had clouded her own thoughts on their relationship, and all these distractions lingered in the shadows. She never paid attention to outside factors, but maybe she should have. Had he been completely broken up with Samantha when he'd been seeing Penelope? As a solicitor, she understood he would be extremely busy during the week. She hadn't questioned why he sometimes didn't want to go out for dinner, and or had to work late because he gave her a hundred percent of his attention when he did come around. She had thought she was lucky. Now, she was almost certain she had been duped. She opened Hamish's information on her phone. Her thumb rested on top of the delete contact button. She took in a long, deep breath, exhaled slowly. But instead of deleting, she exited from the screen. She put her phone on the nightstand, turned off the lamp, and fell into a deep sleep. When Samantha woke the next morning, she lay in bed, her whole body still buzzing from the day before, her mind going back and forth from imagining kissing Chase to wondering how long it would take. How long would this absolute bliss last before the carpet was swept out from underneath her? How long would Chase Mitchell, Hollywood hunk, find her fascinating? She's the one who had found him fascinating. He had lived a life people dreamt about, met people she'd read about, even the former president of the United States. Everything he said seemed to speak to her heart and her mind. Everything he did came with purpose. And for a 36-year-old, he appeared strangely wiser than anyone she knew. She rolled over to look at the clock as her phone pinged with messages. That was when she realized two very important things. One, she hadn't had messages pinging her phone since before she got hit by the car. And two, she wasn't hoping and praying and desperate for it to be Hamish. Instead, she knew exactly who it was. She picked it up and saw his name flash across the screen. Did her stomach just do a flippity flop? Her phone rang now. A giddy laughter escaped as she picked it up. I've just walked with your mother and her friends, Chase said over the phone. Now they're headed to the fabric store, and I said I could hang around until you woke up, but I thought it would be totally creepy waking up with me in your mother's kitchen. Chase? Had she heard him right? You're in my kitchen? She looked down at her raggedy Chelsea football jersey that had belonged to some random guy that Matilda had brought home one night. I thought we could hit the beach, Chase said, upbeat, like a motivational speaker in an office seminar. You're annoyingly chipper for the morning. 
It wasn't even seven. She swung her feet out from under the sheet and walked into the bathroom. Is everyone still downstairs? One woman went back to bed, and a tall woman named Biddy, who I swear has a knack for acting. Chase stopped talking suddenly as she heard Biddy in the background thanking him for the compliment with a sugar instead of his birth name. Samantha smiled. Those women flirted more than her generation. Give me 20 minutes. She ran to the bathroom, grabbed her favorite sundress, and turned on the shower. When she walked into the kitchen, she saw Chase sitting on the deck with her mother and Biddy, drinking a cup of coffee with one of Renee's infamous pastries in front of him. Good morning, she said to the group. She couldn't hold back her smile as Chase leaned back in his chair, clearly enjoying himself. I see you've met my mother and her friends. Good morning, he said, taking a drink of his coffee. I ran into them on my run this morning. She noticed his attire and realized the situation. Her cheeks burned from mortification. This had been no accidental meetup with Chase Mitchell. Did these women assault you? He laughed good-heartedly, but she saw a glimmer in Biddy's eye as she raised up her eyebrows in a double wiggle. If those women saw him running on the beach, she was sure it was no coincidence that they'd bumped into him. No, I tripped, he said, winking at her. Oh, well, we didn't mean to make that hole in the middle of your path, Biddy said back, playing along. This made Chase explode in laughter, and Evelyn shot Samantha a look of approval. Her mother was in heaven. He's adorable, Evelyn whispered as she passed Samantha a cup of coffee. Samantha sat down with them so she wouldn't swoon. All her eyes could focus on were his luscious lips, biting into the perfectly flaky crust of the raspberry turnover. He was adorable. Chase grabbed his sunglasses and popped the rest of the pastry into his mouth. I'm thinking of paddleboarding out by the house. Come with me. Paddleboarding? She wondered if such a thing would be safe in the Atlantic. I've never done it before. It's easy. Come. He stood up. I have enough for everyone. Evelyn and Biddy looked at each other. Aren't you so sweet, Biddy said, fluttering her eyelashes. I think we have fabric on our minds, but maybe another time, Evelyn said, scooting Biddy out of the kitchen. In fact, we were just on our way, weren't we, Biddy? Yes. Let us know if you're in need of any calicos, Biddy said. Ta-ta. We'll be gone for a few hours, Evelyn said. Then she lowered her voice. Do you mind just checking on Wanda? and seeing if she needs anything before you leave. Samantha nodded. Sure, Mom. See ya, Chase said, easy and casual. Bye, Samantha said, as Biddy and her mom kissed her on the cheek and left the house. Did they invite you to Christmas dinner? No, but Biddy's birthday is coming up, and they invited me to join. Chase flashed his pearly smile, reveling in the new attention. You in? She looked out at the sunny day, beyond the rolling hills of seagrass and beech roses to the endless blue. She could say yes so easily. What was one day? She could start editing tomorrow. 24 hours wasn't going to make or break her career. She might even get that kiss. But she had so much to do. Edit, write a new script, plot out the next shoot. She needed to make the intro. There were hours upon hours of work before she even started on her first video. She sighed. I have to work. She'd love to go spend a day at the beach, but if she wanted to jumpstart the rebranding of I Love Your House 2.0, then she couldn't go paddleboarding. He opened his mouth as if to argue a point, but he stopped himself, then said, What if I helped? You want to sit inside watching hours of film instead of paddleboarding? Samantha looked up at him. He shrugged. 
It sounds fun. His eyes looked like those electric neon blues and blended into the morning sky. Besides, what else do I have to do? She was about to refuse, but she thought about it. It would be nice to have another set of eyes to go through all the videos. Would you mind watching for intro scenes? I need... She pulled up her notes on her phone. I'm looking for panoramas of the beaches, the cliffs, the hills, the farm, the house. She stopped to think. I could probably use footage from last summer as well. Sure, he said. How about doing it at my place? Is it hard to bring your stuff? She shook her head. No, but it's going to be hours of just looking at videos. She wasn't sure if he truly understood the work involved. She liked to be meticulous with her editing. She thought about what she would need to bring. Her laptops and phone. Maybe a set of headphones. But that was it for equipment. Are you sure you don't want to go paddleboarding? She asked. He put his sunglasses on and said, Let me grab a shower, and I'll come back and pick you up. Chase took off down the beach in a jog. For a split second, she thought about texting Matilda, telling her about Chase, about how she'd spent all day with him yesterday and was about to spend another with him today, that she was certain she would kiss him soon, and that Chase thought she was fascinating. But then she heard a huge bang come from upstairs. She walked up to the screen door, then heard a muffled cry. Help! Wanda? She ran inside the house and up the steps, two at a time. Wanda! She opened Wanda's door and found her lying on the floor. Wanda! She ran to Wanda, who lay still on the floor. Don't move, Samantha said. She remembered what the paramedics had said to her when they had arrived at the scene. You're probably in shock, so just give your body a second. Wanda slowly moved her arms, which were shaking, touching her head. Are you bleeding? Samantha asked, not noticing any blood around her. Wanda shook her head. With Samantha's help, she sat up, her hand still holding her head. What happened? Samantha asked. Wanda looked at Samantha. Her eyes appeared to be able to focus. I got up to use the bathroom, became dizzy. I'm calling an ambulance, Samantha said, pulling out her phone. No, no. Wanda smiled, but one hand stayed on her head and the other shook. I'm fine. Samantha opened another number. Then I'm taking you myself. Chapter 17 Chase drove them to the hospital, not speeding, but definitely in a rush, which made Wanda nervous. I'm not dying, Wanda reminded him. Just have a little bump on the head. But Wanda knew it was more than just a bump on the head. The dizziness had been happening a lot more frequently. The nights longer, more painful. Her thoughts scattered, less cognizant. She squeezed the seatbelt with her hands as the handsome Hollywood actor sped through a stop sign. This isn't James Bond, you know, Wanda said now holding the oh dear handle, as she liked to call it. Her ex-husband Bill had a whole other word for it when he'd driven with her. Lately, her life reflected the oh dear handle. First Bill had left, then the divorce. Her father's death. Her mother's within six months of that. She moved into her mother's condo in Palm Springs. The same condo she dreaded visiting with Bill. She wondered if Bill had been upset that he'd divorced her before the death of her parents. He would have been able to take the condo as well. No, that wasn't fair. He would have made her sell it. Just pull up to the door, and I'll walk her in. Samantha pointed to the sliding glass doors, and Wanda wondered where they were. Will you call my husband? Wanda asked the man in the car. We're going to get you to see a doctor, Samantha said. Wanda realized her mistake and noticed Samantha's concerned face. It reminded her of Evelyn. She looked at the man, shaking her head. Sorry, I just got confused. Let me pull up to the curb and help you out of the car, he said. 
he steered the car right next to the entrance to the emergency room. As soon as the car was put into park, both Samantha and Chase jumped out and went to her door. Chase held out his hand. Wanda, do you feel all right to walk? Wanda didn't know why, but tears suddenly sprang to her eyes, and emotions toppled over out of nowhere. She tried speaking, but the words mumbled out, and she couldn't catch her breath. She didn't know what to say to this man, and she kept forgetting how she knew him. She didn't know what was wrong with her, but she was sure that as soon as she walked inside, she'd be confronted with the truth. The treatments were no longer working. I'll run inside and grab a wheelchair, Samantha said, running through the doors and coming right back. They both helped Wanda into the chair, and she practically fell into it, her heart racing, her hands shaking. She took hold of the armrests. Something felt very wrong. Call your mother, Wanda said, fear creeping into her voice as Samantha pushed her into the hospital. Check in over here, the nurse behind the counter said as they rushed inside. Wanda thought about the day she had found out about the cancer. Her regular mammogram had gone like every other time, except at the end. When Wanda had put her clothes back on, the technician asked her to get dressed and stay in the room. She hadn't paid much attention. Usually they came to talk to her about her breast density. They'd suggest she get a different version of the mammogram, a more ultrasound type test. But this time, a knock had sounded at the door. Miss Jensen? Wanda had finished buttoning her shirt as the door opened. We're going to have you wait in the office across the hall, the technician had said. Don't I get to go now? Shouldn't the results of her pathology come in the mail? Dr. Sheena would like to discuss further testing, she'd said. But her eyes had flickered away, and Wanda had needed no further explanation. Never in twenty years of mammograms had she been asked to go to a separate office. Wanda hadn't needed to go. She didn't listen to a thing that came out of the doctor's mouth. Like the teacher on Peanuts, all she'd heard was a bunch of mumbo-jumbo. Ms. Jensen, the emergency room nurse said. That's us, Samantha raised her hand. This is Ms. Jensen. Wanda went to talk, but her thoughts scrambled in her anxiety, and she let Samantha speak. Is the patient your mother? No, my aunt, Samantha said. Wanda was certain she wasn't this woman's aunt, and suddenly she couldn't really remember how she knew her. Where's Bill? She thought to herself. All right, sweetie. What's your date of birth? The nurse asked in a tone that reminded Wanda of a daycare rather than an emergency room. It's in January, Wanda said, feeling out of breath suddenly. The room felt lopsided, and she grabbed the armrests to steady herself. Samantha took Wanda's purse and dug through it to get to Wanda's wallet. Here's her information. The nurse nodded, took the license out, and wrote down the information. Okay, Ms. Jensen, we're going to check you into a room. She put a hospital bracelet around Wanda's wrist. The nurse behind the desk got up and walked around the counter, introducing himself to Wanda. My name's Jarrett, and we're going to check you in, he said, taking the handles of the wheelchair. Can I come with her? Samantha asked. The man nodded. Samantha turned to Chase. I'm okay. You should go home. Go for that paddleboard ride. I'll stay until your mom and everybody can get here. He looked around the room, nodding to a free chair in the corner. Wanda suddenly felt cold sitting there as the man pushed her through the large security doors that opened automatically. Chase waved to Samantha as Jarrett pushed Wanda through the doors. Take care, Wanda. Even when the nurse laid warm blankets on top of her, Wanda still felt cold. When her eyes weren't closed, she kept them on the ceiling, thinking about the house in Palm Springs. She had to send a cleaning lady. Bill would need it cleaned before he removed all her things. He would get everything if she died at this point. That's when Samantha reached under the covers and grabbed her hand. 
Wanda's emotions came rushing back. Tears ran down the sides of her face and onto the pillow beneath her head, into her fuzzy white hair that no longer felt like her hair. Mom and Biddy are on their way, Samantha said, now holding Wanda's hand with both of hers. But Wanda, who had never even held Bill's hand, didn't want her to let go. They're bringing some clothes and your paperwork. She looked to the ceiling again, tired, cold, scared, just like the first time in that office when she had learned of the cancer. But at that time, she had been alone. Can I get you water? Samantha asked. Some more blankets? Wanda shook her head, holding on to Samantha's hand. Samantha suddenly jumped up and grabbed her phone. Mom, we're in the last room on the right. I think it's 12. When Samantha hung up the phone, she returned her hands under the sheet to Wanda's shaking hand. They're coming in right now. Wanda closed her eyes. No, she thought to herself. It wasn't like the time before. Wanda, Evelyn and Biddy, both came into the room like a gust of wind off the ocean surface. What's going on? When did you start not feeling well? Wanda didn't answer. The words couldn't seem to form in her mouth. Her mind went back to Bill and the house. She needed to change her will. Samantha started talking to the women, but her voice sounded muffled. Wanda could hear them talking about her, but only bits and pieces, as if she were bobbing up and down out of the water. I heard this big bang. Then she'd go under the water again, the words muffled, Evelyn and Biddy's response inaudible. Has a doctor come in? She'd come back up. Biddy rested her hand on Wanda's shoulder and stroked her arm. It's okay. You're going to be okay. Samantha loosened her grip for a second, but Wanda didn't let go. Not yet. Not until the doctors told her exactly what she dreaded most. Ms. Jensen? A young male doctor walked into the room, looking at the crowd of women. Wanda didn't speak, just waited, holding Samantha's hand, feeling Biddy's gentle rub of her thumb on her back. Evelyn sat beside her. No, this wasn't at all like the last time. Ms. Jensen... The doctor began talking about having Wanda admitted and waiting for an ambulance to bring her on the ferry. But she heard none of it. We're going to set you up with an IV. She looked to Evelyn, who sat with a notebook, writing furiously on the pad. To Biddy, who kept nodding with the doctor. Then to Samantha, who didn't hide her fear. I'm so sorry, Wanda said. She began sobbing, unable to hold herself together. I'm so sorry. Everyone in the room, including the doctor, looked distressed by her reaction. But she couldn't help it. Wanda was sorry. She had been nothing but a burden, like Bill had said. She leached off everyone else and gave nothing. She wasn't supposed to end up this way. She was supposed to have her second chance. Martha's vineyard was supposed to be her second chance. Now, Bill would get everything after all. I'm going to suggest Ms. Jensen be admitted today. Wanda closed her eyes, everyone's words floating around her. A beeping pulse drowned out their conversation. A rattle of curtains swiped behind her as she heard wheels being rolled across the linoleum. In another room, she could hear a woman cough. Ms. Jensen? A strange female voice said. I'm going to put in an IV in this hand. Wanda opened her eyes as Samantha stood up, letting go of Wanda's hand, which made her body tense up more. But that's when Evelyn reached underneath the blankets and took her other hand in hers. We got you, Evelyn said in Wanda's ear. We got you. Chapter 18 Chase rose from his seat as soon as Dahlia called. Hey, he said, heading to the exit. Hey, Daddy, Dahlia said. He could hear others around her. How's the internship, he asked. 
Dahlia somehow managed to earn an internship at a charity organization in Boston, which meant he paid for her to work for free and stay in one of the most overpriced cities in the country. It's amazing! She exaggerated her syllables, dragging them out like a teenager, but then in the same breath said, Today I worked on our grant to secure funds for the Lindell Research Project. He remembered her talking about the project, something to do with mental health and recovery, but he couldn't remember the ins and outs. As he walked out of the emergency room, the summer heat slapped him, knocking the air out of him with a heavy humidity. He looked up as grayish-green clouds blew across the sky. He could smell rain, even though the ground was dry. An ambulance sounded its siren and pulled out of the hospital, making him jump onto the sidewalk. Where are you? Dahlia asked. I'm at the emergency room, he said, but added quickly, I'm fine, it's a friend of mine. Who's your friend? Dahlia asked. The last time his daughter had come to visit, she had brought six of her friends from school to hang out with on the beach and tan. He loved having her and her friends, but he and Dahlia had spent zero time together. She might have noticed he had no friends on Martha's Vineyard, that his only friends were his contractor and the hardware store guy. Other than that, Chase Mitchell, the washed-out Hollywood B-lister, had no friends. He went to dinner at the wharf by himself. Women would recognize him, some would hit on him, but none of them interested him. He hadn't minded either. He was happy sitting by himself reading a book. But now, as he stood outside the emergency room, watching a woman be cared for by her dearest and closest friends, the urge to see his daughter overwhelmed him. Someone who's fighting cancer, he said. He had heard a bit about Wanda's story on his walk that morning. Wanda hadn't looked that well on the walk, which had been the reason he bumped into the three women taking a break and sitting on the rocks when he ran past. Aw, Daddy, that's super sad, Dahlia said, empathy in her voice. Will they be okay? He kicked a piece of loose mulch back into a garden bed. I don't know. Then he changed the subject. How about you come to the beach house this weekend, just you? I'm pretty busy this weekend. Dahlia started to list off all the events she had planned with her friends. She seemed to have no idea it happened to be Father's Day weekend, something she had never forgotten before. I was thinking of coming the 4th. Liv said she and her boyfriend want to see the island. He scoffed at her non-commitment. Dahlia, you can come to your father's house for Father's Day. He had wanted Dahlia to meet Samantha. He had brought a few women around before, but none of them were around long enough to defrost Dahlia's icy personality toward them. Somehow, though, he knew Samantha would be different. Please, Dahlia. He wanted her to meet her. I don't ask for much. He could hear a heavy sigh, and then, like he had hoped, she said, Fine, but I will only be able to come for like a day. Fine, he said. He couldn't hold back his smile from his small victory. Spending time with Dahlia had been harder and harder these days, even after moving across the country to be closer. When the house sold in the Hollywood Hills, he hadn't said goodbye to anyone, not even Grace. He might have if she had returned his calls, but she had been somewhere on location and not home anyway. Thank you. He looked forward to showing Dahlia the farmhouse what had been done since her last visit. But mostly, he wanted to know Dahlia's opinion, because before now, if Dahlia wouldn't give him her blessing about a woman, he wouldn't continue a relationship, no matter how much he liked the woman. He had always hated his stepfathers. They never cared about his well-being, always wanting his mother's full attention, never willing to share. They never tried to take on the role of father unless it fit the narrative. So he promised never to do that to Dahlia. Well, I hope your friend will be okay, Dahlia said, still the sweet kid she always was. God, he hoped they got along. He hoped Dahlia would see how wonderful Samantha was as a person. I'll see you this weekend then, he said. Love you, baby girl.
Love you too, Daddy. He stayed outside, stuffing his phone into his pocket, while watching Samantha make her way through the door. How's Wanda? He asked as soon as she came close enough. Her face looked worn with worry. She's being admitted. You okay? He asked and opened his arms. She came right to him, letting him wrap his arms around her whole body and hold her against him. It felt nice, real. That's when he felt her body start to shake, and he realized she was crying. He didn't say anything as she wept in his arms. He just rubbed her back in long, slow strokes, up and down, softly keeping the pace like the waves along the coast. The treatment doesn't look like it's working, she said through sniffles. She isn't well at all, and I've been crying to her about boy problems. She sobbed hard, her body shaking as she tried to control her breath. Boy problems? Was it that guy Hamish? Was she still hung up on him? I could tell she wasn't doing well, but I said nothing. She dropped her head on his chest. He kept stroking, but now his mind went to Hamish. Do you want to stay here? I can sit with you. She shook her head. I should go home wait there. Renee's going to leave work soon. Let me drive you back, he offered. She nodded. Thank you so much for everything. Of course, he said. She pulled out a tissue from her purse's pocket and blew her nose. I must look awful. He looked at her, her face red and splotchy, her eyes swollen and bloodshot from crying. You look beautiful. She smiled, hiccuping a breath. I just don't want her to never come back home. She looked up. Oh, look, it's Renee, Mateo, and Charlie. He didn't know the severity of Wanda's disease or prognosis. He hadn't even known her more than a few minutes. But something inside him prayed to God that he'd give this woman, who had all these people rallying around her, a second shot. Where's George? Samantha asked as soon as her sister came close. With Harper, Renee said, and instantly he could feel Samantha stiffen. We're headed back to the house. Want me to watch him? Samantha asked. Renee shook her head. No, he's fine with Harper. Oh, Samantha said it's slow. Renee's chest lifted with a deep inhalation. I just meant he's happy where he is with Harper. Besides, I thought you were here with Wanda. Chase stepped back, distancing himself from the sisters. Mateo followed suit, reaching his hand out as they continued to talk. It sure was lucky that you guys were at the house when she fell, Mateo said. Samantha heard her fall, Chase said, looking at the sisters, who were no longer arguing but deep in heavy conversation. Do they fight like that all the time? Yep, Mateo looked at them. They'll fight for a second and then... The women were hugging now. They're good, Mateo shrugged. Do you have sisters? Chase shook his head. He had stepsisters that found it necessary to only remember him when they needed money. He had stopped taking their calls after a few years of the same old plea. He promised he'd help anyone once, after that, they were on their own. Do you enjoy working with your brothers? Chase had never seen them bicker like Samantha and her sister. Mateo nodded. Couldn't do it without them. Chase felt envious of Mateo's answer. He hadn't questioned his situation at all, not even a slight hesitation. You ready? Samantha said. Yeah, sure. He could feel the sweat dripping down his back from standing outside for so long. Nice seeing you, Renee, Mateo. You too, they said, heading inside to the hospital. He pointed to where he'd parked his vehicle, wondering if he should assume they weren't going to go through with filming. She probably didn't want to do much of anything after her morning. I'm sorry you had to hang out at a hospital all day, she said as they got into the car. Her voice trembled. 
Why don't we go back and look through the film at your place, Chase said. Harper's there with the baby. It'll be hard to hear, she said. We can go back to my place, he said then. I should stay at the house in case someone needs me. Something felt slightly off, and Chase couldn't put his finger on it. Of course, Wanda being admitted into the hospital had upset her. Don't make this about you, he thought to himself. I could pick up dinner for all of you. She looked at him, her expression so different, and doubt flooded through him. She took in a big, long breath. When I lost my dad, it just happened suddenly. His heart dropped. I'm sorry you lost your dad. With Wanda, I just got so scared, she said, tears brimming on her eyelids. I was so scared. He wrinkled his brow. Really? Because to me, you kept your cool the whole time. He had been impressed at how Samantha had handled herself in an emergency. I didn't look like someone freaking out. She wiped her tears. You were very helpful. He shook his head. You calmed her. He turned in his seat, facing her. Her eyes slanted down as she played with her tissue. Maybe that's what you were feeling. You absorbed her fears. She looked up into his eyes and made a half smile. Maybe. He tapped the wheel, trying to read the situation, trying to infer her words and mood and thoughts. Why don't I take you back to your mom's, he said, not pressing the subject anymore. He turned the engine on and fastened his seatbelt. They drove in silence, a faint smell of Wanda's perfume lingering in the car. When he pulled up to the house, he had no idea what to do or say. Thanks again for all your help, she said. She appeared shaken, for sure, but something else seemed to be bothering her. He put the truck into park. Why don't we go through the film, get something to eat, and play with George and Harper while we wait for news? She sat there, thinking about it. His heart started pumping with anxiety the longer she stayed quiet. I could go home, too, he said quickly. She looked to him, not saying anything. His heart sped up even more. But then, in the front seat, she wrapped her arms around him and kissed him. Chapter 19 Renee stood on the porch, her stomach twisting as she waited for Marty to arrive with the mail. When she heard the familiar rumble of his engine, she ran off the porch the second Marty pulled up in his jeep. Morning, Renee. Marty leafed through the mail as she came toward him. What's going on? He looked up from the stack of mail, and his face changed when he saw the look in her eyes. His face turned white. What's happened? It's Wanda. Renee let out a long breath, then as calmly as possible she relayed everything that had happened the day before. Is she okay? His eyes immediately watered. A lump swelled in her throat at his sudden emotion. Renee could hardly look at Marty. Wanda may have broken up with Marty, but Renee believed he deserved to know. He still cared about her and still loved her. It wouldn't be right not to let him know, Renee argued in her head. She shook her head. They think the treatment isn't working any longer. I wish you all would have called me. Marty handed her the packet of mail and then started the mail truck. Maybe they should have called. But Wanda didn't want them to, and Renee felt like a slime ball going behind her back right now. She's at the hospital on the island, but they're transporting her to Boston this afternoon. The women had created shifts for the hospital. Biddy sat with her now. He nodded. Thanks, Renee. I know she said those things, but she doesn't mean it. Renee played with the strings of her hoodie. I think she just wasn't able to imagine putting you through this. When Renee had gone into Wanda's room to grab clothes for the hospital, Wanda's whole wardrobe had been packed and boxed up with a Palm Springs address. This makes a lot of sense, actually, Marty said, looking at his bin of mail. 
The past few weeks, she's been going through something and wasn't telling me anything. I'm heading right over. Renee waved as Marty pulled out of the drive, watching him as he left, wondering if she had done the right thing. Charlie always told her to listen to her gut. Right now, her gut felt sick and selfish. She felt sick because she didn't know telling Marty about Wanda had been the right thing to do. She wanted her to have one last chance at happiness. Wanda deserved to be loved. Renee felt selfish because she and Mateo had only a couple months to the wedding, and she wanted Wanda to be in attendance. She couldn't imagine having a wedding while Wanda sat in the hospital, or worse. Renee had even imagined the women standing there with her mom and sister. Wanda and Biddy had become like a set of aunts and her best friends, all in one. It's just us rose women, Renee said to her mother and sister as she came into the kitchen. When was the last time it had just been the three of them? She grabbed the video monitor so she could watch as baby George took his morning nap. It is just us, Samantha said, looking around at them. It feels weird, Renee said. What's going to happen when Wanda goes to Boston? Samantha asked. We'll have to see what the doctors say, Evelyn said. The delirium is a sign of the UTI infection. But the dizziness, the fatigue, her lack of appetite. Do you think she was planning on leaving? Renee asked. She had shown her mother Wanda's room when she'd come back from the hospital. Everything had been boxed and packed up. It looked as though Wanda was leaving. Evelyn shrugged. I don't know. But I think she's scared she'll be a burden to us. She's not, Renee said right away. Why would Wanda think that? I don't know, Evelyn sighed. Things are starting to make sense, though. She had been behaving differently. Renee had noticed as well. She wasn't eating. She was moody, irritated, forgetful. Do you think she'll have to stay in the hospital long? Samantha asked. Renee rested her elbows on the table and dropped her hands onto the wood surface. She stretched her fingers on the cool surface of the wood extending them as far as her skin would allow. It looks like the chemotherapy is no longer working, Evelyn said. Which means she's going to need to choose another treatment plan. The doctors believe she could be a good candidate for immunotherapy, but it has side effects. Another option is palliative care. What's that? Samantha asked. Evelyn frowned. It's when someone chooses to stop treatments and live out the cancer. The three of them sat in silence. Like, give up? Samantha said. Renee clenched her jaw, trying to hold back her comment. Samantha didn't know better. She didn't know how hard Wanda had been fighting this past year. It's not about giving up, Renee said before she could stop herself. Therapy is hard on their bodies. Look at what Wanda's going through all the time. Renee had never been around someone dying before. They had lost her father, but it had been a heart attack. She had never watched death slowly take someone. Death played so unfairly, taking people all kinds of different ways. Some died quickly without even knowing. One minute they were living, the next they weren't. But Wanda had to face death day after day, month after month. The mental struggle of acceptance and fear and anger had to be just as hard as the treatment. The burden of time hanging over you. The not knowing how long, how much suffering, and how difficult it would be. I didn't mean it like that. Samantha slouched in the chair, crossing her arms against her chest, reminding Renee of when she was little and didn't get her way. What I need you two to do is think about whether you want to stay through this, Evelyn said, taking back the conversation. You know you're always welcome to stay, but Wanda will be staying here if the time does come. We're here to help, Samantha said. Renee grunted in her throat. What's that, Renee? Samantha said. Well, 
Are you sticking around? Renee didn't want to pressure her. Matteo said he heard you mentioned you'd be going back to London in a couple of weeks. Well, that was before everything, Samantha said. I have nowhere to go. What about New Zealand? Evelyn asked. Samantha pushed her phone out in front of her. My career is absolutely dead. She dropped her head back. My publicist has officially dropped me via email. My fans want to see the rest of Hamish's castle, but I can't go back. Now I've got this hot guy that's totally too good for me who thinks I'm fascinating. But only because of this vlog, which is a complete fail. Renee shot a look across the table to Evelyn. Then she said, Your vlog is not a fail. Oh, really? Samantha sat up again. When was the last time you watched my videos? Renee didn't want to go tit for tat. But when she went to defend herself, she realized she hadn't watched more than a few, if that. She was busy. She had a career. A child. She didn't have time to watch all her videos. But maybe if she had, she'd have known why Samantha had left London in such a hurry. And why the car incident hadn't been what broke her, but the man who'd been standing there. You don't even let me watch your kid, Samantha added in under her breath. That's not true, Renee said, but she didn't think of asking Samantha to watch George. Okay, fine. I didn't want to hurt your feelings, but you're a complete stranger to him. I'm his aunt. Samantha pushed her chair back as though she was offended and was about to get up. He's a baby, you know. He was fine with me the other day. You act scared around him, Renee said, but that wasn't a good excuse. I'm sorry, Samantha huffed. It doesn't matter. What's going on with your vlog? Evelyn asked, bringing the conversation back. I bet Chase Mitchell will bring back viewers. I don't know, Samantha said. I just think people are over me. Why don't you do a segment on the bakery again? Evelyn suggested. Because I've already done that. My viewers want something different. They want more than just, hey, look, I'm bringing you back to my sister's place again. The farmhouse is great, Renee said. Yes, and so is Chase and Mateo, Samantha said. Renee was certain two very attractive men in her shot would help since most of her viewers were middle-aged housewives who wanted to dream of living like her. Go back to the basics, Renee said. Like when you first started your videos. Samantha rolled her eyes. You mean the only episodes you watched? When was the last time... Renee stopped herself before things got even more heated. She had been in Samantha's exact place a year ago, and she hadn't forgotten how down she felt about herself. No job, living with her mom. You could do cool spots that people should visit. Like that episode in Paris. That was amazing. You mean the one when I found that dressmaker who made costumes? Samantha tilted her head up, looking to the ceiling. But there's nothing around here on this island. You know what your father would say, right? Evelyn said. Samantha shrugged. No. What would Daddy say? When one door closes, another opens, Evelyn said. Take this as an opportunity to reevaluate. She motioned her hands between her and Renee. We reevaluated and made changes. You bought a beach house and Renee bought a bakery, Samantha laughed sarcastically. I'm totally broke. What Mom is trying to say is that you should figure out if your vlog is what you want to continue to do. And if so, what are you going to do to get it back on track? Renee sounded like a life coach. But as cheesy as her words were, it was the truth. What do you want, Samantha? Chapter 20 A year ago, Samantha had wanted nothing more than to be at the castle in Hamish's arms. Four years ago, she had wanted to be anywhere but with her family after her dad died. 
Five years ago, she had wanted to become an architect, work in London, and finish her master's at Cambridge. She'd wanted to marry a man who looked like Hugh Grant, a guy who didn't know how attractive he was, but looked great in a suit and glasses. They would have talked about the philosophy while flipping through page six to see what was written about their friends. But then her father had died. Samantha had gone home, and for that whole summer she'd sat in the dark of his study while her mother pretended nothing had happened. Renee had taken off back to her life in Chicago. No one would have expected her to stay. It had been Samantha their Aunt Carol had pulled aside at the funeral and asked to watch over her mother. It was Samantha whose life didn't seem to matter as much as Renee's. But as the weeks carried on, and Evelyn had kept her father's things everywhere, as though he might come home to collect his readers on the nightstand or his watch from the kitchen counter, she'd decided to stay. So Samantha had skipped her graduation from Rhode Island School of Design, backed out of her internship at an architect firm in Washington, D.C., and withdrew her application to graduate school. Samantha stood in front of her mother's sink, looking out at the view. Rolling hills of seagrass waved in the wind like ballerinas. Her stomach tightened at the idea of Wanda being transported to Boston yesterday and never returning to the island. Samantha's thoughts kept spinning around in her head. One second she worried about Wanda, the next about her career, and the next, Chase. She concluded that she loved houses. She loved filming and talking architecture, but she didn't love the hours of editing, watching and rewatching videos, finding the perfect clip. Hours and hours of work for a short video. Then she had to brand herself, update her website, set up advertisement, keep social on all networks, and also follow others. And for what? Even her fans had left her when she got hit by that car. Even if she did make videos with Chase, she'd have to find a new audience. Otherwise, they'd probably only be watching for shock value, or to see if she was stalking Chase. They'd probably say cruel things in the comments. And she liked Chase. A lot. She didn't want to travel all over anymore. But what else could she do? How was the shoot the other day with Chase and Mateo? Harper asked as she walked into the kitchen. Samantha almost forgot Harper had been at the house. Oh, hey. Samantha walked away from the window. It went great, actually. Harper smiled bubbly and bright. That's great. They stood there, looking at each other. Where's George? Samantha asked. Renee had said he would be with Harper. We just got home from errands, and he'd fallen asleep in the car, so I just left him in the front hall to sleep. Harper peeked back down the hall. He loves his car seat. As Samantha looked in the direction of George, she felt guilty giving Renee such a hard time. Renee may have been sorry for saying George didn't know Samantha, but Samantha didn't know George. She would have never known how to put him into the car seat, let alone know to just leave him to sleep. Do you think I could hang out with you guys today? Samantha asked. And Harper looked up, her eyebrows raised in surprise. Sure. He doesn't really know me yet, but maybe if I hang around with the both of you, and he trusts you. Samantha wondered if she sounded lame. That sounds great, Harper said. I was about to make myself a big cup of matcha tea. Want some? Samantha had no idea what kind of tea Harper spoke of, but she'd try it. Sure. Harper placed the kettle on the stove. Have you talked to your mom since she and Biddy went to Boston? Samantha shook her head. Not yet. Harper leaned against the counter and tapped her fingers. So? What's going on with the new guy? Who, Chase? Samantha knew, but didn't really want to talk about it, afraid that she'd somehow ruin things. We've only just started seeing each other. What happened with the man in Scotland? Samantha shot a look at Harper. Does everyone know? She shrugged. My dad and I watched the videos. Samantha took a step back. 
You watched my videos? They're very good, Harper said, suddenly serious. Thanks. Samantha could feel her cheeks warm from the compliment. It wasn't that Samantha wanted to talk about herself, or have everyone she knew watch her videos, but just having Harper's acknowledgement of her work felt like everything. Congratulations on your book, by the way, Samantha said back, now feeling the need to be just as nice. It was really good as well. Suspicion ran across Harper's face. Now I know you're a liar. What? Samantha had read it, and she did like it. Maybe not love, but Harper could write. You read my novel about a soothsayer in the 21st century? Harper raised an eyebrow. When her mother had dumped the book on her, she'd almost tossed it. Adding a hardcover to her already stuffed luggage had been a hassle. But because she knew Evelyn would quiz her, she read it. And it was good. It was really good. Samantha's mouth flipped into a grin. When you killed off Eve, I bawled my eyes out. The guy next to me on the plane had the flight attendant check in on me. Harper's eyes widened in a new disbelief. Really? You thought it was good? Oh my God, I can't tell you how much I needed to hear that right now. Harper dropped her head down and then flung it back up again, her hair flying behind her. I've got writer's block, and I don't know what to do about it. Oh no, Samantha said. Have you talked to my mom? The tea kettle whistled, and Harper moved to the stove, turning off the burner and pouring the water into the mugs. Kinda, but things have been so busy around here, Harper said. Samantha nodded. Her mom had been busy. She had been finishing a book. She had been with Charlie a lot, going back and forth for doctor's appointments and hanging out with the girls. Evelyn is always busy. Best to catch her mid-morning after her first writing session, Samantha suggested. I always used to hit her up for money before dinner, so if you're ever looking for a raise on that assistant gig... It's my only gig as of right now, Harper muttered. What do you think is holding you back? Samantha knew nothing about writing or writer's block, but she did know her mother had suffered writing issues after her father's death. I'm in love with someone. Harper said it like a confession. Who? It's no one, really. Harper waved her off. I'm just stuck in this rut. Is it that guy, Gerard? Harper twisted a loose strand of hair around her finger. No, it's no one you know. What's the problem? Samantha asked. He's in love with someone else, Harper said. She scooped out a teaspoon of honey and handed it to Samantha. It's locally sourced. Does he know you're in love with him? Samantha asked. Harper sipped carefully, blowing, then trying to sip, then blowing again. No, it's complicated. I had my shot with him and I chose to pass. Oh. Samantha wondered if that's how Hamish felt, a lover's regret. Did he regret marrying Penelope? Did he regret getting her pregnant, knowing that's what she wanted? What made you change your mind? I always loved him. I just couldn't see it then, you know? Harper looked miserable. I'm sorry. It's really hard. Samantha almost went into a story when she heard George talking in the hall. Did you hear that? Harper stretched her neck, listening. Then she smiled at Samantha. He's usually in a really good mood when he wakes from a nap. Why don't you go get him? He'll start to cry, Samantha said. I'll be right here, Harper said, sipping her tea. Samantha gave a nod, then walked quietly down the hall. She made it halfway when he noticed her. He froze in his car seat. Except for the steady sucking rhythm of his pacifier. His arm extended out, and he pointed his sausage finger at her. He hummed a few words, and she decided that was his way of welcoming her forward. Good morning, she said softly and high, as though she were singing a song. 
George mumbled some more through his pacifier, still pointing his finger at her. Then he jerked to one side to look behind her and mumbled some more. A crease formed between his eyes, and his little face turned a bit more red. Oh, supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, she started off soft and slow. Even though the sound of it sounds something, something scrumptious. He dropped his hand but gave her the death stare like an FBI agent. So she stopped. He removed his pacifier and screamed, Hot! George pointed his finger at her again and mumbled like a mother would after telling her burnt child not to touch the stove. Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious! She sang again. His arms and legs jerked up and down. Ba 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 ba. She couldn't remember the words, but she made her voice as peppy as possible and made the most animated face, just like her dad would have done, and got closer. Hi, George. He sat there, watching her. Do you mind if I pick you up and we can go see Harper? Samantha asked. It was a trick she had learned from her father before her first babysitting gig. He told her, as a doctor, he never touched a child without permission, even babies. George sucked on his pacifier. Here I come, she said, slowly walking to him. Auntie Sam is here to pick you up. She bent down, unstrapping the seat belts that seemed to be everywhere on the tiny little seat. Holy Moses! she said, trying to wrangle the buckle in between his legs. Once it broke away, she reached under his back with both hands, feeling his sweaty baby body, and instantly smelled a smelly baby diaper. He didn't fight her as she took him into her arms. He reached toward her and pointed her toward the kitchen. Let's change that diaper first, Samantha said. After a quick change and a tickle fest, George happily bounced on Samantha's hip as they walked into the kitchen. Harper stared intently at her phone. What's the matter? Samantha asked. I forgot I had this huge deadline. Harper's face fell and turned white. I have to get my first three chapters done by the end of the week. Her forehead creased. I'm never going to finish in time. Go now. Start while the kettle's hot, Samantha said. She swayed back and forth, with George perfectly content on her hip. I can watch George. Go and write, seriously. I don't even know what to write. Harper had much bigger problems if that was the case. What if we help? Samantha looked to George. What is it about? It's a sequel to my first book, Harper said. It's taking place five years in the future, and the main focus will be on Michael. Really? Did he end up going into the military? Harper nodded. And he runs into Albert in this nowhere town outside of this no-name bar. What's Albert doing now, five years later? Harper went into her first scene, which was set in a bar in a dinky little town outside of Boston. She goes into detail about where each character would be in this new future setting. Albert's going to be running away from Flora. Oh, my. Samantha's eyes widened. That sounds good. Do you think it's too much? Harper asked. I keep going back and forth on Flora's journey for this book. Samantha thought about the idea of planning one's journey. She had tried so hard to plan hers, only to see a car smash it to pieces. Her phone buzzed, and she saw Chase's name on the screen. What are you doing? He texted. Babysitting. She sent a selfie of her and George. Want some company? She looked at Harper, who scribbled in a notebook, while talking something out, but not loud enough where Samantha could hear. I'd love some. Not even a half hour later, Samantha and George sat on the beach under an umbrella with Chase. You have it all, she said, looking at the red wagon full of toys and beach paraphernalia. What can I say? I love the beach he said. But he shook his head. This stuff was included with my rental house. 
George didn't seem to mind whose toys they were as long as they made their way to his mouth. Ew, George, yucky, Samantha said, making a face at him. But as the sand crept into his mouth, he made his own face of disgust. See, sand is yucky. Under the umbrella, Samantha sat looking down Sugar Beach. Colorful umbrellas dotted the shore with groups of people around them. The golden sand beach looked more like raw sugar rather than the white refined stuff the name alluded to. Her mother seemed to believe it was the feel of sugar, not the color, but she'd argue that point. She picked up a handful and let the warm sand fall between her fingers, thinking about the past few days. Chase dug a hole with George, then made a pile and let him smash it with his hands. Do you miss the baby stage? Samantha asked, not trying to pry, but curious. I mean, I can't even imagine having a baby, and you have a grown daughter who's attending Harvard. Samantha had to imagine Chase's daughter was quite the young lady to attend an Ivy League like that. She had heard about it her whole life from her dad. It's just so fast, he let out a sigh. One minute you have this little girl who needs you for everything, and the next you're begging her to hang out with you. Samantha would give anything to spend more time with her dad. You want to tell me what you're thinking right now? She jerked back from the direct question. I'm a complete fraud. She threw up her hand at her mother's palatial beach house. None of this is mine. I've got like 12 cents to my name. I'm living in my mom's guest bedroom. My career is in the toilet. I'm going to have to build up an audience again to get my vlog rolling, and I don't even know if I want it back. I can't do what I did four years ago to build an audience. I don't have it in me. She looked up, feeling especially vulnerable. And I have this amazing guy who thinks I'm fascinating, when it's all smoke and mirrors. You are absolutely fascinating. Chase shifted in his spot over the beach blanket, with George looking up at them. Who isn't smoke and mirrors? My whole career was smoke and mirrors. I pretended to be this glamorous, cool guy. But I liked math and science stuff. I liked playing in the sand and surfing. Not going to award shows and hitting every trending restaurant. I like you, Samantha. I even think I might be falling for you but I'm falling for this witty woman who'd rag on a movie star. The woman who'd watch her sister's baby in a heartbeat. The woman who'd bring a sick woman to the hospital and hold her hand. The creative genius at my house was not smoke and mirrors. You really do have a passion for what you do. She wrapped her arms around her knees and hugged them, resting her chin on top. I love when I can talk about houses and design. But after, when I have hours of film to go through and edits and reshoots, I just... She sighed, making a half smile. I'm sorry. I tend to make things about me. Stop. Chase scoffed at her. My career washed up before I knew what a 401k was. The industry had no use for me, and dropped me by the time I was your age. I had a daughter who needed stability, but I could hardly afford a two-bedroom apartment in Hollywood. He started digging in the sand again with George. She waited for the perfect piece of advice, almost as if he were his character, Jess, who seemed to solve all of the gang's problems. But he didn't finish how everything worked out. So, Samantha said. So I learned another trade. He filled a bucket with sand and smacked the top of it hard. Her heart dropped a bit. She had thought he'd tell her to keep going, don't give up. Was this little speech encouraging her to find something else? George pounded his little hands on top of the bucket. Are you ready to dump the bucket? He leaned down to be at eye level with George. Where should I dump it? George pointed to the same spot the bucket before had been dumped. She pieced together his story. Washed up career, no money with a child. That's all well and good, 
but I don't have another trade. What about your graphic design degree? He said. He pulled up the bucket, leaving a sand tower for George, who instantly knocked it down. Oh, no, you're too powerful. God, he reminded her of her dad in so many ways. First, he got along with everyone, even the bucket if he had to, the kids especially. The way he played with George, encouraging, yet responsive and responsible. She shook her head. I hated working in a cubicle on a computer. Didn't you say you wanted to try architecture? He asked. She took in a breath. He had listened to her. I couldn't. She shook her head. Why not? He asked. He and George waited for her to answer. Because. There were so many reasons. She didn't have the money. She didn't have the requirements, probably. Didn't she need to take calculus or something like that? Wasn't she bordering on too old to be a student? Where? She made a face. There's only a community college on the island. You live near Beantown, the biggest college city, he said. That's a really big jump in careers, she said. When I lost my manager, I didn't know what to do. He had handled all my money. My mom forced me to take classes in money management, stocks, and investments. I learned about trading and portfolios. He laughed to himself. Here I was, coming off this Hollywood heartbreak, and I was taking community classes with these other kids my age who asked for autographs. It was humbling, to say the least. The sad truth was that it wouldn't matter what kind of college it was, because she had no clue what she was doing. She looked at George. I don't know what I want to do. She wiped sand off his chin with her thumb. Maybe you should be asking yourself what you want to do next. What? George said, pointing his chubby finger at her. But whatever it involved, she realized she never wanted George to forget who she was again. Chapter 21 Evelyn sat next to Wanda in her bed. This time in the hospital felt different than when she had been admitted in February. This felt different because Wanda seemed so different. Evelyn didn't want to say it out loud, in case she was being insensitive, but she worried about Wanda's mental health. Daytime television is the worst, Wanda said. Oh, I don't know. Give me some The Young and the Restless any day. Really? Wanda looked surprised. You like soap operas? Evelyn looked at the time. Back in Minnesota, The Young and the Restless started at 11, but on the island it started at 12.30. Do you ever watch General Hospital? Of course, Wanda said. Evelyn picked up the remote control and flipped the stations, and there on the screen showed Port Charles. I used to watch this with my mother, Wanda said. Me too, and my grandmother. Evelyn thought about her sister Carol, her mother and grandmother, all having an afternoon break in front of the television watching The Young and the Restless. We loved soaps. Watched them all. It's why I like romance so much. Wanda smiled. I never really watched them after that. I like the nighttime dramas. The whodunit. Evelyn liked reading a mystery. She even wrote a few cozy pieces for a series once. But her brand was romance, fate, and happily ever afters. The two sat in silence, watching the television as new characters Evelyn didn't recognize argued in a cafe. Things had been strangely tense between her and Wanda. I'm sorry I treated you like a child, Evelyn said. After Wanda got upset at the clinic, Evelyn put together all the tiny little comments Wanda had made, like clues on a scavenger hunt, and figured out what she was trying to say. Yes, well, I acted like a child, Wanda said. I should have talked about what was going on. I guess I just didn't want to face it. Wanda looked at the television, her face hard. 
but her eyes quivered. She took in a deep breath. What if immunotherapy doesn't work? Evelyn could see the fear in her eyes. Then there's always another round of chemo. I think I need to hire someone to put my affairs in order. I can do that. Evelyn didn't want to talk about hiring a lawyer and getting affairs in order. She wanted to tell her friend that everything would be okay. That she wrote characters that survived. She wrote and believed in happily ever afters. But instead, she took Wanda's hand in hers. Whatever you need. What happened with Marty? Evelyn asked. No one really pushed the subject with Wanda, especially Evelyn. Wanda shrugged. Why buy a car if it isn't going to last? Because you're not a car, Evelyn shook her head. I thought you really liked him. I do. Wanda turned her head, looking out the window. Have you ever disliked being around someone because they remind you of everything you don't have? Evelyn thought about it. I guess. Marty is that for me. Marty? I spent all those years with the man who never really loved me, Wanda said. I spent years trying to earn his love and hold up an agreement he never followed through with. I spent all those years that I can never get back. Evelyn blinked, trying to remember what Charlie had said about listening, not reacting. Evelyn wanted to tell Wanda she could have a happily ever after. Marty might be the man who could give her that. But she squeezed her thumb into her palm, rubbing hard against her skin, and listened. Even if Marty really enjoyed my company, he hasn't seen the real me, the one who snaps at the ones she loves, the one who can barely get through the day, the one who's stuck in medical offices and hospitals and... Wanda stopped, out of breath. She closed her eyes and shook slightly back and forth. Evelyn noticed how the rest of Wanda's body stayed motionless under the blankets. She didn't shift to get comfortable or move to adjust. It was as though her body accepted the illness's fate. How could Evelyn be a friend in this moment? How could she support someone going through the hardest moment of her life? She'd have to do something she'd made her characters do during her story's climax. She'd have to be vulnerable. When George died, I overshared, Evelyn said, remembering her friends who had shied away from the uncomfortableness of death. People didn't want to hear about the feelings from grief. Wanda didn't speak, staying still in her hospital bed. It wasn't until I met you that I felt like someone actually listened to me about George, Evelyn said, thinking back to the ferry ride to Martha's Vineyard. I wouldn't be here without you. Having you as my friend is not a burden, but a blessing. Wanda looked at Evelyn, her eyes watering. I'm so angry. Evelyn took Wanda's hand in both of hers. I am too. I feel cheated, Wanda's voice trembled. I feel like I just started my life, and now it's over. Tears fell from Evelyn's eyes, but she didn't wipe them away. She focused on Wanda. Instinct told her to comfort Wanda by being positive. Tell her not to think life is over. She had to fight. She still had this new therapy. It could work. But instead, she listened. If I die, Phil's first thought would be relief. He would no longer have to deal with me. Wanda pressed her eyes shut. I've always been a burden. Evelyn continued to hold Wanda's hands, feeling her friend's pain cut through her like a knife. Wanda's body shook as she cried. She pulled her hands from Evelyn's and covered her face, then rolled to her side, curling up as she wept into her pillow. Evelyn got up from the chair and sat on the bed, her hands softly brushing Wanda's back up and down. 
She didn't speak for what felt like forever, as Wanda silently wept on her side. She just kept stroking her back, letting her friend cry about her cancer, cry about the unfairness, cry about everything she'd lost by wasting time. Wanda! In the doorway stood Marty, with an arrangement of flowers. With help from Evelyn, Wanda sat up, her eyes and face wet from crying. Marty? I came as soon as I could. Marty stood frozen, staring at the women. That's when Evelyn felt Wanda squeeze her hand, and Evelyn squeezed back. Wanda adjusted in the bed as Evelyn handed her a tissue. Would you mind if I came in? he asked. Wanda looked at Evelyn as though she didn't know how to proceed, afraid to be vulnerable in front of this man. Evelyn leaned forward, turning her back to Marty, and whispered, I've got you. Chapter 22 You never took me to London, Dahlia said as she cut into the lobster tail he'd grilled for dinner. You joined every single camp and sports thing. He couldn't help but roll his eyes. We had no time to jet off to Europe. Dahlia rolled her own eyes. She wasn't going to drop it. That afternoon when she arrived at the house, she saw an invitation that had come in the mail. You get invited to all these random award shows and openings and never go to any of them. Chase never enjoyed any of the spotlight. It's not like how it is on television. Dahlia shot a disgusted look at Chase. Not once did you or Mom take me to anything. And the paparazzi isn't outside your dormitory window waiting to get a picture, Chase said. He'd never allow that to happen to Dahlia. Unless, God forbid, she chose that kind of life for herself. Even Grace had agreed to keep Dahlia out of the spotlight. I thought we are talking about you studying abroad, he said. He remembered Samantha talking about her experience studying in London, then Spain. What about Italy? As Dahlia went into a detailed list of why Italy wasn't the right country to study, Chase's phone buzzed from a message. Who's that? Dahlia asked. He looked down at the phone. Samantha had sent a video. It looked like the opening credits. He went to open it when he realized Dahlia was staring at him. He set the phone down. She's a friend. He had avoided the topic longer than he had expected for some reason. A good friend. Dahlia's eyebrows perked up. A good friend? He nodded. He hadn't had a good friend before. Chase dated casually a few times, but nothing serious. What's her name? Dahlia asked. Samantha. He answered quickly, but Dahlia took her time as she watched his reaction. Who is she? She asked. She's a woman I met on the island. He tapped his fingers on the table. She's actually a travel vlogger. You should ask her about all those places. She's been to all of them, I'm sure. Am I going to meet her? Dahlia asked. He had thought about inviting Samantha that night, but decided against it after he saw the message from Hamish on her phone at the beach. I like her, but I'm not completely sure she feels the same way. Dahlia sat back in her chair. You like her? He nodded. I'd like you to meet her. Dahlia's eyes expanded. Are you serious about this woman? He nodded, then shook his head. Yes, maybe. I don't know. Where does she live? Dahlia asked. He couldn't tell if her voice sounded panicked or excited. Up until high school, Dahlia had held out hope that he and Grace would get back together. He had held out hope as well. But then in high school, She'd try to set him up with teachers or other single moms. I think I might be falling for her. The confession felt strange, and he didn't like feeling this vulnerable in front of his daughter. You're like, in love? Dahlia's mouth dropped. Yes, maybe. I don't know, he said. He pushed his plate out of the way. 
I think I'm ready to get into a serious relationship. He looked across the table to his baby girl. She had grown into such an amazing young woman. It felt like yesterday when she used to dress at dinner in princess dresses and tiaras. But I want to make sure you're okay with that. Dahlia set down her silverware on the plate. Dad, I just want you to be happy. He couldn't help but feel a growing pain in his heart. When did she get so mature and selfless? Why don't you invite her over, she suggested. Would Samantha want to meet his daughter? What if that scared her off? Was that too much too soon? Maybe I will, he said. But he didn't. Instead, when Dahlia went to her room, he watched the video Samantha had sent. The shots had been perfect, her editing excellent. She had changed a lot of it, but kept a few of the earlier shots, including McPherson Castle. She had kept the castle. He thought about the message he had seen on Samantha's phone earlier. She had brought George to the water to wash off his feet. He hadn't meant to look, but the ding from her phone caught his attention and he read the first few words. I miss you. He rewatched some of her videos, studying the castle, examining the man who had captured Samantha's heart. He searched up Hamish McPherson and read through all of it again, but with a different eye. Wedding announcement on page six, his law office and business address, an article on his new flat in London, photographed with his new wife, Penelope a feature article in Architectural Digest with Hamish and his mother. No mention whatsoever of Samantha. No links or connections to her videos. Except one. He rewatched it. It had been the shortest of her videos. They were usually just about 20 or so minutes, but this one only reached five. As always, the video started with her introduction, short clips of what the episode would be about, then her usual intro with music and regular clips with the title. Typically, the video started with Samantha at the site of the project, explaining what was being done. If the owners happened to be working on the stairwell, Samantha would be under there with them, with a flashlight showing the space, explaining the next steps. But in this video, she skipped the formal chat and started with a landscape of the lock with the castle in full view. The video then focused across the lock on the other side of the shore, where a stag sauntered through the water. The sight must have been incredible, judging by Hamish's expression, which came next. She flipped the camera to film him whispering, Look at that beauty. A full set of antlers. Just gorgeous. Then Chase saw the look on Hamish's face when he looked at the camera. The same look Chase probably had on his face when looking at Samantha. Hamish McPherson was in love. Hamish McPherson wasn't some silly boy. Chase looked at the date of the video. It had been just barely a year. He flipped over to the page with Hamish and his wife. He appeared stiff and cold, holding her like a prom date, not his wife. The whole thing felt very formal. Not that one picture determined his happiness, but that video didn't lie. He very well could still be in love with Samantha. His stomach dropped. Chase was the rebound. Chase didn't sleep well that night. He gave up trying to sleep and got up. By the time he heard movement from upstairs, it was five o'clock. Happy Father's Day, Dahlia said, practically skipping into the room. Good morning, he said, starting his top-of-the-line Italian coffee maker. Coffee? Sure, she said. She kissed him on the cheek as she passed by to the counter's stool. You're up really early, he said. I'm going to catch the ferry in a couple of hours. Want me to join you? he asked. She shook her head as she pulled out the stool. He handed her a cup of coffee. Dahlia took a sip. This is so much better than my lame coffee maker back in my dorm. He rolled his eyes. I'm not buying you an espresso machine. I don't need an espresso machine, 
she laughed. I need a better coffee maker. He thought about asking Dahlia to watch the videos, see if he was imagining things, but then stopped himself. He wasn't going to ask for relationship advice from his daughter, no matter how desperate he got. Instead, Dahlia talked to Chase about school, her internship, exploring the city of Boston. I want to go to a Sox game so bad, she said. I can get his tickets. He'd call after he dropped her off. When's good? Weekends are best. She looked at her calendar on her phone. Next weekend I'm free, and they have a double header on Sunday. You should invite this Samantha woman. He nodded. Maybe I will. But he wasn't so sure. He drove Dahlia down to the harbor to catch the ferry. With a big hug, she kissed him on the cheek, and like always, he stood on the dock watching the ferry embark. No matter how many times Dahlia left, it felt as though he'd set his heart on that boat, and he just had to hope and pray it stayed safe forever. As the ferry disappeared out of sight, he turned back toward his car and saw Samantha standing across the street by the bakery, watching him. He waved, but she didn't wave back. He waved again, which made her take off in the opposite direction. He jogged to meet up with her. Samantha! But she didn't stop. Instead, she moved faster through the crowds of tourists. Samantha, wait up, he called out. When he finally caught up to her, she stopped abruptly on the sidewalk. What? Didn't you hear me calling your name? He asked. He could tell she was upset. He heard the tone in her voice. The way she stood, rigid, and avoided making eye contact was exactly how Dahlia acted when she got upset. Samantha narrowed her eyes and crossed her arms across her chest. I don't like games. What do you mean? He didn't understand. If you're seeing other women, she said, now making eye contact. I'm not seeing other women, he said. He realized she had seen him with Dahlia. That's my daughter, Dahlia. Your daughter was here? She stiffened some more. She nodded, but her gaze went away, past him. She looked as though she was processing the information. I guess you didn't want me to meet her then. I'm sorry. He hadn't meant to be secretive. I didn't want to pressure you by meeting my daughter. Oh. She looked away again, but not before he saw the hurt in her eyes. So that's why you didn't respond to my text? He looked down at his phone. He hadn't responded. I should go. She made her voice sound light and high, but he could tell it was fake. Samantha, wait, please, he said. But she didn't wait. Samantha took off, faster this time, and didn't look back. Chapter 23 The first thing Wanda thought when Marty arrived at the hospital was if her hair looked okay. But then she remembered she wore a hospital gown. What are you doing here? Wanda asked, as he walked inside the room, holding a bouquet of calla lilies, her favorite flower. I don't know. He placed the lilies on the table on wheels at the foot of her bed. I probably should have called. She didn't speak, but snuck a glance at Evelyn, who squeezed her leg and got up. I need to check in back home. I'll be back. Marty nodded, then stood there not really looking at her, but looking at her. She could see he was upset. His eyes flickered around as he scuttered about the room. Are you going to make me say it? He asked. Now his full focus was on her. Say what? Wanda didn't know what exactly he'd referred to, but she had a pretty good feeling it revolved around her sudden change of heart. She honestly didn't know why she had told Marty to stop visiting stop coming by the house, and stop bothering her. The word bother made her wince as she thought of how she had spit the words out at him. That you're scared for some reason. You're right. I am scared. She looked surprised as she said it. The chemo didn't work, and I knew it. I don't want to die in front of you. 
I don't want to be pitied. I don't want you to look shocked every time you see me, because I'm really scared about what comes next. The tears stung her eyes, and the exhaustion mixed with emotions made her stop talking. She wanted to stop thinking. She wanted to stop it all. She closed her eyes, wishing he would just go away, but she heard him drag a chair, then it cracked underneath his weight. What are you doing? she asked through closed eyes. I'm sitting with my friend, Marty said. Marty, please. He let out a breath, staring into her eyes. I'm scared too. She wanted to yell, go away, stay away from me. But she didn't. She couldn't. And the truth was, she didn't want him to leave. I'm not going to let you be scared alone. She opened her eyes for a second, watching as he pulled out a pair of glasses and a book. Do you enjoy a thriller? She clenched her eyes shut, tears falling from the corners, and nodded. Sounds nice. He began with a cover, reading an author's name she didn't recognize, and began on chapter one. Before he read the first line, Wanda was out. She fell into a heavy sleep as he continued to read softly beside her. When she woke from the nurses, she expected for him to be gone, but he was still sitting in the chair, reading the book to himself. The moment her eyes opened, he pulled off his glasses and smiled. Can I get you anything? He asked. She shook her head. He nodded, and she closed her eyes again. Would you like me to continue reading? He asked. She made a hum and fell into a deep sleep the second he began to read. When she woke again, Biddy sat next to the bed. Hey, you. Wanda blinked a few times, orienting herself back to reality. She noticed Marty had left, but his flowers sat in a beautiful crystal vase. Good morning, Biddy smiled. You look better today. Wanda moved slowly in her bed, but for the first time in a long time, she felt more rested. I finally got some sleep. It shows. Biddy patted a book in her lap. Marty told me you enjoyed his book. Wanda noticed the title and nodded. Yes, he came and read to me. Biddy bobbed her leg as she sat beside the bed. That Marty is a mighty good guy. Wanda could almost feel Biddy winding up, ready to let Wanda know her opinion. Biddy never held back. Yes, he is very nice. Not too many people would come around again. Biddy had been a witness to her ending the relationship with Marty in a fit. Wanda shuddered at the memory. They had been having a great day, but the anxiety picked at her, wrapping its claws around her chest. Things had suddenly felt different. Symptoms felt heavier. The sickness felt sharp in her body, but her mind felt dull. She remembered being so tired. But when Marty had suggested she take a rest that afternoon, she'd snapped. Wanda started to tell her side again, but Biddy cut her off, holding up her hand like a traffic cop. Something I've learned along the way in my years is the more people you have in your life the easier hard times can be. Biddy rubbed her arm. And Marty is a good person. Wanda knew it too. Marty was a good person. He had been reliable and steady. He delivered the mail day in and day out without a complaint. He would come after work and spend time at the house, never minding the group of women or the food or her cancellations when she didn't feel up for it. He always came back loyal to a fault. But loyalty made people blind. Loyalty made her waste years with Bill. He's wasting time with me, Wanda said. Stop yourself right now, Biddy said. She sat up straight, her shoulders pulled back, making her six-foot frame even taller to Wanda's petite, sick body in bed. You aren't dead, you know. You're living and breathing and have people who love you and want you to keep fighting. 
deputy gave a hard nod, which made her hair fall into her eyes. She wiped it back with her hand. I haven't stopped fighting. Wanda couldn't believe Biddy. How dare she think she wasn't fighting? Wanda fought every second of every day. I'm barely doing anything else. Wanda, I love you. But you dumping Marty is giving up on love. And you were the cheerleader of it all this time. Biddy's face twisted as she paused. You've started isolating yourself from the rest of us. I have not, Wanda said. Why did you pack up all your things? Biddy asked. Renee and Evelyn suspected she wanted to leave the beach house, but Wanda could tell Biddy knew why, and it was much worse than moving. She was preparing for her death. Wanda narrowed her eyes. I'm not giving up. Biddy nodded, but her face hadn't changed. She wasn't budging on her stance. Wanda looked away and then whispered, I'm not. Biddy's stature slumped, her head tilted. You're not dead, Wanda. Not yet. But you're packing up as if you are. I'm sicker every day. The sting of it burned the back of Wanda's eyes. You heard the doctor. The treatment's not working. Yet, Biddy added. She leaned on the arm of her chair, uncrossing her legs, and leaned closer. Listen, I've worked with all kinds of patients as a nurse, and the ones who make it are the ones who have something to live for. Wanda slanted her head. And? And you're pushing people away. Biddy raised her eyebrows as if to say she didn't want any argument. But even if Wanda did try to argue, she'd be wrong. Everything Biddy said was true. She had packed up. Spent a day going through everything one last time. She didn't even plan on going back to Palm Springs. She planned on hiring a packing company at her house back in Palm Springs, which she had never unpacked. Everything had been marked to go to Bill. One last responsibility Bill would have to deal with, and she'd be out of his life forever. Forever. And you thought sending Bill your clothes was a good idea? Wanda didn't really know why she hadn't changed her will from when she was married. Was it loyalty? Was it some sick and twisted dependence? Was it her insecurities? Or had she really believed, somewhere deep down, he'd come back? Why would she want him to have her stuff? She couldn't imagine him caring about any of it. Now she sat there, imagining Bill's face as boxes of her things piled up. Maybe she did it out of spite. Maybe she wanted to burden him with her belongings. Burden him with the memory of their wedding albums and their dishware and her family heirlooms. He'd probably keep her dad's stuff. Definitely his rifles and guns. What would he do with the rest of it? He'd throw it away, just like he had done to her. Biddy pulled out a notebook and pen. I've gone through your things. What? Wanda sat up in bed. The anger filling her stomach made her shake. You went through my stuff? Biddy nodded. I have everything listed right here. She opened the notebook. In a flowing handwriting, Biddy wrote the contents of Wanda's boxes, organized into sections, clothing, personal effects, and more. Think of all of this as a present you're giving to someone. Biddy held the pen in her hand. I can help you. You mean my junk? Wanda snapped back. I mean that scarf I love, Biddy said. Wanda sighed at the thought of going item by item. I just don't even want to think about it. It might help, knowing that none of it will be a burden, but a gift, Biddy said, her forehead wrinkling. Wanda breathed in letting her head drop on the bed's pillow. She felt tired, a little bit hurt that Biddy had gone through her things, annoyed she had to redo everything she had done the other day. 
She worried it would be just as hard, or harder now that she had to think about the things she didn't want to, like her parents' personal items, her mother's sewing machine, or the piano music she had kept that had been stuffed in the bench back in her childhood home. She had records of Miles Davis, Etta James, and John Coltrane that her father would listen to after work. And her journals. What would she do with the years of writing what she had done every day? Who cared? Biddy didn't speak, just sat next to her, holding the notebook. Can I add a few things? Wanda finally said. Yes, of course. Biddy propped up in her seat, like a secretary taking notes. And for the rest of the morning, through nurse check-ins and doctor visits, Biddy and Wanda went through her personal items. The first time Wanda packed up her things, it had been emotionally taxing. She wasn't just saying goodbye to the item, but her whole being, by thinking everything she cared about would end up in a landfill somewhere in California. But as she went through the list, what surprised her most was the more she thought about who might benefit from the item, the lighter and happier she felt. Her mother's diamond brooch would go to Evelyn, because she had that swan neck. Her diamond earrings would go to Renee, and her mother's sapphire pendant for Samantha. She joked that Biddy could have her scarf, but also the diamond ring she'd bought herself. I think the girls will be so pleased to know you thought of them, Biddy said, as they continued to go through each piece. By the end, exhausted, but strangely energized, Wanda turned to Biddy. Thank you, she nodded. We're your family, Wanda. We are. Wanda nodded, but exhaustion made her eyelids heavy, and she must have fallen asleep, because when she woke up, Biddy was gone, and a new nurse she hadn't met yet was checking her vitals. I need some water, Wanda said to the young girl. I'll be right back with some. She smiled and left the room, after typing some information in the computer. That's when Wanda noticed a dark blob in the corner of the room. In a chair, under one of the hospital's thin blankets, Marty slept. Marty, she said, her voice raspy from being dry and worn from talking so much with Biddy. Marty stayed still for a second, like a mouse being caught when the light turned on, as though staying still would help it not be noticed. I'm sorry. I should have asked if I could come back. She shook her head. Of course you can. She felt silly. She knew she had been wrong to break things off with him. She should just apologize. Grow up, Wanda. You're almost 64 years old and as stubborn as a mule. I'm in love with you, Marty said. Her mouth dropped. I know you're scared, he stood up. I am too. Sweat dotted his forehead as his cheeks darkened red. He stood, wide-eyed, staring at her. She wished she had a sip of water, something to wet her mouth. She tried to formulate a word, push it out her throat, but she began to cough, unable to catch her breath. A nurse appeared out of nowhere, rushing into the room, helping Wanda sit up, the young nurse held the straw to her lips, rubbing Wanda's back, but she couldn't stop coughing, and she couldn't catch her breath. She looked out, looking to Marty, helpless, as terror filled every ounce of her being. She couldn't breathe. But the nervous Marty disappeared, and in his place a confident man moved right in next to her, his big hand stroking her back, helping her sit up with the nurse. Use your abdomen muscles to cough. Wanda focused on his low voice, calm and steady, like a submarine through choppy water, slicing through her panic. That's it, he said soothingly. His hand continued to go up and down her back as her coughing slowed, and she was able to sip more water. Just like that, Wanda. It took a half hour or more to regain her breathing, and she felt shaky at best. But she got it back. And the minute she had enough strength, she grabbed hold of Marty's hand and said, 
I love you too. Chapter 24 For days, Samantha worked on editing her videos from the footage she did have. She spent hours sitting in the guest room and watched hundreds of hours of video over and over. Going through her still frames, putting it all together with music, she edited it all down to the split second. She hadn't slept for days. It had been her best work yet. Finally, she finished her first three episodes. Let's have a viewing party, her mother suggested. We can have it here at the house. Samantha never loved being part of the viewing, but now, without an agent or a viewership, she'd have to see what others thought. Were her videos as good as she thought they were? We can do it tonight, Evelyn said, pulling out her phone. Wanda and Marty will be at the hospital, but we could have Charlie and the writing group, Chase and Mateo. Should we include Julia and Jose? That sounds nice, but... Samantha scratched the back of her neck. She hadn't talked to Chase since the incident at the ferry docks. She didn't even know what to say at this point. She felt stupid for her overreaction. Maybe she should have been calmer and cooler about the whole thing, but the fact remained, for whatever reason, he didn't want her to meet his daughter. I think it's just better that we don't have a viewing. Evelyn opened her mouth about to say something when Samantha cut her off. Let's just see how things go first, before we celebrate. Luckily, Samantha didn't need to explain more. Evelyn gave her a half smile and rubbed her back, assuming her nerves were the reason she didn't want the viewing party. You should be proud of yourself, Evelyn said. You've worked so hard. She had been proud of her work, but would these new videos be enough to get her vlog back on track? Would she get the viewers she once had? Or would no one care? She released the first video online at midnight and waited. The next morning when she checked her feed, the video had 500 views compared to the thousands like before. By afternoon, barely a thousand. Then nothing. All night, Samantha thought about everything. Her videos, Chase, Hamish, school, her father and Seaview. What would she do next, now that her career was officially dead? As the next morning arrived, Samantha sat on her mother's deck, waiting for her and Biddy to return from their walk. She had made plans to film later that night with Mateo, but the glaring problem hit her harder than the high June sun. Why even bother filming? She was certain, after her little episode, Chase wouldn't want to continue filming. It would be noticeable if she continued without him. The few viewers she did have enjoyed seeing the old superstar. That would be the second time she didn't follow through with the series. She looked out at the water, watching the waves break onto shore, wishing she could get some type of answer of what she should do. A screech from above her head made her turn in her chair. A seagull floated in the wind. The gray and white bird's wings expanded out, lowering itself to the railing right next to her croissant. Don't even think about it, she said to the bird, waving her arms out to shoo it away. The seagull flew off the railing to the seagrass below, waddling along the sand and coming as close to the deck as it could. She thought about her mom, how she thought her father spoke through birds. What would her dad tell her to do? Never quit on yourself, is what he had said to her all the time. But this wasn't quitting. It was throwing in the towel, knowing when to finish. And Samantha's career in vlogging was done. Good morning. Suddenly, from around the front of the house, Harper appeared. I heard Wanda's coming home today. Yes, Samantha said, happy to break the constant doubts crashing in her mind. She's coming home tonight, hopefully with Marty. She smiled, thinking about Marty declaring his love for Wanda in the hospital room. She'd give anything to have that exchange on tape. The nurses had said it was the most romantic thing they had seen. We should have a welcome home party and show Wanda your video, Harper suggested. A party, yes, 
A gust of wind blew through and she grabbed her sun hat before it blew away. The seagull sat down in the sand. But no video. I wouldn't like that. Why not? Harper got closer, as if checking her out. Everything all right? All of a sudden, Samantha had to blink back tears. She looked to the seagull, which she swore was staring at her. My videos are bombing. Harper made a sympathetic face. They're so good, though. They were good. Samantha knew that. It's not the videos. She looked to the seagull. It's me. Come on, just give it a little more time, Harper said, trying to be encouraging. Who knows, maybe somebody from HGTV might see it. They'll see my number of views and stop watching. She sighed out a long breath of resignation. I've just been thinking of pivoting, you know? Harper nodded. I do know. Harper's answer surprised Samantha. Harper appeared to know exactly what she was supposed to do. Right. She had a published book and wasn't even 30. What are you thinking? Harper asked. What do you want to do? Architecture. Samantha said it before she could take it back. After going through all her film, her takeaway from it all was that she loved architecture. Have you heard of the BAC? Harper picked up her phone. I have a friend that went to school there. They loved it. You should check it out. Harper looked something up on her phone and passed it to Samantha. The BAC? Samantha had no idea what she was talking about. Boston Architecture College. Harper leaned over and scrolled down through the page. It's right in the heart of Boston. Samantha looked over at Harper's phone. A photograph of a student sitting at a design table in a classroom flashed across the screen. And that's when Samantha felt it. That was what she wanted to do. She wanted to be that student, learning design, studying from the experts, and creating something herself. Like a wave finally breaking onto shore, suddenly Samantha could see her future. All those years ago, when she didn't continue her education with graduate school, she had used her father's death as the excuse. But Samantha quit on herself. Quitting was a whole lot easier than failing. She didn't pursue architecture because she might fail at it. But so what if she did? She had people in her life to help her out. She had this place to come home to if she needed somewhere to go. And she had the support to try something else. She jumped out of the chair and threw her arms around Harper. Whoa, Harper said, patting Samantha's back. This is exactly what I needed to see, Samantha said. She let go of Harper's neck. I might be able to do something like this. Samantha went back to Harper's phone, looking at the graduate's program admissions page. I already have a degree in design. She showed Harper the list of requirements. She looked at the deadline for late applications. I don't have much time. She looked at the address and map. It wasn't far from Cambridge, not far from Harvard Square, not far from Chase's daughter. Samantha passed back Harper's phone. Can I ask you something? Sure, Harper set down the phone. Did Charlie date before my mom? She felt weird asking such a private question about her mom's boyfriend. She wasn't even sure why she was. Charlie wasn't Chase Mitchell. Harper looked up. He didn't really date much before your mom. She should probably give context, but felt silly for some reason because she was almost certain she knew Harper's answer. Did you meet them? Harper shook her head. He never introduced me to anyone he dated, not until he was serious about her. Right, she thought. Makes sense. Things suddenly made complete sense. Chase Mitchell wasn't serious about their relationship. Harper looked like she was about to ask something when Samantha turned the conversation back to school. I think I might do it. I think I might try to apply to BAC. Harper's face lit up. I'll call my friend. He's nice. And I bet he'd love to show you around. 
By the time the two women noticed Evelyn and Biddy returning from their walk on the beach, they had scheduled a tour with Suni, Harper's friend, created a to-do list such as get references, transcripts, develop a table of contents for a portfolio, and were about to find a place to stay when Samantha noticed who was with them. Chase, she said. He waved as Biddy winked at her. We'll leave you two alone, Evelyn said, pulling at Harper's shirt sleeve when she didn't move from her spot on the deck. Samantha noticed the seagull had flown away. Hey, he said, stuffing his hands in his shorts pockets. He looked handsome, standing against the Atlantic Ocean backdrop, his azure eyes glowing in the sunlight. Hey, she said back, her body pulsing with excitement and anxiety. I'm sorry about everything with Dahlia, he began, but she cut him off. Don't apologize, she said. I shouldn't have gotten upset. I want you to meet her, he said. But... He paused, as though he had to find the right words to let her down easy. So she would do it for him. I took your advice and pivoted. I'm going to apply it to BAC, she said, deciding right then and there. It's in Boston. I'm really excited. He didn't say anything. It's ten minutes down the road from Dahlia. She tapped on the map display under the contact us on her phone and showed him. See? Right there across the Charles. He nodded and stared at the phone. Cool. Her head jerked at his apathetic tone. Cool? Yeah, that's cool. You'd be great at architecture. Well, glad you stopped by, she said, wishing she had said nothing. Do you plan on moving then? He came off cold and hard, and she couldn't read him, which made her defenses prickle up her neck. If they accept me? She may not know Chase that well, but this behavior seemed so unlike him, and she didn't know where this was coming from. You know, you're the one who said I should look into different avenues. What was that whole speech about going to business school all about? She was so confused. She actually thought he'd be happy for her, especially since this wasn't serious. I know. He got up and walked to the deck's railing, making a gap between them. I just don't want you to leave. What? Did she hear him right? He stared at her, studying her. Samantha, do you still love him? She almost asked if he meant Hamish, but stopped herself, because the look on his face said that he did. No. It came out right away, and she meant it. She really meant it. And for the first time, she meant it wholeheartedly. Hamish could stuff it for all she cared. Because I want more than just something casual, Chase said. Her breath swept out of her lungs, and she sat there, unable to speak. But you didn't even want me to meet Dahlia, she said. Chase looked at her. I saw the message from Hamish. Oh. She didn't know what to say. She hadn't expected this. When we were with George at the beach, I accidentally saw it when it popped up on your phone, he said. He let out a long breath. It looks as though he still has feelings for you. She played with her hands as she gathered the words in her head. I thought I was in love with him, but it wasn't real. She bit her bottom lip. I don't like secrets. I don't want secrets either, he said, coming closer. She looked at him, this handsome man who seemed to have it all. What do you see in me? She didn't get it. She really didn't understand. I see this strong woman taking life by the horns. He looked straight at her, holding her eyes with his. I want to be a better person when I'm with you. I want to learn and grow and take chances. I don't want to hide from the world. I want to expand and move on and live. 
He stepped up to her, taking her hands, tangling his fingers with hers. I want to be all in. And then he kissed her, wrapping his arms around her, holding her against him. When the ferry reached Falmouth, a car waited for them and took them to the city. Boston Architectural College's concrete building stood out against the city's traditional red brick. The modern, sleek design made the butterflies dance inside Samantha's stomach as the car parked in front of the building. A man walked out of the front entrance and met them outside the car. Samantha Rose? The man extended his hand. My name is Sunin Nguyen. Welcome to Boston Architecture College. Harper's friend took Samantha and Chase on a tour of the building, introducing her to some of the professors still at school and a few other students. They walked down corridors that showcased former students' work, awards won, and designs of excellence. Suni explained his classes and his internship through a local firm in Boston. They walked through classrooms and the different design studios and labs. Projects lined the walls, architecture drawings and photographs displayed throughout. Samantha immediately took to the small campus and creative vibe. There's a real community here at BAC, a man in his 30s said, as he worked in the design lab. By the time the tour finished, the butterflies in her belly had morphed into a roller coaster. One second she felt energized to apply, and the next she felt like it was all way over her head. Did she have what it took to be an architect? I got us rooms at a great place in Cambridge, Chase said, when the car took off down Newbury. The city's lights powered on as the summer sun set behind the buildings. Thank you for setting this all up, she said, holding the packet of papers she'd gotten on the tour. She didn't even know where to begin. So much seemed to be happening all at once. The place Chase had booked turned out to be a carriage house in Cambridge. They had the whole thing to themselves. They stayed up all night and talked. They talked about their childhoods and about their families. She talked about losing her father and giving up in school. He talked about never having a father figure and trying to make up for mistakes. He told her about his ex-wife Grace and their amicable relationship as co-parents. Then she told him about Hamish. He came to the hospital and told me to stop following him. She had said it so quietly that she thought maybe he hadn't heard her because he didn't respond. He stared out the window as the morning sun slowly rose through the building's silhouettes. I'm so sorry he did that to you. Something clicked at that moment. Something real and powerful. Chase was real. His genuine concern for her was real. This relationship between them was real. And Chase made her feel safe in that realness. Like every morning, Chase took his run and Samantha checked her stats. They were abysmal. Only a couple dozen more views, no new likes or shares. It was over. It was Boston Architectural College or a job waiting tables. When Chase returned, they drove to Harvard's campus. Are you sure about this? She asked. Are you sure? Chase asked her. He laughed. She's going to talk your ear off. When they arrived at campus, Samantha saw a young woman running toward them. Dahlia jumped up into her father's arms and hugged him. Then, without missing a beat, she embraced Samantha. Hi, I'm Dahlia. Hi, I'm Samantha. Chase's daughter was stunningly beautiful. Like a movie star, nothing intelligent came to mind to say, so instead she said, I feel like I'm on a movie set, or at Hogwarts. You should totally video here, Dahlia said. I just loved your videos you did with my dad. Chase winked at her as Dahlia started her tour of the campus. The whole time, Dahlia had been totally cool, and the excitement of possibly going back to school grew inside of Samantha. After the tour, Dahlia took them to an eatery in Harvard Square, and they found a table outside. Daddy, you look so cute in the videos, Dahlia said. I watched all three with my roommates. The fact Dahlia watched Samantha's videos was sweet and embarrassing. 
She wondered if Dahlia thought Samantha roped her father into this mess. I think I'm taking them down, Samantha said. What was the point of her channel anyway? Now she would have two unfinished seasons. The inconsistency alone was a reason to quit. No, don't do that, Chase said. You've got great stuff. It just needs the right eyes, not snobby eyes. She wondered if Dahlia and her friends looked her up besides the videos. Would she have seen all the nasty things written about Samantha? You should film here, Dahlia said. There's tons of great architecture in Boston. Chase crossed his legs and leaned back in the chair. Did you know Samantha's thinking of attending BAC? That's like down the road, Dahlia's eyes opened wide. We're totally going to hang. Dahlia waved her hands in the air with excitement. Samantha let out a laugh, then smiled at Chase. A grin grew on the side of his mouth. Just one thing. Dahlia raised her finger in the air. Anyone who watched your videos knows you aren't what they say in those gossip blogs. Dahlia had looked her up, which Samantha had done under the same circumstances with her mom. She had looked up Charlie. But Samantha appreciated the recognition. After a short walk around, Dahlia said her goodbyes. Thanks for taking us around today, Samantha said, hugging Dahlia. I had a really nice time. Me too, Dahlia hugged her back. Chase wrapped his arms around Samantha's shoulder as they walked together back to the car. The drive back to the ferry and the ride back to the island, her whole body buzzed with a new energy she hadn't felt in years, even before Hamish. She'd felt it before her dad had died, when things seemed possible. She had a whole new journey in front of her, and it was about to begin right now. Chapter 25 Marty came to both Biddy and Evelyn. I want your permission to marry Wanda. The ladies didn't hide their excitement in the least. Biddy rubbed Marty's balding head, and Evelyn hugged him so tight she thought he lost consciousness for a second there. That's wonderful news. Evelyn couldn't believe how wonderful. You have to have the wedding here and the ceremony on the beach. Marty held his hat in his hands against his chest. I'm putting in my retirement and going to spend the rest of my time with Wanda. Evelyn had experienced a lot of emotions throughout her life, but she had never experienced this type of joy. Wanda, of all people, truly deserved a happily ever after. I think this is just wonderful, she said to Charlie later that day at Books and Bread. I am so happy for her. Has he proposed yet? he asked. She shook her head, wondering if this bit of news bothered Charlie. Marty and Wanda had started dating well after they had. Now they were getting engaged. She knew she was the one holding her relationship back from the next step. But why change if things worked so well? She was happy. Charlie seemed happy. They were happy, right? Charlie nodded, seemingly unconcerned. She wondered how she would have reacted if Charlie had been bothered. If he demanded they get married, would she agree? She thought the urge would arrive for him at some point, but it hadn't. Well, not until... Does it bother you? Bother me about what? Charlie asked. About them getting engaged? She asked. His forehead scrunched in confusion. Why would that bother me? Evelyn decided to drop it while mentally rewinding over the past few months. Had she been so busy worrying about Wanda that she neglected her relationship with Charlie? Did he no longer want to marry her? When had they talked about it last? Not since Christmas, at least. But when Charlie moved on to another subject, her mind stayed on the idea of marriage. What about us? She asked later that night while they read in the living room. All the windows were open, letting in the sounds of crickets and waves washing up onto shore. Do you think we should get married? She sat with her back against the armrest, her legs on top of his lap. He shook his head. Not like this. She put her book down. Something felt off. 
Have you changed your mind? He looked at her. I thought maybe we'd get engaged because we wanted to get married, not because we were jealous of our friends. She almost snapped something fresh back, but luckily she bit her tongue. Charlie was right. I guess I just wondered if getting married was still something you think about. She could feel her vulnerability stretch. Of course I do. Charlie went back to reading his book. She smiled as her heart slowed down. Picking up her book, she wiggled her feet, showing off her pedicure. She'd taken the girls to the spa, and they had all gotten petties. It had been just what the doctor ordered. Oh, shoot! He lifted his finger in the air, then removed her feet from his lap. He got up and moved across the room to a bag he'd brought in. I made the journal. She sat up, taking the journal in her hands. It's beautiful. Charlie made a leather-bound journal with Wanda's favorite poem by Emily Dickinson engraved into the cover. Charlie read it aloud. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. It's perfect, Evelyn said. What are you doing with it? At one of the support group meetings, they talked about this thing called an ethical will. She opened the cover and brushed her hand against the smooth paper inside. She flipped to one of the threaded spines. He'd picked Wanda's favorite color, dragon. Dragon, which Wanda swore was a color of a crayon, had been her answer during game night that had instantly become an inside joke among the group. The orange-red looked great. So what exactly is an ethical will? He asked. She put the journal in her lap, holding onto it gently with the utmost respect of what it represented. It's where you write down your memories and values and life's lessons you want to pass along. It's a way to share your story and your hopes for the future generations. It's a place to write family traditions and recipes. What you want to give, but isn't necessarily physical. Charlie tilted his head. That's a nice idea. She thought about how lovely it would have been if George had given that to their daughters. I should do one, he nodded. Yeah, it's nice. They stared at the journal. Do you think it's a nice gift for Wanda? Evelyn second-guessed herself. Yes, I think it's a very thoughtful gift. And the fact you're going to help her write it is even more thoughtful, he said. Charlie grabbed hold of her hand and pulled her to him, kissing her on the lips. I think about marrying you every day, ever since I first proposed to you all those years ago. She thought about him asking her father at Christmas back at her childhood home. He had been so nervous. A year later, they had broken off their engagement. She thought she would die of a broken heart. Life's funny, isn't it? He nodded, kissing her again. It sure is. Chapter 26 Wanda left the hospital with a new freedom she hadn't felt in her whole life. Almost like a reckoning. A wake-up call that allowed her to finally live in the moment. She had spent all her time and energy worrying about the future, when the future was as real as Evelyn's stories. All she did by spiraling deeper into her anxiety was waste the time she had left, and all that worry and stress she endured over her lifetime had been mostly for naught. She had what she had always wanted in her life right before her. When she returned to Seaview, she found a cancer survivor support group. She met others on the island who were also fighting cancer. She found that talking to them, sharing anecdotes of their common experiences, made it less scary. She began attending church with Marty. Even though she wasn't Catholic, she enjoyed attending daily Mass with him, watching him receive his communion. Each morning, she and the girls walked like always, but now Marty met her afterward, and they would spend the rest of the day with each other together, usually at his place. But today, 
He had packed a lunch and drove her out to the other side of the island. Where are you taking us? She asked, curious and excited at the same time. It's not a surprise if I tell you, he said, driving down a wooded road. Martha's vineyard had surprised her by its country lane roads and natural landscapes. The island had a lot of tourism, but even during the busiest times, it still felt quiet. Locals knew and took care of one another. The feeling of community had been stronger on the island than any other place Wanda had lived. Funny how one simple decision to travel to Martha's vineyard had changed her whole life. Marty pulled into an empty dirt parking lot. A state park sign stood in front of a sandy path cutting through a forest. You up for a short walk? He asked. She nodded as he opened the door for her and helped her out of the car. The path led to a pond with cattails and tall grasses. Birds swooped low over the still water, catching flies dancing above the surface. Marty walked her to a wooden gazebo, where a table had been set up with a checkered tablecloth and a bouquet of flowers. Marty, did you do all this? She asked, noticing the fancy dishes and silverware. He removed his backpack as he pulled out a chair for her at the table. Of course I did, he said, pulling out a wrapped gift and setting it in front of her. Wanda inhaled the fresh air around her, looking around at the scene. She knew this would be a big moment. Marty had been a simple man and didn't do this kind of big. She had a feeling someone may have encouraged it. Evelyn and Biddy, perhaps, or maybe Renee. She breathed out, focusing her attention back to him. This is a great spot. Marty looked out. It's my favorite place on the island. He pushed the gift in front of her. What's this? A smile grew on her face, looking at the meticulously wrapped gift. Open it he said. Starting with the tape, she pulled it from the paper, careful not to tear it. Inside, she pulled out a white box. She lifted the box's cover, and inside sat a photo album with the words, Our Wedding, engraved into a silver cover. Then he took her hand, holding it between both of his. I don't have much to offer in ways of luxury. I don't own a beach house or a fancy boat, and as a mailman, I don't get a glamorous retirement package. But if you let me, I'll spend the rest of my life loving you. From his pocket, he pulled out a small object Wanda knew would be an engagement ring. She held her breath as Marty took her hands again. Wanda, will you marry me? He asked, his eyes holding onto hers. She didn't hesitate to answer. With both hands, she cupped Marty's face and said, Yes, I would love to be your wife. And as the birds swooped over the pond, and the insects buzzed around them as they kissed, and the trees swayed in the soft breeze, a wave of peace rolled through Wanda's body. Chapter 27 Sea View buzzed with activity. People rushed every which way around the house, decorating and setting up for Wanda and Marty's big day. Florists decorated the interior and exterior with locally sourced wildflowers found on the island, spending extra care with the makeshift pergola that Matteo had built for the ceremony. Renee led the charge of catering, closing books and bread for the weekend, and had her and Charlie's employees following her orders for the wedding's reception. The guest list had been small, but no expense had been spared. Marty, having never been married, said he wanted it all, including the rice throwing at the end. They'd settled on birdseed. The women spent a day dress shopping in the city. Wanda had chosen a cream-colored dress that looked fantastic on her. She wanted the women to wear blue, her favorite color, any shade and in any style they wanted. The dresses took care of Wanda's something blue. Evelyn let Wanda borrow her pearl necklace. Biddy gave her new lingerie that made Wanda blush. She had held up the lace nightie with strings hanging from every section of it. 
she didn't know which end was the top or the bottom. Then, as they finished getting ready, Evelyn and Biddy gave Wanda her something old. We talked to your doctor, Evelyn said. And he said you have two weeks before your next round of treatment begins, Biddy added. Then they handed over a small package. Open it, Renee said, bouncing George in her arms. Wanda pulled off the top and saw a photograph of a stone fortress, illuminated by lights at night, sitting on the edge of a cliff. She realized it was a postcard. She flipped it over. It read, For Wanda and Marty, may your adventures begin today. This is your something old, Biddy said, showing the photograph again. We all pitched in. Wanda's hand covered her mouth. You're staying a full week in the oldest standing house in Quebec City, Evelyn said. That's where you'll be staying. Wanda's eyes widened, and she immediately hugged them. This is too much, all of it. It's all too much. Wanda dried her eyes, but the rest of the day had been emotional for everyone, even Samantha. Evelyn and Biddy walked Wanda down the beach to Marty, who stood with one of his friends under the pergola with the justice of the peace. Everyone sat in chairs using parasols, or they wore large sun hats to block the sun. Baby George wore a blue button-down with khakis and sunglasses, and Samantha swore she'd never seen anything cuter. Chase wore a perfectly tailored white shirt and a pair of khakis that fit him just right. Throughout the ceremony, Samantha kept sneaking glances at him as he snuck glances at her. At the beginning, they sat close, then they touched. His arm wrapped around her shoulder as Wanda and Marty said their vows, and when she finished clapping after the kiss, Chase took her hand and held on for the rest of the night. Dinner went perfectly. The thirty or so in attendance had been stuffed with Renee's cooking. After dinner, a DJ started playing music, and people moved to the dance floor that had been installed under a white tent in Seaview's backyard. People danced to new and old music, slow and fast alike. Speeches were given, stories were told. The night had been everything Wanda could have dreamed of, and more. When it ended and people started leaving, Samantha and Chase danced alone to a slow country love song. With her arms around Chase's neck, she rested her head against his shoulders, swaying back and forth in sync with the ocean's waves. As the last notes played, she kissed him long on the lips. Maybe we could go for a midnight stroll along the beach. She tugged at his hand. He looked at the crowd still lingering. Will your mom and everyone be looking for us? I'm in my twenties. I can go for a walk with my boyfriend at night. She gave him a look, then shook her head at his concerned face. He bit his bottom lip. Biddy kind of scares me when it comes to you. She's warned me a few too many times about treating you well. Samantha laughed, imagining Biddy pointing a finger right into his chest, threatening his life if he hurt her. Let me just let Renee know where I am, she said, feeling Renee would be the safest bet. If the women began to worry, she could tell them. Otherwise, if they didn't notice, no harm done. She looked up to the moon. Its full reflection danced along the water's surface. When's the tide coming in tonight? He pulled out his phone. My phone died. Check yours. Samantha grabbed her handbag and pulled out her phone, opened the screen, and started to type. But she stopped suddenly. What's it called? A tidal calendar he said, looking over her shoulder. Here, can I? She handed him her phone, and he typed in Tidal Calendar into the search bar, just as a message flashed across her screen. Hamish McPherson's name stayed frozen on the top of the screen for what felt like forever. She read a few words before she quickly swiped it up, out of view. She could see Chase take a second, and then he recuperated enough to open the website. You'll be able to see when it comes back in here. She stood there, not sure what to say. 
not sure what to do. She had never responded to Hamish's last text at the beach. The text's first words were, I love you. Another flashed her screen. Chase handed back the phone to her. I think you should probably read your texts. She shook her head at him. No, Hamish has nothing to say to me. He stared at her like he was solving a problem. Why is he texting you now? She shrugged. I don't know. He kept staring at her as if he was calculating everything in his head. Chase? She didn't want this to be a thing. Hamish is a guy in my past. That's it. He seems to be visiting your present as we speak. He pointed to her phone, which was lighting up with message after message from Hamish. You might want to find out what he wants. Chase stuck around long enough for the big send-off with Wanda and Marty. Everyone waved them goodbye as the limo drove them off to the ferry. But something felt off for the rest of the night. He didn't talk much after that. Told her he was fine, but decided to leave early, saying he was tired. He left after kissing her softly on the lips and went home. She wished she hadn't checked them. She wished she had just deleted them like she had promised herself, but that little voice inside her head, the one who wanted to feel as though that time had meant something to him, had to see what he'd said. She opened the string of texts, one right after the other, confessing his love for her. How he wanted to leave Penelope. How she had been the one he'd loved all along. How he had never loved anyone more than her. He would sell his family's legacy and come to America, if that meant being with her. She pressed the information button, opened his contact information, and pressed block. Then she deleted each text one by one. With every text she deleted, she exhaled and felt free. Chase didn't text good night or good morning, which was unusual for Chase. She didn't see him on his morning run at his normal time or gossiping with the ladies. By mid-morning, she walked past his rental, pretending not to look. But she noticed it looked like he wasn't even there. When she arrived at Books and Bread, she went directly to Renee. Last night, Chase saw texts from Hamish, and now he's ghosting me. All because of a few stupid texts that I had no control over. She rambled out the words, but finished with, He's being completely ridiculous. What's Hamish texting you for? Renee asked. She looked equally surprised. Samantha rolled her eyes. He says he wants to leave Penelope. What? Renee's mouth dropped wide open. I can't believe he'd text you after what he did. Renee pointed angrily at her as if Samantha did something to provoke it. You didn't text him back, did you? Samantha shook her head. No, I blocked him. You should have blocked him when he left you on the street when you got hit by a car. She dragged out each word and punctuated hard after each one. I blocked him, Samantha said again. Go talk to Chase, Renee said. He's probably wondering why Hamish is texting you all of a sudden. I can't help the fact that he did, Samantha said, defending herself. He should know that. I think we love you, and I think we don't understand why you didn't fight back, Renee said. What? Samantha couldn't believe what she was hearing. What do you mean I didn't fight back? You didn't go after Penelope. You didn't call her or him a liar about the stalking comments. You kept quiet. Why? If that were me, I'd... You'd run to Mom's house and have her fix it. My situation was very different. Renee threw her hand on her hip. Not so much, actually, Samantha snapped back. You wanted Harry to change his mind, even though he hurt you. Renee opened her mouth as if to argue, but she smacked it shut. You're right. But Chase is probably freaking out either way. He's seen your videos. What about my videos? Samantha said. Renee watched them. You and Hamish were both so into each other, Renee said. It's kind of the appeal of the whole season. 
I can see why people liked it so much. It wasn't just the castle, but the falling in love angle. Maybe that's what it all was, an angle, a slant to one side of things. Her videos cut and edited showed a perfect love story. Yet, it had only been a fairy tale. Chase was real. What she felt for him was real. And she might have totally blown it. Do I apologize? She didn't want to give any more effort towards this. In fact, she'd never wanted to speak of Hamish again. No, you did nothing wrong, Renee said. But you explain what Hamish said. Explain your side. And fight for Chase. Samantha nodded. Renee was right. She needed to find Chase, explain everything, and show him. She should have just opened the texts right there in front of him to show him she had nothing to hide. But she swiped them away, pretending to ignore them. He probably assumed when he left that she immediately checked what Hamish had sent. Samantha walked back down Sugar Beach. The crowds were heavy with tourists. She reached Chase's rental and looked at the house. None of the windows or doors were open, which Chase would do if he were home. She walked up the wooden staircase to his private walkway through the sand dunes. As she reached the back door, she noticed all the curtains were pulled shut. She never had seen them shut before. She knocked on the back door first, then went to the front and rang the doorbell. No answer. She peeked in, checking for any sign that he might be there but after two texts and a 15-minute knocking session, she decided to head back to Seaview. For the rest of the day, Samantha split her time cleaning up from the wedding, lying around watching TikTok, and being hostage to her phone as she waited for a message from Chase. He hadn't texted her back or called, which was unusual for him at this point in the relationship. How could she fix this if he wouldn't talk to her? Peekaboo! We see Auntie Sam. Evelyn popped into the living room where Samantha flipped through Instagram while also cleaning up. Her mom held George in her arms. Samantha covered her face with her hands and then took them away, smiling big, and sang out, peek a -boo! George's sticky jelly hands reached out at Samantha. Hots, Ami. Evelyn's eyes shot open. Oh my goodness, Sam. I think you just said your name. Oh. Samantha could feel her whole body warm from the sweet gesture. She wasn't exactly sure if George had tried to say her name, but she'd take it at that point. She reached out, scooped him into her arms, and said, Come to Auntie Sammy. She swung him upside down, giving him blowing kisses on his exposed belly. He erupted into a fit of laughter, and using his baby sign language, signed, more, more, with his little fingers. When she lifted him back up, she saw Chase standing on the back porch. She smiled and waved. I was just about to put him down for a nap, Evelyn said, taking George back into her arms before swiftly leaving the room. Samantha walked to the French door and stepped out to greet him. Hi. Hi. I stopped by your house, she said, her heart starting to gain momentum with panic. The energy radiating from him felt off and distant. I was out. He spoke short and cold. Oh. She picked at her fingernails, not sure how to fix things. She didn't want to apologize because she hadn't done anything wrong. But one time she had heard her dad say, that he'd apologize just so her mother would feel better. Would it be that bad to apologize? Was he waiting for her to do it? And that was why he stood there, not saying anything? I'm sorry, he said suddenly. I know I freaked out. I need to do better. She stood there, frozen as he turned out to be the one saying sorry. I didn't know he was going to text me, he nodded. I know. She could feel her heart slow down from sudden panic to mixed emotions. I don't want to keep things from you. I should have just 
opened it up right then and there, instead of pretending he didn't text me. Does he want you back? By the way he looked at her, she was almost certain he knew the answer. Yes. She dropped her hands, almost in a surrender. But that doesn't mean I want him back. He didn't break her stare for what felt like forever. He just stood there, looking at her, his hands in his pockets. Dahlia says I need to open up about my background and my insecurities of being left by my father and by Grace. Relief swept through her at his admission. How had she not seen it before? His insecurities had been her insecurities. I'm scared too. I promise I will try my hardest to talk to you instead of shutting you out, he said, coming toward her. I should have talked to you about my feelings last night. Good, she said, taking his elbow and pulling him toward her. And I promise to be open and honest with you too. She stepped closer, her gaze on his as she said, I'm happy with you in a way that I've never been before. He removed his hands from his pockets, pulled her into his arms, and kissed her. When he pulled away, he said, I love you, Samantha. Her heart expanded as her breath swept up inside her. I love you, too. He pulled something out of his pocket and placed that something in the palm of her hand. Then he covered it with both of his hands. I have something for you. What's this? she asked. It's a key. She looked at him, and he lifted his hands to reveal a key with a silver keychain with Boston Architectural College's logo on it. She smiled up at him, unsure what the significance of the key meant. But she got excited by what it could be. She rubbed her thumb along its jagged edges. It's a key to my new place, he said. What? she said. You got a new place? He nodded. It's right in Cambridge, down the road from this really great architecture school. But I haven't even applied yet, she said, pointing out a major hurdle. She began to hand back the key, but he stopped her. Samantha. He looked at her. I believe in you. And that's when the idea popped into her head. Her mouth slowly opened as everything came together. I'll use the videos for my application. She'd have to edit them again, add even more of the architectural elements that she had cut for fear it might bore her viewers. But it wouldn't bore a group of master architects. It would be perfect. Let me help you, Chase said. She jumped up and kissed him on the lips. An energy ran through her body, a feeling so good that she didn't want it to ever end. The one that seemed to come around only when she was with Chase. Chapter 28 Charlie called a family meeting that evening at Books and Bread after it closed. But as Renee, Samantha, Harper, George, and even Stan all sat around the small table, someone was clearly missing. Evelyn. I thought you said this was a family meeting. Harper said, pointing out Renee's exact thoughts. I did, Charlie said. Then what about Evelyn? Harper said. Don't you think she's part of the, Harper used her fingers to air quote, family? Charlie adjusted in his seat and drew in a breath. I asked you all here because I want to talk to you about something. Renee bounced George in her lap, but he didn't want to sit still. George wanted to play with Stan, which also meant poking and prodding the poor dog. I know you love Stan, but he's taking a nap. The dog looked up at the sound of his name, then immediately closed his eyes. Don't worry, Stan. You're a good boy. George reached his arms out to the dog, grunting what Renee was sure was baby obscenities at her, as he wiggled and squirmed to get out of her lap. Here I can take him. Samantha said, scooting her chair over closer to George. You want to play with my keys? Samantha dangled a shiny set of keys in front of George. George immediately changed his mind about Stan and took the keys in his hands and swooped into Samantha's lap without any whining. So what's this all about? 
Renee asked, looking at her watch. The store had been slammed with customers the whole day. Renee had thought she had hired enough support staff for behind the counter, but today proved she could easily hire a few more sets of hands to keep things running smoothly. Renee noticed how things like cleaning the tables and rearranging the displays to showcase what was left had been slipping lately with the rush of people. It may mean nothing to Charlie or anyone else in the room, but to Renee, it was a big deal. To Renee, things like that showed a distinction between a top eatery experience versus a casual grab-and-go. But as she sat there looking at the mess around the store and thinking about everything she had to do before George's bath, Samantha kicked her under the table. Ouch! Renee jerked her leg away and rubbed it with her hand. What did you do that for? Samantha gave Renee the stink eye she was famous for as a teenager. You're not listening, Samantha said, pointing to Charlie, who looked at them. I'm sorry. Renee looked around the table and realized she hadn't even noticed someone talking. Charlie smiled, placing his hands on his lap, and said, I asked you all to meet me here. Charlie paused for a millisecond, just long enough to show his nervousness. Renee's heart began to speed up, guessing what he was about to say next. Because I would like to ask for... Renee shot a look to Samantha, who already had her eyes on her. Permission to marry your mother. The look in Samantha's eyes seemed to reflect how Renee felt. It was a strange and bittersweet moment she had never expected to happen. Their mother would be married to someone else besides their dad. You have my permission, Charlie, Samantha said. You're already part of our family, Renee said. She looked to Harper and smiled. We love you guys. Charlie nodded, smiling wide across the table. How are you going to propose? Harper asked. Renee thought about all the romantic gestures Charlie had done over the past year. Everything he did for her mother seemed to have come out of her romance novels. Candlelit dinners by the water, weekend getaways, and always surprising her with thoughtful gifts. Charlie put up his hands. Nope, I'm not telling any of you. Renee dropped her mouth. What? You're not going to tell us? All three of them looked shocked that he wouldn't spill the beans. Then he shook his head. Okay, fine. But if any of you ruin it, I'm planning on proposing on her birthday. Renee calculated the time between now and then, roughly less than two months. How can we help? Renee's wedding would be just after her mother's birthday. It was perfect timing. She and Matteo had settled on an autumn wedding when the days were cooler and the crowd smaller. They had planned their honeymoon in Costa Rica at an all-inclusive resort. She couldn't wait. Renee, Samantha kicked her again. Ow, Renee said. What? Charlie asked you if you'd mind, Samantha said. I'm sorry, I wasn't listening. Renee made a face in apology. Thoughts spun around so quickly that she almost started thinking about a wedding cake for Charlie and her mother when she noticed Samantha eye her again. Sorry, I so have baby brain. She turned and faced Charlie, who gave her a warm smile. You girls could help me with setting up a treasure hunt. Charlie then showed his whole plan, and it was brilliant. It would be everything her mother would want, an exciting adventure ending in an intimate proposal on the beach. I will do whatever I can to make your mother happy, Charlie said to both Samantha and Renee, and they believed him. We know you will, Charlie, Renee said. She snuck a glance at Samantha, who nodded at him. We know how much you love our mother, Samantha said. Renee smiled at Harper and said, We'll all be officially sisters. Harper smiled, wiggling her eyebrows up and down. Now I can start borrowing your things. More like I'm stealing yours, Samantha said, making the others laugh. George slapped the table with both of his hands, fake laughing with them, which made everyone laugh even more. 
Harper leaned over to him and kissed him on the nose. He squealed in delight, smacking the table even harder as he realized all eyes were on him. You know what? Charlie said. What? Samantha said. I've got some champagne sitting in the fridge that I put in there on opening night. Why don't we have a celebratory glass? Before Rene could protest, Charlie got up out of his chair and was already on his way to the back kitchen. So, they're getting married, Samantha said to no one in particular. Hopefully, Rene said, but she had no doubt her mother would say yes. Evelyn loved Charlie. She had a twinkle in her eye every time Charlie walked through the door. I wonder who'll be next to get married. You, Samantha said. What about you and Chase? Harper asked Samantha. You guys seem to be getting very close these days. Samantha blushed, and Renee couldn't help but smile. Her sister finally seemed happy, and that made her settle. No longer did she constantly check her phone. She stuck around longer after dinner to talk. She helped out around the house and with George Moore, and she had even applied to college for her master's. Samantha seemed to finally be coming out of the dark. He's found a place in Boston, Samantha said. Oh, no, Harper said. Does that mean he's leaving the island? Samantha shook her head. No, he got a place to be close to me and Dahlia. Renee could feel her heart expanding for her sister's new boyfriend. Chase seemed to be the real deal, finally. That's so awesome. You'll have to help me meet someone, Harper said it to George, as if he could understand. What about Gerard? Renee asked. Eh, Harper shrugged. He's nice. Uh-oh, Charlie said. No, he is. It's just that he's not much else. Harper picked at the corner of the table. Besides, he's leaving for his parents' place in Spain soon. Harper sounded even more exotic each day. And I have my second novel I need to focus on, Harper said. Renee noticed this had been Harper's excuse for a lot of things. Lately, she'd been using the excuse to not hang out. Harper didn't want to stay for dinner because she had to focus on her novel. She skipped game night, writer's group, and movie nights, all because of her novel. But now, even Gerard? George, did you hear that? Renee said to him. We have a matchmaking assignment. Maybe there will be someone at the wedding, Samantha said. What kind of guy are you looking for? Renee asked. Harper took a sip of her tea. That's the problem. She wrapped her hands around her mug. I don't know if there's someone out there for me. Renee could feel something felt off with Harper. Her high energy and positive nature seemed to have dulled over the past few weeks, maybe even months. Renee had been so stuck in baby land and her love bubble that she hadn't paid much attention to Harper and her moods. But now, thinking back, Renee had noticed things were off. Harper had been complaining about things like the winter being extra long, getting writer's block, and that sales of her debut novel hadn't been the numbers they had hoped. Had she broken up with Gerard, and Renee totally missed it? I'm so sorry about Gerard, Renee said. Harper looked at Renee, her eyes serious. It's hard to find, this true love, what you all seem to find. Hold on to it. In the year Renee had known Harper, Never had she seen her look so pained and sorrowful than in that moment. She swore she could feel, actually feel, Harper's pain. Just as Renee was about to ask another question, the kitchen door swung open with Charlie running out from the kitchen. Let's celebrate! Chapter 29 The sound of a car door woke Samantha up. She looked to the clock, which read 3.32 a.m. Panic set in. People didn't just pull up at 3.32 a.m. She grabbed her phone and called Renee. You better have a really good reason to call, she whispered. Samantha cringed. She totally forgot about George being asleep. 
there's someone outside. What? Renee whispered, yelled. Footsteps crushed the seashell gravel driveway. She got up and ran to the window. There was an empty car. That's when she saw him. Right in the middle of the driveway stood Hamish McPherson, Laird of McPherson Castle, son of Hector Archibald McPherson, 12th generation of the McPherson clan. It's Hamish, she said into the phone. What? Renee whispered, then immediately hung up. Samantha could hear Renee's footsteps pad down the hall and right outside Samantha's door. Samantha opened it before Renee had her hand on the handle. Let's go downstairs. Renee held the baby monitor in her hand. I don't want to go down there, Samantha quietly hissed. I don't want to see him. What does he want? Renee asked, looking to her phone. Samantha shrugged. I blocked him. Renee put her hands on Samantha's arms and held on to her. Listen to me. This is an opportunity I had wished for. You can plan out what you want to say to him. I'll need years to do that. Think about what you want to say. Renee stared her straight in the eyes. This is your moment to say everything you've wanted to say this past year. Think about it. Haven't you just wanted to let him have a little piece of your mind? No. I don't even want to talk to him. Samantha had never wanted to see him again, ever. You don't want to tell him what a jerk he is? You don't want to let him know that you don't give a... Who's in the driveway? Biddy whispered from the doorway. Samantha jumped. It's nobody. It's Hamish, Renee said. Let's go downstairs, Biddy said. But let's use the back staircase. As the three of them tiptoed down the creaky steps, Renee said, do you hear someone talking? Renee put the monitor up to her ear. Samantha stopped on the last step. Shush. She waved her hands, making them stop. You have a lot of nerve coming here, Evelyn said from the front door. Oh, no. Samantha could hear Hamish's Scottish accent, but couldn't make out what he was saying. She took off toward the front hall, the lights on in her mother's study. Evelyn must have been writing. Please, Mrs. Rose, I just need to talk to her. You expect me to let you see my daughter? Evelyn's words were tight and harsh. Get off my property before I call the police. Your title and your decrepit castle don't mean anything here. Hamish looked as though he was about to argue one last time. But Samantha called out before her mother kicked him out. Mom? She said loudly, and she heard Renee hiss a shush from the doorway of the kitchen. Mom, she said quieter, let me talk to Hamish. Her mother stared Hamish down for a good few seconds, long enough to make him wipe his brow. Samantha gestured out the door. Let's take a walk. She walked out past him, not making eye contact. He looked the same, haggard, slightly a mess with a three-day beard that still looked dang sexy. She padded down the porch to the path through the yard that led to the beach. We'll be able to talk by the beach, Samantha said. Samantha, please, I love you, Hamish began. She shushed him loudly. We'll talk at the beach. She walked in front, plowing down the wooden plank walkway through the tall grasses and wild beech roses then down the stairs to the glowing sand under the dark night sky. Stars twinkled above. As she walked, she thought about what she wanted to say. But by the time she reached the water's edge, she had nothing. So she stood there and didn't say anything. Please, Samantha, please listen to me. He clasped his hands in prayer style, as though he were truly begging for her forgiveness. I love you. I only married Penelope because of obligation, and I knew now that was a mistake. A huge, horrible mistake. She listened to his words, but also counted each wave as it rolled ashore. I love you, he continued. One. I never meant to hurt you. Two. I never should have gone through with the marriage. It was a horrible mistake. Three. 
He continued through the speech he'd most likely prepared on the way to the States. She could picture him, sitting first class, or had he taken a private plane, practicing what he would say to her, spending money he'd said he didn't have. Four. I need you. I can't live without you. Five. Just as he was about to go on, she held up her hand. Hamish, stop. He closed his mouth, eyes wide as he looked at her, waiting for her response. She took in a breath and held it, counting to five again. Then she exhaled. You left me on Regent Street after I got hit by a car. I didn't know what to think at the time. The woman you love got hit by a car, and you just stood there and kept Penelope's hand in yours. The image had been stained in her memory. And you accused me of... She stopped herself, wishing she had waited until she had counted to ten to think of what else she had to say. You mean everything to me. I don't know what I was thinking. It was Penelope. She was so bloody jealous. Samantha froze. How had she never noticed it before? How had she ignored his blatant narcissism? I forgive you. What? He said, looking hopeful. I forgive you for everything. She really wished she had planned out her speech. But since she had to go by the seat of her pants, she remembered a scene from her mom's Netflix show and did her best to paraphrase. I hope you find happiness like I have. His face twisted. It's that guy, isn't it? The one in the videos. She pierced her lips. She started counting again. One. Samantha, listen to me. She couldn't believe she hadn't noticed this behavior before. I left Penelope because I realized I love you. Two. I can't live another day without you. His pleading voice sounded more pathetic than sexy like before. You mean everything to me. Three. An email notification buzzed her phone, illuminating his features. Everything she had once admired looked dark and shadowed in an ugly blue light. She looked down. Boston Architectural College had sent her an email with the subject line, Admission Decision. Her heart dropped. She looked up as Hamish continued on blaming Penelope and everyone else except the one person who caused the whole mess, himself. She held her thumb above the subject and then started to run down the beach. Samantha! Hamish called after her. Stop! She kept running in her pajamas, barefoot under the blanket of stars. She ran down the wet sand, letting the water splash around her ankles, running until she could just barely make out Hamish. She looked back as he yelled and waved his hands, but he didn't chase her, didn't even move from where she left him. She kept running until she reached his house. She could no longer see Hamish. She texted Chase. I just got my admissions letter. She stood outside. The three bubbles started to flash across the bottom. Let me come over. I'm outside. The large sliding glass door opened and Chase came out. She waved, standing there on the beach at the bottom of his steps. She'd wait for him to come to her, give her time to think. She wanted to plan everything she wanted to say. As Chase came down the steps, dawn's light slowly rose above the horizon, reflecting its purples and pinks across the water. What does it say? He asked as soon as he reached her. I don't know. Open it, he said, smiling at her, bouncing on his feet as she stood there. Inside her chest, she could feel her heart stretching. I love you, she said choking up suddenly. I know. Chase smiled, then wrapped his arm around her, kissing her. I love you too. Open it. Let's see. He bit his bottom lip, as if he had to hold back his excitement. She took a step back, taking his hand into hers, and said, I'm all in, no matter what this letter says. He squeezed her hand three times, then kissed it. Open it. 
she bounced on her feet, opening her email app. She tapped the email and read. Dear Ms. Rose, I am delighted to inform you that the committee and admissions have voted to offer you a place at the Boston Architectural College. She dropped the phone and jumped into Chase's arms, squeezing her arms around his neck. Chase twirled her around, swinging her off her feet, kissing her as they went in circles. As he brought her feet back to the sand, he looked in her eyes and said, Marry me. She laughed at first, but realized he had been serious. We've only known each other for like a month. And a half, he said. But think, Samantha, what's your first answer? Yes, she thought. This is crazy, right? Yes. Chase snuggled her up against him. But I'm totally crazy about you. She smiled. Like Miami High crazy? Chase let out a holler of laughter and kissed her, holding her chin in his hands. I'm totally Miami High about you. She didn't say no, but she didn't say yes either. What if I decide to say yes in the future? I'll be right here, he said, holding her against him and kissing her. Chapter 30 Samantha and Renee stood in the driveway by Mateo's truck, sliding Samantha's stuff into the back of the bed, where Mateo and Chase arranged it all. She had used a Sharpie to write on the side of each box its contents and where it belonged, kitchen, closet, bathroom, etc., for her very own apartment. I think there's only a few more boxes inside, Samantha said, heading back into Seaview and upstairs to her room. She looked around. She'd keep some of her things here. She almost didn't want to leave. But there was no doubt she would come back to stay someday. Chase's place was a single-family house in one of the neighborhoods of Cambridge. He planned on spending most of his time in Boston with her and Dahlia. But he'd spend the weekends on the island at the farm. He had more plans for Matteo and his brothers, and he had hired an agriculturalist to plant gardens. Samantha found a tiny loft apartment in the Back Bay area, a ten-minute walk from Chase. In one week's time, she would be starting her graduate courses in architectural design. She couldn't believe she was starting school so soon. In one year, Samantha's whole life had turned completely upside down. Anything I can bring down before we eat lunch? Evelyn asked as she walked into the room. Samantha nodded. I have a couple bags you could bring down. Evelyn suddenly laced her arm around Samantha's waist and tugged her daughter into a hug. I'm going to miss you so much. Me too, Samantha said, hugging her back. But it's nice to know you're just a fairy right away. Evelyn rubbed her hand up and down Samantha's back. I always dreaded when you would fly back across the pond. Samantha smiled at the thought of being so close. I'll be back all the time. Evelyn squeezed one last time before letting go. Your father would be so proud of you. A tidal wave of emotion hit Samantha, and it threw her off. She hadn't expected to be emotional, but the mere mention of her father brought tears to her eyes. Oh, no, I didn't mean to make you cry, Evelyn said, racing to the nightstand and grabbing a tissue. Samantha waved her hand in front of her face, trying to collect herself. She wasn't sad, but a mix of joy and pride. It had been her videos, her work, her lifelong love of architecture and design that got her there. No one else had done it for her. All that hard work had brought her to this moment. I just wish she could see me. Evelyn smiled, placing her hand on her heart. Daddy's always here with us. Renee suddenly knocked on the door. Lunch is ready. Okay, we'll be right there, Samantha said, wiping away the loose moisture on her face. Renee gave a knowing smile. You're going on to bigger and better adventures. But he's just starting to like me. Samantha had confessed her fears the night before, after dinner with Renee, one of them being that George finally liked being with Samantha 
and actually wanted her to hold him and play with him. He loves you, Renee said. He's going to be so happy whenever you come home to visit. Samantha nodded. On to bigger and better adventures. The three women walked downstairs together and out the back deck, where a large extended table had been set up. Wanda, Marty, Samantha said as soon as she saw the newlyweds. How is Quebec? Amazing, Wanda said, pulling out her phone and showing the picture she'd taken. All the guys stood around with a beer in their hands, listening to Marty tell stories of the honeymoon. We ate everywhere. We even got to see a show, Wanda said, scrolling through the selfies of her and Marty. Harper and Renee brought out trays of food as Julia and Jose and the kids arrived for lunch. Lobster rolls, potato salad, corn on the cob, steamed clams, chilled white wine, and more. Chase pulled out Samantha's chair at the table, and they sat next to each other. He held her hand under the table, and every once in a while he'd squeeze it three times. His secret, I love you signal. She squeezed back. When do you start your classes? Biddy asked. Wednesday is orientation for all graduate students, Samantha said. Then classes will start the following Monday. Who's going to be my partner in spades? Biddy asked. Samantha gave Biddy a nod. They had been good partners. I'll be back for the wedding. We'll have to play then. But you know they'll be sore losers again. Wanda pretended to be in shock, slapping her hand to her chest. I'm not a sore loser. It's just Evelyn's not very good at figuring out how many books she has. Evelyn's mouth dropped at the insult, and then she rolled her eyes. I'm the one who can't figure out their books? Biddy gave Samantha a wink. It's all about the mental game. Samantha let out a laugh. The conversation continued to flow as visitors walking by the celebration came over and said their well wishes to Samantha. By the time they had to leave, Samantha thought of reasons why they should stay. She was going to miss this. A lot. She kissed everyone goodbye and took George in her arms. Don't you forget about me, little man. He mumbled a few baby words back to her. Take care of everyone for me. George pointed at Samantha. Annie, Sammy. He's saying your name, Renee said. Samantha squished his baby body against hers in a great giant hug. Love you, little man. She kissed his fuzzy head and said her final goodbyes. Chase opened the door for her and she climbed inside. When he got inside, he put the keys into the ignition, but turned to her. You ready? Samantha looked out at Seaview as everyone stood on the porch waving goodbye. Her family had grown exponentially, and she could not be more grateful. When only Nigel came to the hospital, she thought that had been the lowest point of her life. Yet now, looking back, it had been the most pivotal moment. It had triggered a sequence of events that had ended up being the best thing that could have happened to her. She didn't know what had happened to Hamish after she'd left him on the beach. Renee said they had watched him walk back to his rental car and leave. It had been Matilda who sent a text of the high-profile scandalous divorce. Penelope Matthews McPherson claimed her husband, Hamish McPherson, married her for her money and nothing else. A picture of Hamish had been posted in the gossip magazine and showed him walking alone in London in a pair of sweats and sneakers, glaring into the camera. Another smaller photograph of McPherson Castle sat underneath it, with a caption that read, McPherson claims her husband married her to save family country home. Hamish would have hated the image. She never replied to Matilda, or Spencer, or Toph, or Iona. She replied to none of her so-called friends back in London. We're on our way, she texted Dahlia. I'm already there waiting, XOXO. Samantha smiled to herself as they got out of the truck on the ferry. What's so funny? Chase asked as he locked up the truck. I just texted Dahlia, 
she said, and let out a giggle. I seriously can't believe you sided with her about the master bedroom, he said, holding his hand out for her. She took it, and their hands interlocked, as though that was how they'd always walked together. And that was how their hands had always been. She's right, Samantha said. But I'm the one who's paying for the tub. Yes, but you want a luxury tub in the master bathroom, she shook her head. Master bathrooms should have a bath. But I never take them, he said, as though the idea of resale never crossed his mind. As they reached the top floor of the ferry, they took their usual spot in the front by the railing. When they sat down, she snuggled into the crevice of his arm, and their bodies fit perfectly together. They sat listening to the waves lapping against the ferry and the rumble of the engine, watching the island disappear off into the distance. She couldn't see Seaview, but the clay cliffs dazzled in the afternoon sun. The red brick lighthouse sat at the end of the island, and the harbor's little village and books and bread slowly became smaller and smaller. Samantha nestled deeper into the crook of Chase's shoulder. I think we should get married after this year. Like, next spring, after a year of school. Chase sat up so he could look at her. A spring wedding? He looked surprised, but also happy. Samantha had no doubt he was happy with her. No doubt he loved her. No doubt he wanted to spend the rest of his life with her. And she didn't have any doubt about spending the rest of hers with him. I heard it's lovely in May, he said, wrapping his arms around her. A wedding in May sounds perfect. And as the island drifted off into the horizon, Samantha wrapped her arms around his neck and said, I'm all in. A grin grew on Chase's face, and without saying a word, he leaned over and kissed her. Home on the Harbor Romantic Women's Fiction, Cliffside Point, Book Four Written by Ellen Joy, narrated by Jennifer March Chapter One Harper stood in the corner of her old high school gymnasium, thinking of ways she could escape her current situation. She could either stick the toothpick in her eye from her strange-tasting vegetarian meat ball and be rushed to the hospital, or she could just be an adult and leave. Who cared that she went to high school with these people? It wasn't even their tenth reunion, but their twelfth. If she hadn't talked to them in all those years, why would she want to talk to them now? Unfortunately for Harper, she'd had no excuse when Mateo Perez, her oldest and closest friend, had convinced her to go. They're just so fake, she said to Mateo, who stood with his arm around his fiancée, Renee. He made a face that suggested he was tired of the same conversation. Lila probably spread hundreds of rumors throughout the four years there, Harper said, staring at the group of people who had basically ignored her in high school. She's the fakest of them all. Mateo continued with the face. Who's fake? Renee asked, leaning over to see who Harper was referring to. Harper pointed to the typical specimen of Martha's Vineyard elite and privileged, Lila Whitmore. Like most of the women who surrounded her, Lila wore her long blonde hair in perfectly iron-curled ringlets, long past her shoulders. Her couture-sized negative fashionable burnt orange dress looked stunning against her bronze tan. She looks like Barbie, Renee said hiccuping as she took another sip of her punch while examining Harper's arch nemesis. If there were ever a villain, Barbie, Harper said, noticing Renee sway a bit as she looked at the group. Harper wished she hadn't spiked Renee's punch so much. Baby Mama Renee was going to pass out before the reunion got started. Then Mateo would have to leave and bring her home, and Harper would remain, the wallflower like always. High school was miserable, even 12 years later. Lila's not so bad, Mateo said. Harper's face twisted in disgust. Are you serious? She shot a glance at Lila's perfect nose and shook her head. 
That girl made high school a living nightmare. Mateo rolled his eyes. That's a bit dramatic, he shrugged. I always felt a bit sad for the twins. I played football with Andrew, and he was always cool. Harper almost choked on her drink. He's the worst, Renee pointed ahead. Who's that? Harper turned to where Renee pointed. If the scene had played out like one of Harper's daydreams, Dr. Joel Schaefer would make eye contact, and everyone else would be shadow. And a spotlight would go on Harper. He'd instantly leave the group he was talking to in mid-conversation and walk straight over to her, unable to keep himself from seeing her. Oh, right. He's engaged now, Harper said. How could she have forgotten the engagement of the year? Everyone on the island who was anyone had been invited to the party, except her. Mateo had offered to bring her as his plus one, but she'd felt like a complete and total loser. She'd always be the nerdy book girl who didn't have a mom to teach her how to do pretty hair and makeup, who had a father lost in books and his writing and his heartbreak, who lived with an eccentric aunt who was mentally sick half her life. Mateo made a face. Didn't you hear? Harper shook her head. Hear what? Mateo! Andrew Whitmore said as he made his way from his twin sister Lila to Mateo. Renee turned to Harper as if to ask who it was. Harper let out a long, silent breath of disdain. That would be Andrew Whitmore, Martha Vineyard's golden boy. Andrew sauntered over to Mateo, holding out his hand and giving him a bro hug. To Harper's disappointment, Mateo greeted Andrew with the same enthusiasm, and they immediately started talking about the glory days of playing football. Did you know your fiancé ran 50 yards without a hand on him? Andrew said with his hand on Mateo's shoulder. Renee's eyes lit up at her hero fiancé, and Harper groaned silently in her head. Andrew Whitmore was the worst. Born with a silver spoon in his mouth, Andrew Whitmore had been on top throughout the four years at the school. He thought his you-know-what didn't stink. Most of the time, he had treated people like they were idiots, spouting out his opinion over everyone else's. His confidence had carried him throughout the years, and he took any title he felt was his. Football captain, homecoming king, and editor of the school paper, to name a few. Harper understood why. They'd have lost their jobs otherwise. Andrew was a Whitmore. His daddy practically owned the island. The absolute worst part about Andrew Whitmore was that he was also a writer, a journalist to be exact. With his nepotism, he received a spot at the coveted Boston Globe, right out of his Ivy League school. Hey, Harper, he finally said after he finished another story of the good old days. I saw you published a book. Yep, she said, not looking directly at him, more like past him, beyond him. That's great, Andrew said. She glanced at her feet, suddenly feeling extremely underdressed in her flip-flops as Andrew stood in a fitted suit that did not look like it came off a rack. Everyone looked at her, waiting for her response from Andrew's comment. But she didn't have anything to say to him beyond something that would come across snarky. She published it last year, Mateo said, shooting her a look but Harper said nothing. What did she have to say to Andrew Whitmore? Well then, Andrew stuffed his hands into his pockets. It's so great to see you again, really. The conversation turned back to football and Coach Joe. Harper stepped back, surveying the crowd. Looking around the room, she tried to remember her classes and place the faces and names together. She looked for some of her friends from the drama club or her art classes. None of the faces looked familiar. She looked back at Mateo as he chummed it up with Andrew and wondered why she remembered so much about the jerk from fifth period English, but not the names of the kids she spent most of her time with during her teenage years. The more she looked around, 
the more she realized she didn't know anyone. Hey, Renee grabbed hold of Harper's arm. I'm not feeling so well. Where's the bathroom? Harper groaned from the predictability. Renee could not handle her alcohol. She let Renee take hold of her arm as she walked her toward the women's restroom. Mateo instantly left his conversation with Andrew as the women began to leave and swooped in between them. What's wrong? he asked. Should we go home? Renee dropped Harper and grabbed hold of Mateo, leaving Harper behind. I don't mind staying, she said, swaying a bit. You look like you should go home, Mateo said, his face wrinkling as Renee turned a different shade. No, I'll be fine. Renee's eyes widened as she grabbed hold of her mouth. She dashed off toward the restroom, with Mateo quickly following her. Harper stood behind, watching as they left the gym. Then to herself, she mumbled, How much punch did she have? Excuse me? Joel Schaefer asked, suddenly standing next to her. Harper jumped, not realizing anyone had been standing close enough to hear her speak to herself. Oh, nothing. I was talking to myself, she said, immediately blushing. Had she just talked to herself in front of Joel Schaefer? The hottest and coolest guy at Martha's Vineyard High? She couldn't formulate any more words, even as he stood there smiling at her. Joel Schaefer had been an upperclassman when she started high school. You're Harper Marin, right? Joel said, squinting his eyes as if that would help him recognize her from a dozen years ago. Yes, she said, nodding, not sure if she should pretend not to know who he was, although everyone knew who he was. I remember you, he said, shaking his finger at her. Really? She wondered if he was trying to buy time to remember her name. She looked for Renee and Mateo, hoping they would reappear from the bathrooms, and quick. Even a dozen years later, Joel Schaefer had a way of making her swoon. The handsome doctor stood a perfect six-two, his chestnut brown locks perfectly gelled into place, and his perfect pearls glowing as he smiled at her. You wrote a book he continued with the finger thing. He came closer to her. Yes, she smiled, stepping a bit closer too. You run the med spa here on the island. She had heard of his success from practically everyone, one of the island's own bringing business and jobs for people on the island. Dr. Joel Schaefer had turned into a local hero with his charity work and big donations for the local community. Throughout school, she'd had a huge crush on the upperclassmen. But Harper couldn't remember a time when he hadn't been with Lila. You here with Lila? she asked. She looked at the group of women who had tortured her daily, still cackling and probably still gossiping about the same people. When she looked back at him, his expression changed. Um, uh, we aren't together. Mortification burned her cheeks. I'm sorry, I hadn't heard. That's what Mateo was probably going to tell her. He made a face. Yes, well, when you're with your trainer. Harper's eyes widened, and her sight went directly to Lila, who laughed loudly from the crowd of women around her. I have a secret, Joel said, moving closer to her. So close, she could smell his aftershave and alcohol. I've always had a little bit of a crush on you. Harper lifted her hand to cover her mouth in surprise, and in doing so, bumped into Joel and spilled her drink all over his suit. Oh my God, she said, immediately looking for some sort of towel. Let me get something. He grabbed her hand and stopped her. No, it's fine. You barely got me. He wiped away the small drops of punch. Is that vodka? Um, she didn't know what to say. Mateo had warned her not to bring the vodka. Yes? Joel smirked, 
then leaned in closer to her, his breath against her ear. You look amazing tonight, he whispered. She jerked at the compliment. Um, thank you. Joel pulled out his card. You should call me. She looked out at the crowd while Joel turned to walk away and noticed a pair of eyes. Andrew stared at her, almost glaring at her. Good to see you, Harper Marin, Joel said as he left. Harper turned toward the bathroom when she heard someone come up behind her. Andrew stood in front of her. Are you all right? Excuse me, she said. She narrowed her eyes and kept walking, shaking off whatever that was. Andrew spun around following her, his face screwed up. Did he come on to you? She stopped walking flabbergasted at the audacity one must have to ask another person that question. I think you should mind your own business, Harper shot back. He held up his hands in a sort of surrender. I just wanted to make sure you're okay. Why don't you worry about yourself? Harper turned and walked off, faster this time. Thankfully, Andrew took the hint, because he didn't follow or create more of a scene. He'd probably tell Lila. Harper didn't want to stick around when that happened. She looked down at the card. Dr. Joel Schaefer. She stuck it into her purse as she left the gymnasium and found Mateo coming in from outside. Hey, I took Renee to the truck. We're headed home. Take me with you, she said, noticing Andrew and Lila standing next to each other. Sure you don't want to stay? Mateo asked. I could pick you up later if you need a ride. Harper's heart melted at the gesture. Thanks, Mateo, but I'm ready to go. He pulled back his neck, surprised. Really? I thought you wanted to stay all night. Her argument for spiking the drinks. I just want to leave, okay? She looked behind her again to see Andrew still standing there, still staring at her. Mateo looked around her. What's the deal with Andrew? He had noticed, too. Then she looked back and saw him walking toward her again. He's just a jerk, she said. Come on, let's go. Mateo nodded and walked her out, grabbing the door before she reached it, like always. He opened the passenger's door for her. And like always, when Mateo dropped her off at her apartment, he made sure she got in safe. She waved from the window, watching as Mateo and Renee pulled away from the road below and disappeared. Meow. Joan, her overweight Maine Coon cat, cried out. Meow. Harper fell onto the couch as Joan patted her way to her spot on the top of the back. I know. I should have stayed home. Joan paced behind her head, rubbing her butt and tail against Harper's hair. Joan? I don't want your tush in my face. Harper picked Joan up and sat her in her lap, but not without a cry from Joan. Do you want me to give you love or not? She asked her geriatric cat, as though she would answer. Joan plopped onto her lap. See, that's what I thought. Harper began her routine of scratching Joan's ears, then neck, while moving down her back and belly as she stretched out. Why do you always have to be so difficult? She asked Joan. Harper rubbed the cat's head as she purred loudly. Her own head spun as she sat there. The night had been a complete bust from beginning to end. She had initially invited Gerard to be her plus one, but in typical Harper fashion, she broke up with him right before the big event. Then when Mateo and Renee found out about the breakup, they included her as their third wheel like her life seemed to always be going these days. Between her dad and Evelyn, Gerard and his art, Matteo and Renee, and every guy and her mother, Harper always felt like a third wheel. She thought about Joel and immediately pulled out the card. She stared at his name. Dr. Joel Schaefer. The Joel Schaefer who she had purposefully taken the long way to her fifth period class every day 
just so she might catch a glimpse of in the hallways. Joel Schaefer, the doctor who owned his own practice. She put the card on her coffee table. He was still the cool boy she couldn't form a sentence in front of, the super talented football player, the guy every woman on this island would practically die to date. That Joel Schaefer wanted her to call him? There's no way I'm calling him, she said to Joan. I mean, he'll find out I'm a weirdo who talks to her cat. She picked up the card and shoved it into the coffee table's drawer, to be lost with all the other things Harper wanted to ignore, like bills and deadlines and... She stared at her computer. Then she pulled it across the coffee table and into her lap, not really knowing why. Each day she pulled that darn computer over, and each night the same routine, but nothing seemed to want to come out of her. Her first book had taken her nine years. Nine! Now, a year later, her publisher wanted a third of the draft done in less than a month. Less than a month! She would never be able to write it. She didn't even know what she was going to write. She had babbled at dinner when she'd met her editor, or Evelyn's, her father's girlfriend's editor. Now she was stuck above a pizza place in a tiny apartment, trying not to eat gluten or think about her career crumbling as the cursor blinked back at her. And worse, realizing for the one thousandth time, she'd passed up the best thing she'd ever had, Mateo.